So maybe she's gonna, you know, at that time I was okay. Ah, at that time I was okay. I got you. Okay, that's good. That's good. What? Oh, because they were like, I was really old back then, you know. So the Prophet was yesterday? But no, he was he was years after. Okay. So at what time did what age change? Go ahead. Hey, you're getting help. What is what did, what did you okay today though? You know, sure. Okay, so that's a good question. What do you mean, okay today? You know, because like nowadays, if I was a you know 50 year old man, yeah, as the prophet was, uh, I saw, so. yeah, I saw was uh, But you know, I wanted to marry a little kid like my my niece. Sure. So there are states in the U.S., for example, that till very recently, with parental consent, you could be married at 10. Right? Yeah. Look at them. Delaware, I think, was one of them. But I have a video where I actually scanned all the all the age limits on there. But the point being, you cannot judge a time period with the rules of another time period. Okay. For example, since you could ask the question of today, George Washington, the father of America, he had slaves. Right. Yes. Yeah. So today. Would I say that he was a racist, slave-owning, horrible person? Why is he on your dollar bill? <laughs> well, I don't support him, but, you know, I... I so would you say he's a racist, right, with slave-owning, slave-eating, no, horrible he, person? He, he's the father of America, he, he right. didn't have a dependent. Okay, so so why was it okay? Today, if I own slaves, would you would it be okay with that? No, because, you know, people should be free today. But at that time, they shouldn't be? Your morality changes. Isn't it? <laughs> when we look at the age of marriage, we have to look at the time and place. Today, even a man sometimes is not mature enough to get married at, uh, at 18, right? Because they're still playing video games and not, you know, able to finish high school. But in the earlier times, there were no schools, there were no high schools, there were no colleges. So basically, any time a woman hit the age of puberty, which is a natural indication that they are ready for intercourse, then they would get married. And as soon as a man could afford to support a wife, they would get married. Even my own grandmother got married at 12, right? Because it's not like she was going to go to high school, right? At that time, in those areas, there was no school. So when she was physically ready, they got her married. And it's incorrect for us to go back into history and try to rejudge the time. Aisha got married at an age that was appropriate for the time. In fact, she was already engaged before it was even proposed for her to marry the Prophet None of the mushrikeen, none of the, the polytheists objected to that marriage. In fact, since you said you're Christian, in the Bible, how old was Rebecca? This is in the Bible, when she married uh, Ishmael. Three years old, according to your Bible. So let's use your own standard, right? If you look at Mary, again, being 12 or 14, again, by today's standard, that would not be acceptable. But by that standard, that was the age of marriage. Today, if we find people at the age, and I'm going to be raw here, I'm going to be real with you, so, you know, do we have people that are 10, 12, 13, 14 having sex? Yes or no? In Canada, no? You do, right? Why is that acceptable? It's not acceptable for them to get married, but it's acceptable for them to have sex. Well, they say, you know, before they marry, they have to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> How many people do they get to know before they get married? They say experience. They need experience. They need experience. Get a little... Anyway. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Alright, so, uh, hold on, so, so, this is the brother's conversation right now, right? So, now, when we look at the issue of age and marriage, you have to look at context, right? You have to look at, even if we look at Rebecca and the Bible, many of the commentators, including Rashi, who uh, was one of the early commentators on the Old Testament, he said that this was the acceptable age of marriage according to Jewish law at the time. In fact, till today on the books, that is the minimum age of marriage in the Jewish tradition.
So, looking at that time period, you cannot judge by our time. Right? You have to take in consideration. The fact that George Washington had slaves is because at that time that was a norm in the American society and that's why today it's based on Mount Rushmore and we don't criticize him because they say, well, that was the norm of the time. So the marriage of Aisha Rabiana was the acceptable age. Now, what was her exact age? Allah knows best. Because even herself, when she mentions the Ahadith in the Bukhari and Muslim authentic Ahadith, she gives different ages, six and seven, which are both in Sahih Hadith. And then never we talk about the discrepancy and so on. Because at the time, they didn't even have calculus. Right? They, they didn't have 1998 and 2000. Even the Islamic Hijri calendar was constituted in the time of Amr Rabiyan. So they would go by events. Right? So those were guesstimates. But she was not many until she hit puberty. Meaning the actual merit was until she hit puberty. So she was married at an acceptable in nature and custom acceptable age. Now, if that's your issue, then I would say you would have to have the issue with the Bible first. A bunch of stuff. Because Rebecca was earlier, younger. Mary was again married to a 90 year old at a time when she was not even a teen, right? But my question to you is, right? I answered your question. My question to you is, what do you believe about God? I believe that He is just. Excellent. Okay. Good. All loving. All loving. Just. You believe the Bible is the Word of God? Not personally, but yes. Yeah. No, you're, 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 you're playing it out. Go ahead. <laughs> do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Yes. All just and all loving? Yes. Okay. In Exodus 21, 2021. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. So you believe that if somebody beats their slave with a stick or rod, and they die from that beating, but they lived a day, even a woman, it's okay because that's their property, that's all just and loving. Is there any context to this? Sorry? It's Exodus 21, 20, 21. So chapter 21, verses 20, 21. Yes, this is the context in Exodus, is laying out the laws. Like it talks about, if somebody curses their father or mother, they surely be put to death. That's verse 17, Exodus 21, 17. So, you believe if somebody curses their parents, they should be put to death? You believe a slave can be beaten to death as long as they live a day, it's okay? No punishment because they're your property? Is, is there not any context to this? Sure. Here's the Bible, read it. Give me your context. That's why I always have the book with me. Go for it. Sheikh, could I quickly ask a follow question? Yes. Uh, I've heard before that you could also say that, like the Rasulullah, he was called a liar, a magician. But he was never uh, ashamed for this yeah, act. Yeah, and that's what I mentioned. That. that society of that time, the mushrikeen, never objected to this. Okay. Here, uh, if you bring, you know how there's also passages about God allowing killing children. And yeah, stuff? yeah, I'm getting to it. So I was gonna ask, what if they bring up, you know, Khidr Yeah, of course. Or what if they say, oh, in the Quran it says he killed a child. Excellent. When Khidr salam and Musa salam went, that child that was killed, was there a reason? Yes. What was the reason? That his, uh, he would become uh, a hardship on his family. Excellent. So that's the reason. Was that to protect that child and his parents to stay upon the hut. Yes. But the massacre of Amulek is not for that. It's not to protect those children. It's not because there's a reason. It's a massacre. Genocide. Which is in the Bible. But we'll get to it. So Go ahead. The context. Yes, context. Go ahead. Uh, <coughs> So no, the, the verse before it was saying that you know if they did heal up, yeah, yeah. then they only they should, they should only be punished for the time. Okay. They're still gonna get punished though. Right. Go, read the verse. Yeah. Uh oh, your context fell apart. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the context? Well, Notwithstanding, if they remain alive for a day, and then they die. They shall not be punished, for he is his property. Go ahead. You know, being just is, he's your property, so 
Oh, so you think you think people are your property? You can do whatever you can kill them? Wow. If they're being too, like, uh, maybe they deserve that. So maybe? Where is that in the verse? You just made that up. There's nothing in the verse about them doing anything. Good actor. No, but like, why would they get treated that way? I don't know. Maybe you just had a bad day, man. You, had a, you didn't have your coffee that morning. <laughs> because uh, we're going by the verse, right? All right. Since you said about God being all just and merciful, then first, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not have slaves. He freed his slaves. They were called Mawla, which were freed. They came as slaves and were freed by him. And he never hit any of them. Aisha radiyanha mentions that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, never hit any of his wives or his children or anybody under his hands. I'm going to end this soon, but 1 Samuel 15.3. Right? 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3 Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman infant and nursing child ox and sheep camel and donkey Wow all just and merciful eh That was a Canadian accent you guys no notice that all right um, so why kill the infant children and like, like genocide, not a particular child for any particular, no sin by them, nursing children, even the sheep. I mean, why you got to kill the sheep? And, you know, there's a verse in the Quran about killing infant children. Where is it? Uh, a prophet, you know, who was teaching Moses that... Khidr 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 I don't know. Yeah. Uh, he was teaching Moses that, you know, he killed a child even though he had no sin. Okay, so but why? But does the Quran explain why? I don't know. Okay, so that child was a particular situation. And first thing, it wasn't a small child, right? As, as Ibn Kathir and others have mentioned, but the point there being that that child was going to grow up and be a test to misguide his parents and himself. So Allah ordered that he would be killed early, so he goes to heaven and his children. But Amulek, there is no such justification. It's a genocide. It's not a particular case. It's killing an entire civilization. The Amulites, they're all their children, women, donkeys and sheep. It's not the same, right? You know, maybe those infant children, they're just the way that Moses, sorry, just the way that Moses, you know, he grew up and, and tried to attack for Pharaoh. Maybe Moses attacked God. Pharaoh? Bro, you haven't read your Bible. Or when did he attack Pharaoh? You know, over, overthrow him. He, he grew up in his house. He didn't try to overthrow Pharaoh. He called him towards Tawheed, towards the oneness of God. And when Moses, if Pharaoh didn't listen, he took his people and left. <laughs> Gotta go back to your Bible. Alright. Inshallah, we're gonna move to the sisters, inshallah. So. I know there's a body mouth, so I went past those parts. Huh. Yeah, just play it from Here's the problem. Because now society no longer upholds biblical values, getting married as a teenager, post pubescent, post pubescent teenager, is looked down upon because they consider you not emotionally, mentally mature enough, responsible enough to have a family. Responsible enough to have a family. So they make you wait until you're in your late 20s and 30s. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. St. Elisban, you did sodomy? You're a homosexual pervert? God forbid. You're a pedophile? I hope not. <laughs> All right, inshallah. So now, of course, we don't have time. We're, we're, we're going through this fast. but. After the discussion of the Bible, <laughs> I would make the conversation come back to the concept of who's God, right? Because in the end, these questions that people raise are only distractions. You have to address them to kind of clarify their mind, but then you want to always bring them back to the concept who's God, what is Tawheed, right? The oneness of the Creator, the greatness of the Creator, because in the end, if you believe there is one God and that God revealed the Quran and he sent the Prophet then everything else in the Sharia gets justified from it. 
And if you don't believe that, then to argue over, you know, cutting hands or hijab and things is useless. But sometimes people have these things as obstacles, so you have to clarify those to then bring the message of Tawheed. But you steer the conversation back to who's God? What's the purpose of life? Who do you worship? Right? That's what you want to bring it back to. All right, sisters, go ahead. Hit me with your question. Can you hear me? <laughs> it's on the paper? Do they have a mic? Okay. Alright, uh, sisters, so we're ready for you, but whenever you're ready, just let the brothers know. Um, we'll go to the second question from the brothers in the meanwhile, inshallah. Go ahead. I don't need religion. I, I don't need religion, so... Okay, great. Are you an atheist? Are you an agnostic? Well, I do believe that there's... I do believe that... You know, do I just hold it once? Or click? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah okay. Ahead. So I do believe that there's a creator. Okay. It's just good. I don't think I need a religion. Like, I know I'm a good person. I, I know how to treat people nice. nice. I know how to be kind to people. Wonderful. I don't think I need, like, a scripture or, like, a religion Structured to subscribe religion. to. To, like, tell me what is good or what, what's bad. Like... I know what's good and bad, so cool. what would I need a religion for? How do you know what's good and bad? So my parents taught me, I know, like uh -huh. I know not to hurt nobody. Okay. Right? So what if somebody kills somebody, the death penalty for somebody who murders, is that good or bad? The death penalty for a murderer? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, like as a society. I think it's good. Uh, well, I'm, Go ahead. I'm not going to say I advocate for it necessarily. You, you just said you know good from bad, right? So I'm asking, yeah. is it good or bad? Like. You know, obviously that's what we have a government for, right? So, so the government tells you what's good and bad? Well... That's interesting. Okay. There, there's some level of trust within the government, okay. right? So, so there was a time when the government thought slavery was good. Yeah. So does that mean it was good? I, uh, was a, I, I just no, don't no, think no, it's, you know... You said the government tells you good and bad, right? There's a level of trust. So in yeah. Canada, for example, the government at a time massacred the First Nation people. So was that good? No, that's bad. But that's why Wait, they evolved. Said, they, they got uh, away the from government that. Evolved. They learned. Yeah, and they're I like, okay, you. we shouldn't do these things. So the government at a time said marriage is only between a man and woman. And then at a time said man can marry a man. So which government was good and which was bad? Well, I mean, like you can have somebody. I have friends who are like... LGBTQ and they're good people. Okay. So it's like you know, I guess you could say the previous government was wrong because ah. like so like at that good people. time when the government said that you cannot marry another man or a woman marry a woman, yeah. the government was bad. But then we evolved from that. Like we understood. So we today like, the government is good. I'm not saying entirely, but I'm, I'm just angry. saying like, you know. Okay. If I subscribe to abortion? religion, I'm, I'm is being a, abortion forced. good or bad? I mean. Yes. Like it's yeah, yeah um, their body their choice, right? Ah, so, yeah. Okay. So if somebody has like a 9 month pregnancy and just aborts the fetus for no reason and that's okay. okay. No, I, th I think that's messed, but like Ah, uh, you think it's messed. Yeah. <laughs> but it's legal. So is that bad? Cuz the government says it's okay. So like we need to improve on those things. We need to work on those uh, things. Ah, we need to improve. Yeah. So the government isn't good then cuz it has some things that are bad. Not entirely, not uh, entirely, right? So how do you define good and bad? It's like, because I, earlier you said you know good and bad. Yeah. Then you said the government tells you what's good and bad. Well, then you were saying the government also has some bad. Well, so, I just know not to hurt others okay. or, like, or whatever I'm doing. It's just me. Like if I'm doing it at home or like I if I'm you. like if I'm gonna smoke weed, right. I'm not hurting nobody. Like that's right. just me. Like me, I go what to like my work. What if you're smoking meth? But like. Is I'm not okay? gonna do that. That's messed up. But like, why let's say if I up? was to do it, no. But why is it messed up? Like, I'm not hurting nobody. Hold on. You said it's wrong to smoke meth. Yeah, yeah. But you're not hurting anybody. So why is it wrong? I mean, like, it's gonna mess you up and things like that. So you're not hurting anybody else. Yeah. Weed can mess you up. Is alcohol good or bad? Like, I, th I think I have an alcoholic uncle, so I think it's bad. So you think alcohol is bad, but the government says yeah. it's okay. No, that's true. Yeah? That's true. And why is alcohol bad? 
What if somebody just likes to get drunk? They're not hurting anybody. Yeah, my uncle beats up his wife. So okay. <laughs> I think it's bad. So, so, that's, so that's bad, right? Uh, hey, 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 it's acting, okay, guys? Yeah, it's acting, relax, man. Okay. So you, you're not sure what's good and bad because earlier you said it's whatever you think. Yeah. Then you said it's the government. Then yeah. you said the government evolves. Now you're saying something is bad even though the government doesn't forbid it. So I just think religion is like forcing me to gotcha. do the things like, okay. like I have to follow this like I have to follow Allah for me to go to heaven. Okay. Like I'm good. I'm not hurting no one. Okay. I understand like the government can be bad and they go to Iraq and like right. Afghanistan and Kill do people. those bad things. Is that bad? But like why do I like I'm just being forced I to you. follow a religion. Nobody's forcing you anything. And if I anything. don't I'm no. not going to go to heaven. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let's say you want to get a degree, right? Because yeah. you want to get a job and the job requires you have a degree, right? To get a degree, do you have to go to college? Yeah. So are they forcing you? Is that bad? Because you want something, you want yeah. a good job. Let's say you want to be a doctor. Yeah. Right? You want to go and practice medicine. Yeah. Right? You want that big paycheck. Yeah. Do you have to get a degree? I do. Do you have to pass a test? I can still be successful without having okay. to get a degree. Can you be a doctor? I can't be a doctor. Why no. not? Are they forcing you? Or is that what you have to do to get that result? Yeah, I wouldn't call okay. that forcing. I, yeah. Okay. You wouldn't call that forcing? No. Remember that now. Okay. Now, did you come into existence by yourself? No, I, know, I, I believe there's a being that created okay. us So all. you were created, right? Yeah. Is there a purpose to your creation? I believe it's just to be good. How did you come up with that? Did your creator tell you that? I don't know. My mom. You don't know? Your mom? Your mom yeah. created you? <laughs> she created the universe? No, no. Okay. But, but she told so what if, what if your mom told you that the purpose of creation is to kill people? Would that be okay then? Because your mom said it? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm intelligent enough to like oh, know okay. the difference. All right. So, since you're very intelligent, is a creation created without purpose? No. Okay. Would an intelligent creator tell the creation what is their purpose? Meaning, for example, if I hire you for a job, right? And you're like, okay, I'm ready to work. And then I give you no instructions what to do. How to do it. What are the results? What do you need to do? What are your goals? I give you nothing. Would that make sense? No. If you created a new invention, let's say you came up with a new type of phone that nobody's ever seen, right? That can cook for you, that can do all kinds of things that are amazing. But you knew that certain things would make it fall apart. There were some dangers that it could electrocute you. And you knew that certain ways would give you the results you want. Would you not send some kind of instructions of use? Yes. A manual? Yes. You would. So don't you think your creator is more intelligent than you? Yeah. So you don't think that creator would give some kind of instructions? What is the purpose of life? Yeah. Okay. So what are those instructions? See now, if I do follow a religion... I didn't ask you to follow a religion. Yeah. Stick to the question now. I'm just asking you. You believe that you would give instructions on how to live. Yeah. And you believe your creator is more intelligent than you. And you believe that creator would give us some instructions, some guidance, how to live, what to do, what's wrong, what's right, what's our purpose, what, what do we want to get to. So when you do believe that, I'm asking you, where are those instructions? Like the instructions from the creator? Yeah. I guess that's religion. Okay. So religion is from our creator. Yeah. Okay. So now... We as Muslims believe that all the prophets that were sent were sent with those instructions. They brought rules on what to do and what not to kill, not to steal, by a divine source. So people aren't making up their own rules and evolving good and bad and this. Rather, they brought from the one that created us, that knows us best how to live. And that creator and that religion has always, from the time of Adam till the last Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them, have told us that this life is only a test and gives us instructions how to live life and gives us instruction how to be successful. And that's the instructions from our Creator. So nobody's forcing you to do anything. You have a choice. You cannot do it. 
But then there are consequences to your choices. Just like in this country that you live in, there are laws and regulations. They're not forcing you that you can't speed, but if you speed, you'll get a ticket. Right? Those are the consequences to your actions. So if you kill, rape, murder, hellfire is the place of punishment. So, so don't if, do those if things. If I do choose Islam, my okay. family's Christian. Okay. I'm just going to be an outlier, like, you know, Christmas, Easter. Like I, I'm still going to have to celebrate those things because, you know, I love my parents and I'm I with them. So, okay. like, so and I know in Islam something. I can't do those things. I got you. Look, worrying about Christmas and family holidays is later. First thing, what do you believe? Do you believe there's one creator? Yeah, I believe that. Do you believe that creator sent messengers? Yeah, I believe that. Do you believe we should worship messengers or worship that one creator? The creator. Then you're a Muslim. Right? That's what a Muslim is. You believe there's one creator. You believe in the prophet from Adam to Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them. You don't worship them. You take them as prophets. Then you're a Muslim. Now, you need to accept Islam. You need to accept what you've just said. Now, you can keep it to yourself. You don't have to talk to your family about it until they're ready. You can slowly tell them about it. But in the end, if your parents tell you 2 plus 2 is 5, and you know 2 plus 2 is 4, in the end, you can't deny the truth for them. Right? It might be hard at first, but maybe they'll end up becoming Muslims as well. Look at Christmas. If your family is Christian, ask them, where did Christmas come from? Is it in the Bible? No. Is there any evidence that Jesus was born on the 25th of December? No. no. Where's Santa Claus, the trees, the gift, the reindeer, eggnog? It's all pagan. Right? So if your family is involved in paganistic rituals, even according to Christianity, they shouldn't follow it. So educate them. And if you think it'll be harsh, then take it easy, slowly. Right? But you can't use that to deny the truth. You ready for your shahada now? Ashadu. So, inshallah, make dua. The, the scenario I played out was from like a text conversation of a brother. Inshallah, good. And he knows his shahada in Arabic. Allah he knows Allah. it. So he's on the verge of like, he, he's just that. Inshallah. inshallah. So, inshallah, Muslim, inshallah, all of you make dua. The brother. Uh, Everybody make dua. Allah guides the May Allah guide inshallah. him. Allahumma ameen. And show you, Shaykh Uthman. A quick little point here. In Surah Maryam, mm -hmm. uh, it mentions that uh, an angel came to um, uh, Maryam. Alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. Yet, Later on, it mentions plurally malaika. angels. Malaika, yes. So, yes. if you could just... No problem. Malik and Malaika are both mentioned in the Quran who gave the glad tidings to Maryam alayhi salam. Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen in his tafsir already answered that this is not something we need to come up with like a new explanation for. When we say Malik or Malaika, these are sometimes used as jinns. Jinns, yani anwa, the type. For example, if I was to say, that mankind took a step. Man has made great progress, right? And then I say this work was done by many men working very hard. Is that a contradiction? No, because man is used for mankind as a jinns. And many times we will say men, showing the plural of it for what is also called the jinns, like what is what we're referring to, right? So, for example, Armstrong, when he landed on the moon, supposedly, right? What did he say? One giant leap for man, right? He didn't say for men, because he was talking about jinns, right? So here, when malaika are mentioned, this is mentioning the jinns. But no doubt, as the ulema of tafsir have already mentioned, that the glad tidings were given by Jibreel, alayhi salam, and he is from the malaika. This is from the angels. Right? So when you mention Malik, here it's Jinns. And when you mention the Adad, there is not like, like a contradiction would be if it said three angels and one angel. That's a contradiction, no doubt. Right? But when you mention man and men and referring to the Jinns or the, the structure or the type, then this is not a contradiction. We use this in our daily language, right? When we say, uh, for example, we say uh, <coughs> women have rights, women rights, right? Women should have rights. And then we'll say women have been given these rights, right? Here, 
Sometimes we're talking about the, the jinns of what's called a female, a woman, and sometimes we're giving the reference to generally that this is for all women, right? This is not an issue of giving eight years old and 18 years old or three and two, right? This is how you speak in language. And this is, as Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen mentioned this in his tafsir, Ibn Kathir and At-Tabari and all of them have already discussed this. It's not something that we're revising to answer any questions. Yeah. Tell you. Next, are we, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. With the mic though? No, I can just hear you because you're... How about now? No. You have to press it once. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as Hello? There you go. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Bismillah. Role playing. Go for it. Uh, I heard as you Muslims, you guys believe in paradise and hell and they yes. exist and so on. But I just believe those are man made concepts that people just. Think there's hell and paradise so that people do good and avoid bad and so on. Gotcha. Mm. So, do you believe that um, Switzerland exists? Say it again. Switzerland, do you believe the country of Switzerland exists? Yes. Have you been there? No. How do you know it exists? Because of the, the large evidence of people telling me that it exists. Okay. Yes. So, people told you it exists and that's why you believe it exists? Yeah. Okay. Are those people all truthful or do they lie sometimes? Well, it's the fact that so many people okay. have told me. Gotcha. Like Tawatur. Tawatur, mashallah. <laughs> so, but those so many people are from them liars. Mm -hmm. some, some of them lie, right? I'm sure. Sure, but they can't so, all be liars. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, because people have told you, you believe the place exists. Mm -hmm. Even though some of those people are liars. True. Agreed. Some of them may be drunks. Yeah. Some of them may be drug addicts. Maybe. Yeah. Right? When we have prophets who were truthful, who were known, even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even before Islam, he was known to be truthful. Right? Yeah. And prophets before him, so many of them. Right? You know, we talk about Jesus, peace be upon him, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jacob, you know, Ishmael, Noah, all the way back to Adam, have all told us that these places exist. And these are all truthful people, unlike the people you were mentioning, right? So we have greater evidence from more credible sources of the existence of heaven and hell than we do of Switzerland. What if they just made it up and followed each other, for example? Right? Mm. So then they would be liars, mm. right? Yes. But they haven't even been accused of lying, mm. right? And there are more than the people who have told you about Switzerland, right? What if all those people that told you about Switzerland were lying, right? You take something to be a fact, even though the ones that told you are not necessarily truthful. I'm telling you something that the people, the society of the time, including Abraham and others, called the people to be truthful, mm. right? Now, the fact that you haven't seen paradise yeah. or hell mm. doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. When you were in the womb of the mother, there was a time when you were, yes, right? Exactly. At that time, had you seen the world around you? Mm. Had you seen other people? No. Walls, roofs, the sun, the moon, mm. water, food? None of that. If somebody told you about that, that would seem insane, right? But that doesn't mean that the world around you didn't exist. It did exist, even though you hadn't seen it. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was taken to see paradise and he saw the hellfire, right? Now, you could say that he lied. When he told the people what he saw, he lied. You could make that statement. Okay. A man who was never known to lie even before Islam. A man that even his enemies, after his bringing the Risala, like Abu Sufyan and others when they were asked by the Romans, said, no doubt he's truthful. Why would he lie? Right? Fair enough. So you're saying that because there are so many truthful people who have been known to be truthful, that told us that paradise and hell exists, it's too much to disbelieve that it doesn't exist. Exactly. 
Okay, so you believe in paradise and hell, yes. right? And you, you work to avoid hell and go to paradise. Yeah, every day. <laughs> Inshallah, all of us. But is that not like selfish in a way? That all the good that you do mm -hmm. is only because you seek paradise for yourself. Why is that selfish? In let, a way, let's say, let's in say for example, mm. I pushed you off a boat, mm. right? And mm. your choices are either swim or, or drown. Yeah. And you swim because you don't want to drown. Is that selfish? No, no. But the question here is, yeah. if paradise did not exist, right? would you still do good? First thing, I don't go into hypotheticals, right? This is mm. like saying, if America didn't exist, where would you live? I don't know, right? Mm. I deal with reality. And the reality is that paradise does exist. And we know that because not only did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him tell us, not only did the Quran tell us, not only did every Prophet before him tell us, and all the scriptures before him confirm that, but this is what I believe based on miracles of the Quran and the Prophet So I'm going to deal with what is, right? And the fact is there's two destinations, a punishment in hell or a paradise that has reward. And for me to strive to save myself from hell and enter an everlasting life where I can see my Lord and live forever with my family is not selfish. It's how it should be. If this was not something that my Creator wanted me to work towards, He wouldn't encourage me to it. So, go ahead. So, if there was no paradise, you'd still do good? Again, like I said, I don't deal with hypotheticals. Right? Okay. Because yeah. hypotheticals, you can't ever know. Mm -hmm. like, this is like me saying, uh, if you weren't a man, would you be a woman? Uh, probably, right? But mm -hmm. uh, how, how would I act that way? Do I don't know, right? Fair enough. Speak then, to me about reality. Right now, mm -hmm. you tell me this. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be oh, upon him, he recited the Quran. He couldn't read or write, no. right? According to historians across the board. And he recited the Quran and he brought such a book that all of the poets who were well versed in the Arabic language who used to write long books of the Prophet Muhammad never wrote poetry, peace be upon him, right? Those poets couldn't respond to this. They said there is no way this man could come up with this. How did he come up with it? He could have copied it from How? He couldn't even read or write. Mm. Who would he copy it from? From the other scriptures and He couldn't read right. them. Mm -hmm. So are you saying there was somebody else that yeah. was reading it and writing yeah. it and telling him? Mm -hmm. well, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. If you came up with some amazing war book that was going to be the best seller ever, would you let me put my name on it? And nobody knows who you are, you don't get any benefit from it? Mm -hmm. Would you? Okay. Would you? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> to jump from my question, would you? But yes I'm or still, no? I'm still confused on the paradise. I'm asking you a question, mm -hmm. would you? Would I put my name on a book? If you wrote a book yes. that was going to be the amazing work, that was going to go world famous mm -hmm. and be a bestseller and people all yes. over the world be dying to read it, yes. would you allow me to take credit for it and nobody even knows you exist? Honestly. But, but that's not saying that you went my to do it. My question to you is yeah. a yes or no question. Would you or no? Would I? I'd want it for myself, yeah. Okay. If I didn't. So that's the answer, right? That you wouldn't allow me to put my name on it. You would say, I wrote this book. But nothing says that you went from yourself, that I didn't teach you, but you went from yourself, you Excellent. found it, and you wanted to make something. Excellent. So who taught from. the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Maybe he took it from... Who? Somewhere. Somewhere where? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. maybe. The Christians at the time. Okay. If the Christians at the time had a book like the Quran, wouldn't they come forward and say, this is our book, we wrote this, mm. right? And how would it be that verses were revealed about particular incidences like the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud that were related to that incident? If somebody mm. else wrote it before, how would it be talking about what's going on at that time? Mm. Okay. Gotcha. So we agree, so we agree that there is paradise and okay. hell. Okay. based off of the evidence, right? Okay. And that's what we strive towards and we don't know how it would be otherwise, right? Okay. Then just the, as a final question, how is it fair if someone has a limited lifespan, okay. 60 years may it be, but they may deem, be deemed to infinite uh, hell Yes. and equally if someone does something good and enters paradise, they'll be given like infinite good. Yes. Yeah.
No, exactly. That's it's very fair. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Have you ever taken a, a final test at a class? Yes. How long is the test? An hour, two hours. An hour, two three. hours. And if you fail it, do you fail the whole course? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. So this life is that test. Mm -hmm. So you have 60 years, 70, 100, 20, whatever your lifespan is, that's your test. And if you fail it, you fail the big, big. And if you pass it, you pass big. Now the question is, do you have the opportunity to pass this test? Yes. If you die under the age of puberty, where you didn't have the opportunity to understand right from wrong, as Muslims you believe, you'll be in paradise anyway. Because Allah will not judge you for you didn't, what you didn't have the ability to do. But when you have life and you have the right and the ability and the senses and the message reaches you, and you accept it and you live by it as you see these Muslims doing, then yes, you pass the test. And if you reject it after all the signs and all the messengers and all the warnings and all daily, Allah gives signs to us to see the truth. And you still reject it and you live following your desires, doing whatever you want, then you fail the test. But just like in a court, if someone does something wrong, they have a consequence that is equal to what they did in yes. a crime. Exactly. Right? So, so, so how if, is this infinite? Excellent. So if in court, for example, um, I run a stop sign. Yeah. Right? And the government fines me, I don't know, whatever, $300. Mm -hmm. Right? Can I say that in my opinion, that's too much? Sorry? It, no. Let's say I run a stop sign. Mm -hmm. And the fine for that is three hundred dollars. Yes. Can I say that that's, that that fine is too much for just running a stop sign? No. The government's going to tell you that's the rules. Yeah. You knew the rules. Live by it, right? Yeah. So, in the same way, it's not our judgment whether this is too much or less. It's the judge, right? It's the creator who has told you that look, here's your opportunity. Do the right thing and you will get an everlasting paradise. Do the wrong thing, and if you do it to a certain extent, like kufr, then it'll be everlasting hellfire. Now, that's, that's what it is. Now, you have the opportunity right now. You can accept Islam and be saved from hellfire. Or you can be stubborn, and then you will have to pay the consequences. So you ready for your shahada? <laughs> All right, inshallah. Sisters, go ahead. Go ahead, sisters. Uh, sisters, if you have a question, you can go, otherwise... Uh, before real quick, so there is a question that's here that says uh, that it is a contradiction in the Quran, in Surah Maryam. It says, "Does man not remember when we created him from being nothing? Then why does it say we created man fr from clay or sperm?" So this is not a contradiction at all, right? No doubt that there was a time that we were all nothing. We were nobodies. We had nothing, and Allah created us. But that system of creation. It goes from being nothing to the original man, Adam salam, being created from clay or mud. Not all of us. That is when man is being referenced here, it's being referenced as the father of mankind, Adam salam. And then no doubt that there is a time in our creation that, that the spermal fluids from women and man come together and it makes the alaq, yani the, the clot, and then it develops. So this is, this is describing the stages of development, right? So when we talk about being created from clay or mud, that's not us. Me and you didn't have a clay model, but that is where our species came from, which is Adam alayhi salam, and he's referred to as insan, as man, because he was the first man. When we're talking about sperm, then no doubt that is true, that we today, with the parental 
you know, relations coming together, Allah created us and it became alaqa, yani the, the, the clot, and then it developed into a fetus. For example, if a doctor says that you originated from the loins of your parents, and then the doctor says, you know, you came to be from a fetus, that's not a contradiction. That is de describing the stages of the development of the human, and both of those are correct. Faddal Habibi. Is it the same with the jinn that was created from a smoke fire? Is it the first jinn? The first jinn, yes. Yani, and this is, as the ulama of tafsir have mentioned, is Iblis. He was made from a smokeless fire, and from, as Adam is the father of insan, Iblis is the father of jinn. So now jinns do have children as well. Allah. Uh, we're not doing regular QA yet, <laughs> inshallah. This was the scenario. All right, I'll take one and then we're stopping. Go ahead. Uh, is it okay if I talk from like a Shia perspective? Or? Uh, do we have time? I don't know where Shafni is, but. Salah uh, <laughs> Fadr. Of course. So even if it's a play, it's still thing. So before that, insan was nothing. Qabla dalik. So, lam yakun hatta shay qabla khalq al insan. So, any, even like so, if you look at the stages. But the question is that if he comes from a clay, yeah. he is something. Before that, before clay, what was insan? Nothing. So this is the stages of development. From nothing, no clay, nothing, to the first man, developed through clay, through then insan, regularly coming through sperm and becoming a fetus and go on. This is not a contradiction. This is rather a chronological order, right? Tell you, um, I'm going to, go ahead. Okay, but this is the question from the sister. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. Uh, hello. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Abdusalam. Waalaikum assalam. Tala Abdusalam. How are you? Good. If like, uh, it's like someone who like you know, if, like if you go and at like the L, uh, like if you like the LGBTQ. Uh, if 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 I saw like one uh, I, I a person I uh, is talking about LGBT and I say oh this chick doesn't like LGBT so I just want to say forgive me for that. Ah okay. And second question is that you're talking about me, right? Yeah. I, I don't like LGBTQ though. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, can you forgive me for that? Yeah. Huh? I forgive you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, no problem. And second question: If a person you know God gets psychosis. Uh, and he says that why goodness is he committing a sin so when you have this question of why <laughs> we should always remember that Allah is the one who has the most hikmah yeah. the most wisdom yeah and everybody has their own tests yeah. right yeah. so somebody might have cancer yeah. it's not their right to say why me Allah wrote it for us yeah. right somebody might be blind yeah. they cannot say why me yeah. right Allah wrote it for them is it but committing it, sin so this is sinful if they persist in it. The question can come to your mind, yeah. but then a person should tell themselves, look, whatever Allah gave me with, Alhamdulillah is the best. Mm -hmm. And whatever Allah didn't give me, He has the wisdom. Yep. And Allah does not hold you accountable for what you don't have. Yeah. So if somebody has mental disabilities, yeah. then they're given an easier test, yeah. right? If somebody doesn't have the sight, yeah. there will not be question for the eyes. Yes. If somebody d can't stand, yeah. they can sit down and pray. Yeah. Somebody doesn't have money for Hajj, they're not held accountable for yeah. it. Yeah. So in the end, it's a test. Mm -hmm. And everybody will have different difficulties, mm -hmm. and we don't ask why. Okay. Okay? Good? Yeah, yeah because I, I used to say, why, why didn't they, they say, oh, you're committing sin. I say, why, I got this. I got, you know, psychosis, and I went to hospital, and I say, why, I got this. Well, alhamdulillah, now you know better, yeah? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. May Allah protect you and yeah. keep you on the right path. Yeah. Tell you, uh, so there is a brother here, uh, if you come. And Alhamdulillah, I saw today a very good opportunity for da'wah here in Toronto. 
Alhamdulillah, our brother uh, Attila. 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 MashaAllah has been active with the da'wah here and other brothers that I met. Omar, but he's not here. He's, he went Omar. back home. MashaAllah. In Misaga. Alhamdulillah. Today we were out there and I was there for less than an hour. Alhamdulillah, we had two people accept Islam. Allah. As I mentioned, one of them, he actually took the shahada. The other one accepted the aqidah. He took a Quran and he's waiting for his shahada. But he accepted Islam. He said, I believe in Allah. I believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I believe in the Quran. This was just in an hour, right? So that means that there is great opportunity. But the most important thing about da'wah, as I said at the beginning of this talk, is istiqama, is steadfastness. When we started giving da'wah in San Diego, it wasn't like what you see today, where you know you go out and there's people coming and shahadas every weekend. No, many times we used to go out and nobody would talk to us. Maybe one person in an hour. In an hour, we would have one conversation. For the months, whole day. Months. Would For the whole day. Or the whole day. I remember myself going out to Balboa Park and we spent four hours, five hours, and maybe had three, four conversations even, right? And even if nobody talks to you, you did your job. Guidance is from Allah. So what's important is istiqama, to be steadfast. So we need brothers here in Canada to sign up, to volunteer, and show up consistently. It doesn't matter if I'm there or not. It doesn't matter if Shafni is there or Atilla is even there. Make it your responsibility. It's not difficult to give one hour or two hour a week or month. It's not something that's overtasking, but make it a part of your schedule and be steadfast with it, inshallah. Yeah, um, pretty much uh, what the Sheikh is trying to give you guys is the um, courage pad to initiate something. He will not be there forever in San Diego, neither we will be here for another, who knows, Allah knows best. But you guys are the next generations. You guys are the ones that are uh, being bombarded non-stop in the school with uh, letter people, I call them the letter people, yeah? You're bombarded with everything, uh, any ism. Now, if you fundamentally understood Islam upon the Akid of Salaf al doesn't matter who comes in your way. You don't need to engage in intellectual conversation, in contingency argument, stay away from that, this is my advice. Yes, Sheikh will come true. From. Now, once you understood, like for instance with uh, Sheikh Harim Abu Zaid, he has a book, who knows his book? Know your Lord? Anyone? I do. Excellent. If you guys learn, read that book. He literally took it from the classical scholars in the past. And if you understand it, digest it, like how many university students here? So you guys read books, right? <laughs> they read you, wh why? Why? Why do you read those books? To get knowledge. What about the Yeah. So that will be your foundation. Now when that is uh, started when you started the uh, snowball effect, then w you have to settle somewhere. So let's say some of you are here in Scarborough, right? Then some of us are in downtown, and there is another brother in Mississauga. Then we can settle up and say, okay, this group is doing this, this group is doing that. Now, then you can have the sheikh once a month or once every now and then go through the basic questions and answers that we encounter and so on and so forth. I've been doing this for many years, more than 15, or roughly that. I lost count. It's not about the shahada that you have under your belt. It's the giving the message. Hmm. Someone can get a message today or get one of your pamphlets, and who knows where they put it, and then someone else or their grandchildren take it 10, 15 years from now, and they accept Islam. So there's much more to say, but this is just a, in a nutshell. We need to establish, oh, by the way, how many of you saw the Jehovah Witnesses? Okay. You've all seen Jehovah's Witnesses, trust me. <laughs> Did you guys notice how organized they are? Very. Do you know they have like shifts? Because I live downtown and, and, I, and I talk to them. Well, they try to ignore me. Anyway, they will not talk to me. <laughs> but they have shifts. Two hours, every two hours or one hour, someone else comes and replaces them. And, and, and I'm most of the time by myself. I say, who's going to replace me? Say, oh, there's nobody. Yeah. So if they can do it, what about us? Which was, we, we, are we upon the hack? Yes. yes. Are they upon the hack? No. They do it, we cannot do it? We can do it. Inshallah. Okay. So let's start, inshallah. And, um, um, how can the brothers sign up? Is there like a... Can so uh, as I was talking with Brother Shafni, we can make a hub. Okay. And then at uh, TIC, we can have classes upon many, 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 many different courses. And then we'll start, inshallah. Whoever wants to sign up, we will give the information and... Uh, 
We'll so we, do, we don't want people to lose momentum. So let's do this today. If all the brothers were ready to even give one hour a month or one hour every two months, please see Brother Shafni, give your information, give your number and your name, make a WhatsApp group. And from today, we're going to start this, inshallah. You guys ready? Yes. And Shaykh, I was gonna, I was gonna, I didn't ask the Shaykh about this, but maybe once a month we could maybe do a training online or just a 10, 50, I don't know. Inshallah. If you're in the airport or something, you know. But because uh, we are connected with I the Shaykh, and we, you know, <laughs> we want some type of mentorship from him as well, inshallah, and the other uh, du'at upon uh, upon the Sunnah. Uh, this is something that we want as well, and we and, and one of the main reasons for this conference as well is we want brothers with us who are aligned correctly upon the Aqidah as Shaykh Karim says, no compromises mm. we're not doing it for money, we're not doing it for fame this brother, I, don't, I think this is the first time he's standing in front of a, a camera and he's like, you know, Allah knows yeah, 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 but I don't have one. you know, he doesn't, uh, doesn't do it for you know, and this and subhanAllah, so I mean, he's a very dedicated individual who's not looking for fame or anything like that he's just looking Quran, Sunnah, Manhaj al Salaf. Alhamdulillah, you know, so, I mean, Allah bless it for you This is something I think we definitely want to be a part of inshallah If you are interested, please come see me and then we can work together If you are in different cities, we can help you start chapters and things like that We'll talk about that inshallah I think we, Shaykh we, 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 can, we can make this huge but we need, we need you guys. But that's got to be done today. So today, I want you guys to go see Shafni, give your name, give your number, so you can start a WhatsApp group, we can start a shift, a, a shift list. That's got to get done, inshallah. Sure. Everybody ready? Inshallah. Right, so this brother's had his hand for a long time, so let me just... So inshallah, it. last question, and then uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Zidane is, yeah. is waiting. Um, we have the QA session after Isha. Yeah, after so we can talk so we can more. If you have more questions related to the da'wah thing, you can come see me after the lecture. Brother in the black, go ahead. Wa alaykum as salam. This question might become a hobby in like 10 years from now. But the question is like, I've seen this online somewhere, so the question goes as follows Why is Islam against body mutations and even gender reassignment surgery? Uh, you may say there's negative effects right now. But eventually technology will become advanced to the point where you can flip back and forth genders. MashaAllah. So how can Muslim countries still oppose the Gotcha. So the question to repeat is how can Muslims be against uh, gender, what did you say, reassignment and body modification when in the future it could be that all those bad effects from it will be gone and you can switch back and forth like a little flip. I don't know. I don't know how that works, right? First thing is, we don't answer hypotheticals. Right? Maybe in the future someday, um, cars will go under the ground and into the water. We don't get into the future. Let's talk about right now. Right? Today, when you're born, biologically, you have a gender. Right? Everybody, even a eunuch, has, you know, khuntha, even they have a gender. Right? And the way humanity works, and how any species works, is you have a male and you have a female and them coming together reproduces and forwards that species. That's the way of nature. Even if you're not a Muslim, you have to admit that that is the biological way humans work. We as Muslims believe in the Quran and we as Muslims believe in the Prophet ﷺ. And the Quran has told us that Allah made us men and women, right? The Rijal and Nisa Oh, uh, yani when we talk about Munnath and Madhakar, this is the way Allah made us, right? And the Prophet ﷺ told us that the la'na of Allah, the curse of Allah, is on the woman that dresses like a man, and on the man that dresses like a woman. And we know that even studies have been done about the psychological effects, which don't go away with flipping switches, and the biological effects of changing genders, right? In fact, suicide rates are higher, and this is a study that has been produced recently, upon those that actually went through gender reassignment than those that didn't, right? So we believe that this is the way that our Creator created us, and we stay that way. That's our belief. Go ahead. So how can we apply this to something like more modern, like tattoos, for example? We, we are against tattoos. No, I'm saying like, uh, from a non muslim perspective. But this yeah, that's easy. Look, we, need, we believe that there is a Creator. Do you believe there is a Creator? Okay, we believe that Creator knows better than us how we should live. Do you agree? He tells us right from wrong, right? Whether you believe it's okay to steal or not, somebody else could have a different belief. Somebody could say abortion is moral, and somebody could say it's immoral. Somebody could say the death penalty is moral, somebody could say it's immoral. How are you going to decide? 
So we believe in a divine revelation. That divine revelation was sent to the different prophets who brought the same message. All of them condemned homosexuality. All of them condemned uh, cross-gender things from the Bible. For example, in the Bible, you can find in Leviticus and in the New Testament in Romans, the death penalty for homosexuality, that's in the Bible. I'm showing you from there, right? So whether you take Judaism or Christianity or Islam, there has been one uniform message. And we believe in that message. So if you ask me what's right from wrong, I'm going to go back to divine sources. I'm going to go to the Quran as the final preserved message and the Sunnah of the Prophet That's what I believe is right and wrong. And I have the right to believe that, right? If you don't believe in it, it's up to you. But I'm going to present to you what is from divine sources. Cool? Khalas. Present with you, like Sheikh uh, Osman, and uh, Mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him for the lecture that he gave, and Sheikh Karim, and everyone. Uh, this is what is more benefiting, inshallah ta'ala, than having something from a distance virtual like this. There's always a blessing in the physical uh, presence and the physical gatherings, uh, which is, uh, you know, it adds to uh, the matters of knowledge. It's not about information, it's about ilm, and the ilm is the fear of Allah and in the houses of Allah and the masajid we increase our iman we get affected better definitely than hearing it from a distance but we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless it for all of us inshallah uh, continuing the subject of uh, the doubts that the orientalists and the like of them spread uh, among uh, their own followers to attack the truth and the believers or the Muslims, those who get affected uh, one way or the other by these types of doubts. And with uh, specific subjects to that, and adding to what's mentioned yesterday about the original ruling of every Muslim and the way of Salaf al-Salih, the early generations of Islam, dealing with deviance, deviant ideas and shubuhat and the like of that, that is to stay away and to protect your heart and to purify yourself. And to be busy with learning the haqq and it's a fact that once the person learns the haqq the haqq the truth is well established in the person and he's applying it in its in his life he would see that all of these uh, matters and that they talk about with doubts and deviations are very foolish it's something that is uh, you just find yourself how can people even think of some matters like this and spend money you know, publish books and things like this so the haqqa and the batal, the truth and the falsehood is like basically the, uh, as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah stated this and others, is like the stick of Musa alayhi salam, he threw it and he took all, all of these uh, false uh, things that the sorcerers, they uh, you know, deceived the people that these are stakes or so. Uh, the stick of Musa alayhi salam, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is the haqq, took them all. And the matter become very clear immediately to the people. And this is how again the haqq versus the falsehood. Uh, another point which is extremely important in this subject. Uh, when disbelievers or deviant ones, they bring all kinds of doubts and, and questions. Uh, it's, uh, it shows how the human beings and the arrogance of the human beings were living in a world where people can uh, can claim things that is against the pure fitra, the pure innate of the human beings, which is a very obvious thing of how how evil it is. And people still 
uh, or some of them would take that or would even try to stop those who would uh, forbid such an evil by even with words of advice. So if human beings can degrade themselves to that level, uh, what authority they have to oppose the haqq, the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, which makes per perfect sense if people understand just the maqasad or the objectives of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything fits perfectly. So again, this is something for us as Muslims to see that clearly, that the human beings and the shayateen, those who uh, aid them, they have nothing but false ideas and deceptions that has no basis to it whatsoever. One of these subjects, uh, after talking about the uh, what they claimed of the Quran with regards to the sources of the Quran and uh, things that might be coherent to them like with the stories of the Quran which is all uh, something that we talked about it inshallah ta'ala uh, the subject of an nas subject of an nas or the abrogation and this is always a subject that comes in place in the subject of da'wah whether it's to non-Muslims or to Muslims and it's one of the subjects in Ulum al-Qur'an and the knowledge or the sciences of the Qur'an that is well explained by the people of knowledge. Uh, and it's a mandatory knowledge for someone that wants to make tafsir of the Qur'an to know what's abrogated and what's not abrogated. Uh, but first of all, the word, and then I will say this very briefly, inshallah ta'ala, and talk about maybe some other things very briefly, and you probably heard it from the Mashayikh, whether it's the rights of women or a change of the Qur'an or the subject of the jihad or violence or these matters. Uh, but uh, very briefly, the word uh, nas in the Arabic language can has uh, more than a couple of meanings. Basically, it's uh, like when you transcribe something or when you copy something, you copy a book, you transfer it, you, can, you transfer something to something. This is can call nas. And the second thing is the abrogation or, or lifting something. So, uh, you know, so this is basically what abrogation or change. And in the Quran, of course, the famous ayah in the Quran, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِيَا نَأْتِي بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا مِثْلِهَا أَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ We do not uh, abrogate a verse or change, except it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He would change it, replace it by something better. Don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things? And... Uh, the Nasr in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, something that has consensus among the early generations of Islam and it's something that is, uh, again, no doubt about it whatsoever. Some of the later ones, when they doubt the Nasr or the abrogation and they said, how can that be when it comes to the Book of Allah, the revelation from Allah, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they use their own uh, weak reasoning when it's uh, it's perfect wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to the subject of an nasr and uh, and of course this is you know when it comes to certain things of inheritance uh, rights or or rulings when it comes to fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or other things uh, that it's it's very well stated in the uh, work of the people of knowledge when it comes to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an abrogates some verses, abrogates other verses in the Qur'an. And uh, the Qur'an abrogates some of the things that is in the Sunnah, Sunnah to the Sunnah. But when, when it comes to the Sunnah, abrogates something in the Qur'an. This is where it has some differences of opinions. But in general, the Nasr is something that is well established in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is wisdom behind it, of course. There's benefits, great benefits. Uh, and many of the things that people might think has nasr or abrogated, and it's, and it's not. And the Ummah benefit from it. And I'll give you just one example of that. When it comes to the verses that were in Mecca, commanding the Prophet ﷺ and the companions of the Allah to be patient with their enemies, uh, to have sabr, Allah, till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give the ruling. Uh, when facing the atrocities and the evil actions of the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would command the Prophet ﷺ and the companions of the Allah to be patient and not to oppose that with seeking justice. And of course, there's nothing whatsoever, whether it's in Mecca or in Medina or any verse in the Quran or any hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that would call people to fall into transgression. 
aggression, to fall into injustice whatsoever. So people are, or the rulings are between the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be established versus to pardon and to uh, have mercy and things like this, but nothing beyond these two limits. So in Mecca, when the verses were like that, and then when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ was established and the companions of the Allah Anhu, and still the disbelievers are the ones that came from a far distance to try to, uh, not just to fight the Prophet ﷺ, their objective is to completely eliminate the believers from the face of earth and to oppose the the wahi, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once and for all. This is how their goals were. It was not just some, uh, you know, uh, things here and there. So who on the face of earth would ever say anything but to defend the truth? And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. So don't be fooled by those who uh, would try to, and this is the subject of also the, the violence and the things like this. The subject of al-jihad fi sabillah is well established in the deen of al-Islam with its rulings and and uh, things to govern it and it's based basically by the people of authority. This is not an individual task. This is by the people of authority and it's basically what human beings are upon since they were uh, placed on the face of earth till the day of judgment. There's always struggle. There's always justified wars and fightings and things like this. So if you don't that fight you will be fought against. And there's nothing more noble than to fight for the truth, for the ultimate truth, for the justice to prevail, for goodness to be well established. So again, but it's, it's, it goes with ahkam, with rulings. And it's for only the people of authority to fulfill that. It's not for individuals to establish it. And it's, it's perfect rulings and we, we don't hide anything, alhamdulillah. We have it in the books of fiqh well established and anyone that studies fiqh will study the subject of a jihad fi sabilullah with all of its limits. But again, going back to the subject of a nas or the abrogation with this example, when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina and then the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet ﷺ to fight for the sake of Allah, to make the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala superior, not for any worldly benefit and with perfect justice and mercy and so on, and we're not going to get into the details of these rulings. It's well established in the deen of Allah. Uh, when they say that the verses that were revealed in Mecca with regards to be patient and to pardon, this was abrogated by the verses of al jihad fi sabil uh, It's not necessarily abrogated in that sense. Why? Because the ummah continue to benefit from it till the day of judgment if the same circumstances is present. So if the Muslims are facing the same, the same circumstances as the Prophet ﷺ faced in Mecca, then the same rulings apply. It is not mandatory for them to do something that they don't have the capacity for. And the objective is to make the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala superior. So for them to be patient, facing difficulties, to be patient, facing atrocities, injustices, and to be firm upon the deen of Allah and to convey the message to the people with humbleness, with goodness. And as mentioned before, there's no one, whether you know, it should be, uh, the Muslim is the safest individual that people can feel uh, safe and secure when they mix and they mingle with him. In any environment, if Muslims, for example, they are minority in a place, they are the safest individuals on the face of earth because this is deen to them. This is religion to them when they are obligated not to harm others but rather to extend their benefits to others and to be kind to them and to be patient with them and to pardon them to forgive them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is again when it comes to the subject of a nasr it's not the ayat were not abrogated because it's still valid for Muslims at all times to uh, use these uh, means when they are weak and oppressed and things like this to imitate the way of the Prophet when he was in Mecca facing all kinds of difficulties. Uh, and uh, well, when it comes to the other you know, means of, uh, of abrogations, of course, we're not into the subject of studying this from the perspective of Ulum al-Quran and the different types of al-Nasr and uh, the Nasr, whether it's, you know, the ulama they put it in different categories, it depends on how you look at it with categorizing it, whether it's the type of Nasr 
or an abrogation Quran with the Quran for the Quran, the Quran from the you know abrogating the Sunnah, the Sunnah abrogating the Sunnah, and the different examples to this. Uh, but also there is the nasr or the abrogation of the deen of Islam, the final revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of the previous revelations. And it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, this is perfect wisdom. What was uh, befitting certain nations as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets to their people. Every prophet was sent to his people. And the prophets of Bani Israel, they were sent to their people. As Isa alayhi salam was sent to Bani Israel only. Musa alayhi salam was sent to Bani Israel only. Till the Prophet alayhi salatu was sent, he was sent to all mankind. So his message is universal. And therefore, it abrogates all of the messages before. And the same thing for messengers of Allah. And that's even present in uh, among the people of the book with what has been forbidden that was not forbidden before and things like this. So whoever claim that there's no abrogation when it comes to religions, they contradict themselves to start with. So, uh, and uh, it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wahi revelation from Allah, the rulings char uh, change. But of course, what's never to be abrogated uh, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship when it comes to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and uh, the major things, the, the major things are forbidden. The major things, even if the actions are not done in the, the very specific way that from one generation or from one messenger to the other, like establishing the salah. But the salah is to be different from one messenger to the other. And the way that we establish the salah, for example, abrogates all of the different ways, even if people if. And it's by the mercy of Allah that they don't have any authenticity to claim that this is how Isa alayhi salam uh, established the prayer or Musa alayhi salam. They don't have real authentic way to prove that. The way that we have uh, when it comes to, as an example, establishing the salah. Uh, so if someone, if for the sake of argument, they claim that they have exactly the exact way of how Isa alayhi salam or Musa alayhi salam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how, man, how many times a day and how exactly they prayed uh, raka'at, sujood, ruku' and so on. Uh, if they claim that there was something like that present, it's still, it's not valid to be followed because the final revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to be established. And that's why Isa alayhi salam, when he uh, descends on the earth in the end of times, he would follow the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way the Prophet alayhi wa prayed and he would even not uh, lead the people as an imam to make to make it clear to them that he's not there to change anything. He's just a follower of uh, the Prophet As you heard before, one of the funny things of the ta'asub or the prejudice to the madahib and to the school of thoughts, when someone said that when Isa salam comes down, he would pray the Hanafi way or the Shafi'i way or so. He would pray the way the Prophet prayed. And again, these differences of opinions and matters of fiqh is valid, and the salah is valid, alhamdulillah. And all of the ulama, their ishtihad was to establish the way of the Prophet ﷺ. So even if there is differences of opinions and matters of fiqh, it, it's spacious enough for all of us. But the ishtihad is to make sure that we follow the dalil, the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, and this is a covenant between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is this type of nas or abrogation. It's very obvious, of course, it's a matter of belief. But then within the Sharia, ah, within the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, with regards to the categories that we mentioned, also there is whether to, to change it uh, to something else when a ruling is changed to, to another ruling or just changed without another ruling to be specified. Like, for example, a nas to something that is like of it. And it's uh, equal in, in level. That means it's not more difficult or it's not, it's not less difficult because the nest or abrogation is not necessarily something that will relieve the people from difficulty, as uh, many would think, or to make it uh, lighter for them. You know, one of the, or one of the types of a nest is that it, it abrogates to something uh, similar when it comes to the ability to do it. For example, facing the Qibla, facing Mecca in Salah after they were facing Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem. 
So there is the abrogation of facing Bayt al-Maqdis to face Mecca. Uh, of course, in the verses in Surah al-Baqarah, it was very clear. And it's, of course, can consensus among the Ummah. And therefore, whoever decides to face Bayt al-Maqdis, even though this is a, a holy place for the Muslims, and the Salah is multiplied if a person prays there, but whoever faces Bayt al-Maqdis intentionally in the Salah, the Salah is not valid. You have to face Mecca, the first house of worship. And this was abrogated as the verses in the Quran stated the Nasr and all of the meanings and the benefits and the and the and the wisdom behind the Nasr you would find it in Surah Al Baqarah in the subject of changing the Qibla uh, and how the Nasr was there. And this is something that is not something going from something difficult to something light or, or vice versa. It's just changing the direction. And this was one of the things or the first thing that was abrogated in the Quran. And the Jews in Medina, they attacked this so much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted their calls and saying, And the like of these verses. Uh, some of the nas might be to something else that is lighter in, uh, in the ability to do it. Like fighting for the sake of Allah when it was an obligation of, uh, among the believers, upon the believers, if they are 20 uh, facing 200, it is not permissible for them to flee from the battlefield. The verses in Surah Al-Anfal, Ya ayuha al-Nabiyu haqarrid al-Mu'minin al-Qital, Iyakum minkum ishuna sabiruna yaghlibu mi'atay. Wa iyakum minkum mi'atu yaghlibu alfam min al-ladhina kafaru bi'annam qamu la yafqahu. And if you are 100, then you don't flee if your enemy are 1,000. So this is an ob as an obligation. It is... A major sin if they flee in the battlefield if their enemies are much more multiplication. If it's more than that, then it's permissible for them to flee, for example, because they're overpowered, overnumbered. And this ayah was abrogated by the verse right after it in the same surah. Al -ana khaffaf Allah ankum. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for you, relieved you from this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that you have weakness. We attain the verse. If you're 100, then you can defeat 200. If there are more than 200, then it's an, not an obligation upon you. So the double. Uh, so all the way to the double, then you have no excuse, but you have to be firm and you have to face them. So this is to make it easier for the believers. Someone would say, what's the wisdom behind that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows before and after and the ability of the believers and so on. And still the verses are to be recited in the Quran, is not cancelled or anything. First of all, it's not to be cancelled. This is a verse that we recite because this is the miraculous speech of Allah. Right? So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for it to be recited, even though the rulings does not apply because it got abrogated, right? It's the words of Allah, it's the miraculous words of Allah for people to recite it, to get rewards and to see the miraculous words of Allah. Plus the verse talks about certain, there is more than what's mentioned about the rulings. The verse ends with uh, 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 about uh, Why the, the, the ratio of power is there? Because the disbelievers, there are people that do not comprehend. They don't have the right fiqh, the right understanding. That's why you have uh, power over them which shows that this belief takes away from the person's reason and intellect. So you already know that, right? So this is a great benefit even mentioned in the verse that has been abrogated and other benefits. And one of which is that if, if the believers, they would apply what was abrogated, it's not haram for them. It's not forbidden for them. And it means that also they have the ability to do it, but it's not being an obligation upon them. That's what's basically has been abrogated by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also to show the virtue of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them. And they, when it comes to sami'na wa ta'na, we listen and we obey, complete submission to the commands of Allah. And it's by the barakah, the blessings of these companions radiallahu anhum, that this relief happened. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them to be the best generation ever brought to mankind. Compare this to how Bani Israel, when they oppose the commands of Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it more difficult for them. But for the companions, عنهم, they showed their complete submission. And this is valid till the day of judgment for each and every one of us. If you submit yourself 
completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you? And you fully submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for you. Not difficult for you. Whoever is obedient to Allah and have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make ways out for him and he will provide for him from ways that he does not expect. So this is also another benefit that we benefit from uh, something like that when it comes to the naskh or the abrogation. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's like of this where the naskh was for something lesser in, in effort or so like the eating and drinking uh, of, you know, during the night before going to sleep in Ramadan. This was, if someone does this, if a person sleeps, that's it. That means there's no uh, suhoor for, that means a person has to complete their fast. And this was abrogated in the verses that talks about Ramadan and fasting. So this is one type. And the wisdom or behind this, uh, or some of the wisdom behind it. Also, when it comes to a less or abrogation to something that might be more difficult, going from less to more difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. And more difficult, there's no difficulty in the deen of Islam. It's just we are required to exert ourselves, to be patient, and to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a rule in the deen of Allah, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put burden on any soul that is uh, over its capacity. So that's why, and that's one of the miraculous things about the deen of Islam, every ruling is in the capacity of the human beings. And if they don't have the capacity for it, you would find the relief from within the deen of Islam and the rulings of the deen of Allah. But one of these things is, uh, for example, what was permissible in the beginning, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade it, like khamr, for example, intoxications or drinking wine, uh, it was permissible in the beginning. It was not forbidding, forbidden from the beginning. It was in a gradual way got forbidden. It is forbidden for them to, uh, to drink uh, before the salah, to be intoxicated while in the salah. And then it was uh, forbidden completely. And the verses are still there in the Quran. And we can see that also clearly. And someone had asked actually, is there a benefit of the verses that talks about that you do not approach the salah while you're intoxicated, even though it's abrogated. Of course, there's great benefits. Even though it's completely forbidden now. It, again, it shows that uh, this gradual nas or the gradual forbidden, it's something that the believers, but the people of knowledge can be used not in something that is already forbidden. We, we, if someone is, is drinking uh, uh, alcohol or something like this, can we use these verses and he goes to Aal and says, I'm, this is, I'm addicted to this. Can I just stop it in a gradual way and form? This is not permissible. If it's haram, it's haram. You stay away from it. Seek help from Allah. There's no such a thing as it was forbidden in a gradual way that and you can also stop it in a gradual way. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, That if I forbid you of something, then you stay away from it. So there's no gradual uh, quitting drinking alcohol for example but for someone for example if he is in that sin and he's drinking right he's committing a major sin he's still a muslim right it does it does not take him outside the fold of islam right and if if he quits immediately right and his nafs becomes weak and he falls into it and he repents to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps on falling and repenting and so on uh, this is repentance is accepted and happened even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. and it shows that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but again the ruling how it was forbidden and the uh, this was the real ease for the ummah and how the you know forbidding something like this that brings the shaitan in the shaitan wa and and all of the different evil outcome as a result of, of, of drinking. And the same thing with the punishment of the zina or fornication. So this is going from something that was permissible or the zawaj muta, the muta marriage, to something that is you know to be forbidden and and forbidden for good. And this is how things the rulings were established one thing after the other. Uh, and when something that is nas with a different type of nas when there's, it's not nas or abrogated to something else, uh, you know, for example that. The companions were obligated to give charity 
before they speak to the Prophet والسلام, and they have a, a, a personal conversation for the, with the Prophet والسلام, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to give charity before they do so. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved them from it. It was abrogated, but not to something else, just abrogated. You know, and this is clearly stated in Surah Al-Mujadil. Uh, so this is, again, as you see, and it's is of a great wisdom. And for us to read it today, you know, if I if I read to you, for example, the verse that uh, commanding the companions of the Allah to give charity when they speak to the Prophet والسلام, first, and then it was abrogated. يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا ناجيتم الرسول فقدموا بين يدينا جبالكم صدقة uh, give صدقة charity before you do so ذلك خير لكم وأطهر this is better for you and this is more purifying for you فإن لم تجدوا فإن الله غفور رحيم and if you don't find a mean to give charity Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the most forgiver and he's the most merciful so uh, the, the objective for the believers is to do what is best is to purify themselves, right? So uh, this is something that purified the companions of the Allah, exalting and respecting the Prophet والسلام, And this is what the believers, when they see this, you know, there's nothing, you know, that they would long for better than to be with the Prophet والسلام, and to see the Prophet والسلام, and things like this. So uh, again, I don't want to make the entire talk about Nas. But as you see, the Nasr is uh, something that is very clear stated in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, with the different categories of it. And there's a, a great uh, wisdom behind it. And uh, when, when people are asked, how was the sons of Adam, they get married. You know, as, as we know that this is forbidden for a brother to marry his sister. Right? But the sons and daughters of Adam are that uh, how did they reproduce? That means they got married. So something was like that was permissible. And then it became and everybody agreed to this. So whether it's Jews, Christians or anyone, right? So how can they speak about less types of things? They said the verses that was ever created when you look at these verses by itself you know specifically and one verse after the other and we can again this is a, a detailed subject uh, to look into the verses of what was abrogated and so on you would find great benefits in reading it in knowing the tafsir of it in reflecting upon it it's not like it's abrogated cancel it go for, you know to the next verse it's not like this this is something that you can benefit from it till the day of judgment and it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can be there at all times. So this is one subject. And again, because of the time, this is very brief. Um, when it comes to, you know, the rights of, of women, I, I, I really find myself, it's funny to talk about these matters. Uh, what I'm saying this is because it's, uh, they, we should not be dragged into, 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 into what they they want us to talk about. I mean, again, for a Muslim that knows his deen, you know, it's uh, it's one of the amazing things that when we talk about the obvious and people do not uh, see the obvious, when you when you have to explain what is obvious, you know, when you have to explain that what's up in the skies is called the sun, you know, when you have to convince someone that it's the sun and it's not something else. This is the type of, of thing that is out there that it's a reality that we have to face. But for a Muslim, again, as we said, we have to have that certainty uh, and to study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, when, you know, we have to be careful also from a, uh, from a deviant movement. And it can be also among Muslims when they say Islam gave all the rights to the women and things like this. Uh, but they say it in such a way the Prophet is such a bad way and things like this and they mention all the different examples of that among the Romans and among the everyone and the Prophet ﷺ sent him with these perfect traits of women which is of course true but they kind of give you the sense that this was perfect at that time at the time of the Prophet, she was liberated with this and that. 
and they give you that is that now it's we need to take it to another level right and this is so evil from the time of the prophet والسلام, the deen did not change and the rights that were given it's given by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of both men and women and one brief thing that i wanted to mention clearly that when you look into the ayat of the quran that talks about both men and women men amila saliha that can one say whoever do righteous good deeds from male and female uh, the hadith of the prophet والسلام, the women are the uh, the companions of the men and in the muslimin and muslimat and the believing men and women women and the different characteristics of the believers all mentioned men and women when we see this there's no differences when it comes to uh, their their being as creation of allah as honored by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to their actions and their rewards and so on but when it comes to jobs that they're entrusted with it's the perfect wisdom of allah of how he created them different so therefore the ahkam their rulings will be different according to what is different uh, in their physical creation and their also non-physical uh, differences between men and women so therefore the ahkam is based on that justice from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, for example when they talk about the rules of inheritance right uh, it's uh, they, they, it's, it's lies that they would spread. Then if people would study, they would see how perfect the rulings of inheritance, for example. You know, they always say that the woman takes half of what the man takes. And it's, uh, it, it's true in certain situations, and it's not true at all times. Right? But also there's jobs entrusted. Who's the one that bear the financial responsibility of a household? It's the man. And the woman, she bears a huge responsibility, and that is to uh, take care of her family and one of which is her husband. And we're proud of this. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. And she takes care of her husband and she serves her husband and she serves her children. And this is such an honorable position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted her with. And at the same time, the man is the one that uh, goes and seek the provisions from Allah. And it does not forbid for the women to seek provisions, of course. But again, it's to put things in the right perspective. And But when it comes to the rulings of, of, of inheritance, for example, if I will give you a case, for example, there are many cases. If someone dies and he leaves a daughter, right? And this is a mas'ala of inheritance, anyone that studied inheritance before. If you have someone died and he left a daughter, and a father and a mother. A daughter and a father and a mother. How much the daughter would get? I, I can't see anyone. So I hope that someone is answering right uh, the daughter would get one half right and the mother will get one sixth right and the father will get one sixth and whatever is left which is when you calculate the one half for the daughter and one sixth of the mother but you add these two together this is two thirds so whatever is left is one third so who gets more the daughter or the father of the deceased the daughter gets more so that's a female gets more than the male than the male so again this is based on of course the relationship that she is to the deceased and other things but it's wisdom of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one is to question the wisdom of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, but uh, people need to reflect upon the quran don't they reflect upon the quran uh, and if it was from other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they would find many differences Right. So, uh, for example, when you have people even they're entrusted with with certain jobs, right? Someone, for example, is a, a garbage collector, right? Does that person necessarily of a lesser level of importance than someone that has PhD in a university university professor? You know, who said that this a job that he's entrusted to do, this person is have a job that he's entrusted to do. So it's not about uh, equality in, 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 in their being. You know, they're all creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's the jobs that each were their own financial being and identity, they, men and women, of course, that they uh, are devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what makes them unique 
during that time for pregnancy, having the, the, the different even uh, differences between men and women. So uh, this is something for people to reflect upon this. For the believers, they submit themselves. The hijab and the different ways of, of awa between men and women, it's totally different. Whoever denies this, they are uh, denying their own existence, really. So it's, uh, you know, things like this should be very clear. And with the details of that, we can see clearly how perfect it is. And we have to be, have the honor and dignity that whoever opposes this, they are wrong. They are wrong. We're not defending or we have uh, some form of a, uh, example, the Prophet ﷺ marrying Aisha radiallahu anha. The you know, answer to this, who said that you, what you're saying is right? What you're saying is what, you're, what you have in your mind is wrong. You know, what the Prophet ﷺ did was the most perfect thing. And then we can explain it, of course, but, you know, people need to be changed. Well, again, we're, we're living at times when the obvious, people are denying what is obvious. And they would try to confuse you with what is obvious. So imagine when it's something that is not as in such a level. And, of course, we know that a hadith and the ayat of the Quran that talks about being kind to the to the parents and especially the mother. Uh, when they ask the Prophet ﷺ, who is the one that has more rights to be my companion, the Prophet of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ummu, your mother. He asked again your mother. He asked that so uh, that means the women are having more preference than the men. You know, is that it's like a form of an in, in, inequality between the men and women? You know, when you're a father, right, and you see that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the mother more rights. Uh, Recording in progress. Among you are the, the best to his family. So the best of men are the one that is best to his wife. And this is, uh, yeah, that's why, again, we don't know this. We, we, this is not part of us, this disputes that people have. We don't have this. The deen of Islam is, is the perfect way of life. And when people have their own problems because of the lack of perfectness and they try to project this uh, to those who are upon the truth, this is what we're seeing when it comes to most of these shubhat and these doubts. If it's questioned, that's different. And, and as we know that this is you know, a tendency in the human beings when, when you have a thief, the thief kind of perceive everybody as thieves like him. You know, this is the projection that people would have. So the same thing when people have falsehood and they're upon falsehood and they have all kinds of evil things within themselves, they will try to project this to others. But we don't have this because this is again, this is a perfect divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the same thing when it comes to again whether it's the rights of the women, uh, the jihad fi sabilillah, and it's uh, it's part of, of, of being a Muslim to struggle within oneself and to struggle to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with matters of goodness and justice and, and, and greatness and all kinds of things without any uh, contradiction whatsoever. All of that is, again, uh, part of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, there are many things or other things that is not talked about here. But I hope that uh, as a sincere advice to myself and to everyone is to busy ourselves with learning the deen of Islam and if you have the ability to spend all of the time that you have to study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ummah is in so much in need of this, not just as information, as I said, but to continue in the path of knowledge, to, to strengthen the lineage between us and the people of knowledge, not like those who and uh, you know, be open with you, 
not like those who when they graduate from a school or so then they detach themselves they become the scholars and they become the ones to have followers and they detach themselves from the mashayikh from the scholars that have fevers upon them in which we have to continue to be with the people of knowledge and to learn the deen of islam and for some individuals they you know they want to take the path of calling others to the deen of allah this is what they need to study more into certain subjects and to study the benefiting knowledge for each and every one of us and to have the izza and the honor and the dignity in the deen of allah and that comes as a result of ilm the people of knowledge they have the the most uh, dignity and honor because they carry within themselves this wahi this revelation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that requires for people to have patience to learn it it's not in a lecture here or there it's a lifetime commitment when we you know and these types of conferences is a great opportunity for us not that this is the knowledge and that's it so this is something to get people to be to encourage if one among you all of the brothers present or those who are listening to us if one or two you know they decided as a result of this i want to study this deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give my time for it and seeking knowledge requires tabattul requires to to be devoted fully for this i'm not talking about every single muslim you know because when someone has what am I going to do with my living and, and, and uh, you know, provisions and things like this? If you ask this question, continue to do what you're doing, mashallah, and seek rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't have to devote yourself uh, because it's not obligatory upon every Muslim. But if someone has the zeal and they have the ability to do it, the ummah is in so much in need of this. But with humbleness, with deen, with fear of Allah, with ibadah, with, with devoting our life, so that we we, we 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 are upon the deen and we teach others the deen of Allah and to keep the sunnah revived among ourselves and among our generations and generations to come. And all of that is by humbling ourselves to the ilm, to the knowledge of the deen of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. And if you have any uh, questions, I took uh, maybe more of what the time there is uh, for me. Jazakumullah khairan wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 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 please go ahead Jazakumullah khair shaykh we're going to see if anybody has any questions any of the brothers have any questions if any of the brothers have any questions they can come up to the station here otherwise we will conclude inshallah All right, I think we are good in Sheikh. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, It's my pleasure to be among my brothers again um, so I, was here, I was here in December for the, for the winter conference and I had to come back again mostly because I want to be around uh, a good companionship, good brothers, mashallah this is a refresher for me Alhamdulillah Now, uh, the topic I was assigned and the brothers are going to put it up on the screen soon my habit uh, in everything I do, and this is what I've been always used to, uh, given that I taught uh, at different colleges, uh, business and accounting, since 2005, PowerPoint presentations I find are good notes uh, for people to follow when uh, we're looking at something. It always helps to look at something written and at the same time uh, listen. Um, and inshallah, this lecture, as, as with the previous one I did, the previous ones actually, will be uploaded on my YouTube channel, inshallah, along with the PowerPoint you're seeing on the screen here, or that others will put shortly on the screen. Um, it will be available as a PDF for you. So that way, if anyone doesn't have time to listen to me, they can just take the PowerPoint and at least reference a few things there, inshallah. The topic that uh, I was assigned, uh, the, the title I was given was Mastering uh, the Art of Da'wah. And to be honest, this is, this is a, very, uh, a very broad topic. And it can, it can come at this from so many different ways. And um, I was looking online at different things and, and, I, and I took a lot of different resources in Arabic and I translated them in English. But there was a really good article I found by um, uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdullah Dawaish, actually on Islam way. Uh, and he had about eight or nine principles in looking at this. And you can see here that I've extended the title. It doesn't just say Mastering the Art of Dawah. Um, as the Shaykh, mashallah, here, uh, I'm sure they've, they've already stressed this fact enough and I've been keeping up with the, with the conference online from, from London, Ontario, where I drove from this, uh, this, uh, this uh, beautiful day, um, that they talked about this. And I'm going to emphasize this a little bit more today and maybe add a few points just to enhance or just to you know, add a few more things that they maybe um, were brief about and I just want to extend on. The way of the prophets. Now, the first part is just a review of what, what they, uh, I'm sure they talked about how da'wah is an obligation. It's a, it's a communal obligation. Uh, it's a fardu kifaya. Uh, you know, uh, we have in the Quran many verses about da'wah. The one in Surah Al-Nahl, "Ud'u ila sabi rabbika bil hikmati wal mawdu al-hasana wajdulhum bilatihi ahsan." We have "Ud'u ila rabbika wa la tukunna min mushrikin." This is in Surah Al-Qasas, and I'm sure you've heard these verses many times in this conference, mashallah. And also, uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, "Qul hadi sabi li ad'u ila Allah, ala basira, ana wa man attabani." And the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, uh, said, uh, walau aya, convey from me even an ayah, even, even, even if it's one sign. It doesn't have to be a, necessarily a verse of the Quran, but anything that can, can benefit. Um, and even though the da'wah in general is a, is a, is a fardu kifaya, it's a communal obligation that if some people do it, that the sin is lifted from the rest, uh, it's still a highly encouraged sunnah on everyone. And I believe when I looked this up, it was Shaykh Abdullah. Uh, Ibn Baz, who's the one that, that uh, mentioned this. Um, and we, we have an example, and we're focusing on the way of the prophets right now. And uh, I mentioned this actually in the winter conference that Islam is not just about having good manners and moral character, because some people, they, they think, oh, all you have to do is just have good manners, and that's the end of it. Uh, the prophets didn't just have good manners. They, they did way more than that. Uh, because, let's be honest, other religions teach good manners too. You talk to a Christian or a Jew, or you talk to anybody, even an atheist will say, I, I can be good without a religion. Right? And then you ask the question, well, what's good? Who who's decides good and bad? Right? This, is, this is one of the things you can respond to when, when, you, when you're looking at some of these, uh, some of these things that will come at you. And I'll share with you as I go along today, inshallah, some of the things I was, was coming across with some people. And I'm sure the Shaykh, mashallah, must have mentioned a lot of them already anyway. So we have to present what sets Islam apart from all other religions. Yeah, and we have to focus on the differences. You know, today we talk about, oh, let's look at common grounds, common grounds. Well, to coexist, you can talk about some common grounds. But the difference between Islam, Tawheed, and everything else decides your fate in the hereafter. You're going to be in Jah Jahannam or Jannah. It's not a joke that people take so lightly, and as long as we get along and are good neighbors, which is fine. But the Prophet, is this what they focused on? Is this what they did? So having good manners alone is definitely not enough. So the next point I want to mention here is that the da'wah has to be done with proper authentic knowledge, which mashallah, our Sheikh who just finished his lecture, Sheikh Ibrahim, um, he emphasized this point. 
that it, it's about encouraging you to learn and take take it as a as a as a lifestyle, not just as something where you go to a conference once a year, twice a year, um, and then that's the end of it. Because that that's just the start. That's just to get you warmed up and get you excited about the idea. You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the revelation began with Iqra, recite, and Iqra, recite, read, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also said in the same surah, "Allah Alam bil Qalam." So the pen was mentioned, and these are tools that you that you learn. You used to learn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ He didn't just say, قُلْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ didn't say, أَدْرِكْ didn't, didn't say, realize or just say it. No, know that there is no deity except Allah and so on. Um, and the Prophet stood out with their knowledge which came from the revelation. Um, you know, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, that to tell the people, the Prophet to tell the people, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشْرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ not just Bashar, Bashar I am a man like you. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a man. He's a human in all aspects. He's not an angel. He's not a superhuman. He, I mean, Allah gave him and supported him with some abilities. Yes, more than the average human, but the, his humanness is definitely there. And we can see in, in, in the seerah and in the authentic hadith, things which happened to him that would happen to a human being. You know, he felt sad sometimes. He, he had uh, sometimes issues with his wives. They even tried to, to put a, a spell on him. You know, Musa alayhi salam in the Quran, uh, you know, he was affected by the magic of, of, the, of the magicians of Pharaoh, and he was a prophet. I mean, so they're human beings, and there's no shame in that. You know, people, they come and say, oh, you're a prophet, this happened. Yeah, he's a human being. And the whole point of him being a human being is that we can follow him because he's human, we're human like him. Right? If he was an angel, how can you follow him? That's the point, right? So again, to know, to learn uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge, and this is what the Prophet stood out with, this, with their knowledge, and they came with the knowledge about belief in Allah and knowledge about His Sharia. You know, in the Surah Al-Baqarah, وَيَعْلِمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُنُوا تَعْلَمُونَ Right? The Kitab al hikmah the, the book and the wisdom, which means, uh, some scholars said it means the Sunnah, others said it means the wisdom that's within the Sharia itself. So it's encompassing of the whole religion. And as I mentioned as well before, and these are just introductory comments here about uh, the Da'wah, again, has to be centered around the Aqidah and Tawheed. And that's what the messengers focused, focused on is on Tawheed al-Ibadah. You know, they did not come to convince people that Allah is the Lord or He's Rabb or that He exists. And the majority of people acknowledge this. The, the atheists today are a loud minority. Even an atheist, you know, if, if, uh, some of them, I forget the interviews they watched before, but stuck in an elevator or something and, and he find himself calling above someone to help him. So the fitrah of the human being is there and they can't deny that fitrah. Um, but they just are too arrogant to admit it. That's the reality. But I mean, they have their arguments and we have to be able to combat these arguments. And the Quran did not stop short at addressing the atheists. You know, Did you come from nothing or were you the creators? What's the third option? Allah created you. End the story. Like, and it's very simple, subhanAllah. So, Tawheed al-Ibadah is what the prophets came with. And even, by the way, the atheists and those who are arrogant, you know, أَفَرَيْتَ مَنْ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُهُ Hawa, his own self. So, so your, your, their, their ilah, their deity is them, their own desires and their own whims. So they're still committing shirk in that, in that sense. Most people acknowledge that Allah is the Lord. He's the, he, he provides rizq. You know, he created the heavens and the earth. You know, and so on. He, he, um, he's the one that brought everything to life. And he's the one that causes death ultimately, Rabbil Alameen. Um, we just have means. People get sick and die. But ultimately, Allah is the one that causes all this. All other aspects of da'wah that come after Tawheed are just branches of it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So the question is this, and, and this is something we find today with a lot of the brothers, whether it's on YouTube or wherever, and they have their da'wah and everything like that. Um, and they have their own ways. So the question is, okay, why strictly follow the, follow the methodology of the prophets? Do you want to master the art of da'wah? I say you have to follow the prophets because uh, they are ma'asum. They're infallible in terms of their da'wah. As human beings, they may have a misjudgment. They may choose an option which is not the best option. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrects them. They show you that they're human. Not to show you that they're uh, making mistakes. Their errors, if you want to call them that loosely speaking, are very minor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected them. And, and, uh, and Nabi alayhi wa sallam, our, our Prophet alayhi wa sallam, himself, he had you know, some things where he chose and then Allah corrected him and, and showed him what's, what's better. And sometimes he admonished him a little bit and, and you know, he, he, he told him this, is, this would have been the, the better option. Not that what he did was wrong per se, but there's a better way of, of doing it. So they did not stray and their methodology is the only flawless and sound one. No, no one can disagree with that. You know, you can look at uh, anyone today who's doing da'wah, if they're sincere, then they know that the prophets were 
in, the, in, the, in terms of their da'wah, they were ma'asum, they were protected. Because they were given revelation, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from following their desires. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَى Nabi Sallallahu doesn't speak from his own desire, right? نَمَا هُوَ حِنُوحَ And if you want to take other than the way of the prophets, the alternative is for people to worship and obey Allah by blindly imitating other human beings and treat these, be these people as if they are divinely inspired and free from error. And we find that today. Some imams, some you know, scholars, some groups here and there, they, they يعني, deify their, their imams or their scholars to the point where they can not make any mistakes. And their group is the group that's the one that's got it all and everyone else is, 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 in, is in plain error. So there are common foundational principles that are shared between all of the prophets that we must implement. And I'm going to get into some of these foundations. And like I said, you find that many Muslims would take some of the furur, some of the branches, not the, not the usul, some of the furur, which are in the realm of ijtihad. Now, now there are foundations which are already set in terms of the da'wah, what you have to do. But then there are branches which are open to ijtihad, your own, and, you know, your own deduction, your own effort to find the best way of doing things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us foundational principles, but then he left for us human beings to figure things out in some flexible matters. Some people take these flexible matters and turn them into usul. And that's a problem. And that's what I found with some of these groups today. And I'm going to get into that a little bit as well, because my, my book, which I wrote a couple of years ago now, is on a, is on a group, Hizb al-Tahrir. And what I found with them and other groups is that they, they, they develop a methodology, and, they, and this is what they want to do, and then they start looking at the Quran and the Sunnah to justify their methodology, not the other way around. They got it backwards. Go to the Quran and Sunnah first, look what it says, understand it, and then from that derive your manhaj, your methodology. Don't come up with your own manhaj and then start fishing around and looking for things. And unfortunately, that's what the people of innovation do. They, have, they come up with an innovation and then they try to find something in the Quran and the Sunnah that justifies it. See, it says I can do it. And that's a, a very, uh, this is unfortunately a, a following of Hawa. It's not a following of the text that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يعني من المرفوض أن تتحول الجزئيات والاجتهادات إلى ثوابت. It's unacceptable to take branch matters, subsidiary matter, matters, and turn them into foundations. That's actually a very uh, dangerous way to go. And again, I emphasize this point, and this is actually a very nice thing which I'm sure was mentioned by some of, you, some of the shiuch here. The level of a scholar does not prevent him from error. Nobody is above that. Abu Bakr and Umar, for example, who are the best human beings after Muhammad sallallahu and the prophets. You know, Abu Bakr we know his level and Umar we know his level as well. They were prohibiting combining between Umrah and Hajj, which is called at tamattu right? They were saying don't do it. And they were saying don't do it because they had a good intention. This was an ishtihad of theirs. The rationale for this is that they wanted people to attend the sacred house, the Bayt al-Haram, more often. Because if people did the Hajj and the Umrah together, then they would just come during the Hajj season and the rest of the year no one comes. So they wanted people to come back, they wanted them to return. And so they said, you know, don't do this Hajj al just do the Hajj and, and do the Umrah outside of the Hajj season so that people would return more to the sacred house. So when some people were, were, were quoting Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhumah, a very powerful statement was said by Ibn Abbas, which I'm sure you've heard many times before. He said, يُشِكُوا أَنْ تَنْزِلَ عَلَيْكُمْ حِجَارَةٌ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ أَقُولُ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ وَتَقُولُونَ قَالَ أَبُوْ بَكَرُ وَعَمَرُ So he, the translation of this is, he said, stones are about to come down on your heads from the sky, and as a punishment. This is how severe he saw the statement to be. I say the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, and you say Abu Bakr and Umar said, and who are we talking about? Abu Bakr and Umar, we're, we're talking like the cream of the crop here. We're not talking about just people today or whoever, right? We're talking about the top here. We're talking about the best. So even the statements of Abu Bakr and Umar were rejected, are rejected in, in, front, in front of the statements of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, Even though their ishtihad, this was their own reasoning, was in order to have Muslims return more to the sacred house. So it was a good, yeah, and it was a good ishtihad on their part. But the Messenger وسلم, allowed people to do Hajj alone, number alone. Don't try to, or both ways, obviously. Okay, don't try to change that and try to impose something on people which there's flexibly in it. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala chose the the messengers. Um, 
the Messenger وسلم, actually himself, this is actually very important. And Rasul وسلم, himself was told to follow the Prophets. Before we are told, hey, follow the Prophets, he was told to follow the Prophets. And that's what we have in Surah uh, Al An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ulaika ladina had Allah, fabihudaha muqtadi. You know, he, he told the Nabi alayhi salam, those are the ones whom Allah has guided. So, from their guidance, take an example. And this is the best messenger, this prophet. He's being told to follow those before you who are not at your level, but follow them. So, what about, what about us today? Which we're trying to find alternative ways of da'wah and trying to come up with their own methodologies and so on, and then leave off the way of the manhaj al anbiya. It's, this is completely unacceptable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your Lord creates what He wills and He chooses. You can't question that. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam was emphasized a lot, as we know. ثُمَّ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ أَنِ اتَّبَعْ مِلَّةَ أَبْرَهِيمَ حَنِيفَةً وَمَا كَانَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Muhammad alayhi salam was told, then we revealed to you to follow the religion of Abraham, inclined toward truth, and he was not of those who associate with Allah. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa himself was told to follow the prophets before. So when we're talking about us today, today following the prophets sallallahu alayhi wa and the prophets, I mean, this is a no-brainer and we can't, uh, you know, go against that. I'm going to talk about, I think there are eight or nine foundations and I'm going to try to get through them quickly so that I give time at the end for questions and to give you a break before our, uh, our brother um, Farid, I believe, is next after me, inshallah, from Bahrain. So the first foundation, as I mentioned, is the cult of Tawheed. Everything we do has to be centered around that. It has to begin with it and end with it. The Prophet said this so many times. And you can find this in different surah in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَى نُوحِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Every messenger that came before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we sent, He said we sent any messenger except that we revealed to him that there is no deity except me, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so worship me. And the one we hear a lot in Surah Al-Nahl, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلُّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ عَبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاسْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And we certainly sent into every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid Taghut. And today, you know, calling the non-Muslims to Islam, we also can't ignore that even in Muslim lands today, you have people who worship graves and saints. It's there. It's a fact. And it's there. We, we can't uh, pretend it doesn't exist. People call unto other than Allah for help. They, they commit acts of shirk in terms of actions, even in terms of beliefs. They believe that such entities know the unseen, they can bring benefit or alleviate harm, or certain sects, obviously you'll know who I'm talking about, they, they give infallibility to the, to the Imams, infallibility, and they make the kafir of the companions of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, which is actually an attack on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because if these are your companions, who are, most of them are apostated, what kind of person are you, right? So it's an indirect attack on the message as well. Others believe that those other than Allah have the right to do tashri' to legislate. To make the halal haram and vice versa. We find this in, in Muslim lands today, right? So these are things we can't ignore. And that's why I say the whole of the da'wah begins and ends with inviting people to worship Allah alone without partners. How can someone who, let's say, sees nothing wrong with, or maybe it's not that bad to call unto a saint? You know, you hear this claim that, oh, it's not shirk unless you believe he's a lord or he has abilities and all this, which is completely rubbish. And it goes against the consensus of the Muslims. This is something that came later on as an opinion which has no weight whatsoever. So someone who is uh, okay with calling on to a saint for help, and he says, okay, I can call on to him, but I don't believe he's a Lord, so it's not shirk, but maybe it's not the best thing to do. And then he's going to call a Christian to Islam, and the Christian will be like, okay, so you call on to Ali, well, I call on to Isa, what's the difference? You get it? So that's why we really have to make sure that we know the foundation and It might seem like, man, we're just repeating this over and over again, but this can't be emphasized enough because like I said, this is, we're talking like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins except shirk. All sins except shirk Allah forgives. And so what more do we need to know about so that people are saved from this huge sin, right? That's the first foundation. Second very important foundation, ikhwani, is you should have no expectation of payment. وَمَا أَسْأَلَكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This was mentioned in Surah Al-Shu'ara in many places. You're not doing da'wah because of you're trying to get money, you're trying to get rich, you're trying to get uh, recognition, fame, you want to be famous, right? Even the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Surah Sa'ad, Allah told them, قُلْ مَا أَسْأَلَكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنْ مُتَكَلِّفِينَ 
I do not ask you for the, for the Quran any payment and I am not of the uh, pretentious. So this is something that has to be a foundation. And unfortunately, today, what, what turns people off when looking at some of these organizations is that they go beyond, for example, just covering expenses, paying their employees. I mean, organizations just have to run. But some of the prices that some of these celebrity speakers charge are just ridiculous. And I mean, I hear stuff here and there, but I mean, I don't really get into those kinds of tabloids. I don't need to. But we know, like some of them, what they want. Before I come, well, there has to be this many people in the audience, and this has to be this. There has to be a down payment of this one and that one, and then, what? What are we running a, a business here? You know, Munawwar he lived for 950 years, and in Al Bidaya and Nihaya, it mentions I think he was calling the people for 300 or 400 years because obviously he wasn't calling them since he was born as a baby, right? But he called them later. But still, how many followers did he end up uh, having? Not many. Even his own son, his own wife. We're, we're against them. Imagine. So that's the second foundation. So first foundation is Tawheed. Everything has to be centered around it. Second thing, we're not expecting payment. Third foundation is that we have to look at our religion as one religion, one ummah. And this is not just about us living today. This is from Adam all the way until the end of time. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah muflihun. This is not restricted to a party or a group in a particular time period. This is not restricted to a masjid or... No, no. This, we're talking about the ummah. And it's not restricted to our generation. This religion, this ummah, this way, this millah is shared by all of the prophets from the past until our present time and will continue until the last day. And in fact, the ones who come later on, we're going to be witnesses for the prophets who came before because we're one ummah. So on the day of judgment, for example, Nuh salam will be asked to, uh, if he conveyed, Hal and then people will say, no, he didn't. And then we will come and we will witness for, for him, alayhi salam, that he did in fact do this. And, and the proof that we are one ummah, one religion, whether it's today or 1,400 years ago or even before that with all the prophets, is that the opposition against the da'wah is the same. And it's always been the same, right? So, um, and, and a, lot, a lot of the opposition comes, you know, from the mala, from the elites, from the people of, of high stature, money, you know, governments and so on. They, 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 don't, they don't like to hear this kind of stuff. And they accuse those who call to the truth as being merely humans. You're just bashar mithluna. Like, you're just humans. Why should I listen to you? Right? And that, the only, that only the lowly people follow them. You know, only the poor people and the lowly people, the uneducated people are following you. The ones who are backward. Uh, they call names. They threaten even physically and, and so forth. They doubt intentions. They accuse people of magic, sorcery. These things repeat themselves. Whether it's with Musa alayhi salam or Nuh or anybody else. Or even today with those who call to Islam. They're attacked and they're slandered. So the ummah is one. Doesn't matter whether we talk about a prophet who was alive thousands of years ago, or we're talking about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or us today, or until the end of time, even when, until the return of Isa alayhi salam, and then the day of, of Qiyamah comes. So that's the third foundation: is that we are one ummah. We shouldn't have this bigoted partisanship in our heads. You know, the 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 the, the uh, this thing about the, the the Islam that later on we will we will split into sects. Yes, there will be sects, but I dare say that people think, oh, 72 sects out of 73. It doesn't mean the majority of the ummah is misguided, right? Just because it says 72 sects, we're talking about like the heads of Dalal here, the heads of misguidance who have corrupt aqidah that you only end up following if you're indoctrinated in their schools. But a layman, an ordinary Muslim, doesn't have Ash'ari beliefs, right? They don't have, <laughs> they don't have an Ash'ari belief, they don't have a Maturidi belief. Like you tell them, Allah is above, they say, yeah, that's where I point to the sky. This is an ordinary Muslim. So the majority of Muslims, you know, whether, you, whether they put the stamp on or not, they're Salafi. They're following the fitrah. It's very simple. Right? So we are one ummah. Those, are, those people who are upon misguidance are a few and they are calling to their dalal. And the reason why some people are following into their dalal is because people need to learn more. Not because, oh, every Muslim is guilty by, uh, and, until proven uh, Salafi, for example. It doesn't work that way. It's actually the opposite way. Right, and this is, and, and I'm saying this because some people are just take it like that as an exclusive club or group, and that's wrong. You just don't do that. The Salaf wasn't like this, right? So this is the, the fourth foundation: is that it is um, that one ummah, or the third, sorry. Gentleness, being gentle, and Nabi Assalam said, "In the rifq la yakunu fi shayin illa zanahu, wa la yunzaa min shayin illa shanahu." The Messenger وسلم, said, Kindness is not to be found in anything, but it adds to its beauty. And it is not what drawn from anything, but it makes it يعني, uh, corrupted or, or not so beautiful. Right? The default approach in da'wah is being gentle. That's the default approach. 
right? Not the other way around. People think, oh, I have to be harsh. That's the default. I got to be tough and rough. No, no. You, there, there's a time for that, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, for example, told um, uh, Musa, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى اذهب عفوا to Musa and, and Harun اذهب go both of you to Fir'aun indeed he has transgressed فقول له what you this one and that one no قول له قولا لينا لعله يتذكر أو يخشى now did Allah, not, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not know in his infinite knowledge that Fir'aun is not going to believe and he's going to say لا إله إلا الله he knew but he still told Musa and Harun you know take it easy be gentle be wise and, and call him in a nice way Right? Even Ibrahim alayhi salam, before the, the, the final stage came later on when he found that they're, they're going to be stubborn, they're not going to listen, his father and his qawm, this is in stages, but in the beginning, what did he tell his dad? Ya abati inni qad ja'ani min al-ammi malim itika fattabani yadika salatan sawiya. Ya abati in Arabic is like daddy. Right? O oh my father, indeed there has come to me of knowledge that which has not come to you, so follow me, I'll guide you to an even path. Right? So, and, and the thing I want to mention here is that the prophets, every prophet was a shepherd. Ra'i. Ra'i al-Ghanam. Right? And then Nabi Sallallahu said that all of them were. And why did they take care of sheep? Because sheep are, are, are gentle creatures. They're easily swayed. Right? So they need to be guided. And, and this teaches the individual to be gentle, to be nice, to be calm, to be patient. That's what a shepherd basically learns. Right? And so I'm not saying that all of us have to go and, and uh, learn how to be a shepherd on sheep. If you can, great, go for it. If you live on a farm, hey, beautiful, right? But I'm just saying that we need to train ourselves to be, to be gentle. And I find, subhanAllah, that, that, that city life, generally city life, makes people harsh and tough. It's very, yeah, and you're, you're, you're so distant from nature. You're, you're in an office all day with artificial lighting. No offense at the masjid here. Don't take it the wrong way. Or other people, you know, you're, you're not really outside all the time interacting with nature when the Quran is full of uh, yeah, and the verse is talking about the sun and the moon and the sky and the sea. And we don't see much of that. So it makes us, it makes us really yeah, and dry and tough, right? The next foundation, uh, I, I guess I have these numbered, uh, maybe one ahead, but it's actually the fifth one. Uh, clarity. Yani, al-wuduh. You have to be very, very, very clear and go straight to the point. Not wishy-washy. So for example, Lut alayhi salam, straight out. Walutan fahishata. مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحْدَنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Lut went and said to them, Do you commit such immorality as no one has proceeded with you, uh, you with from among the worlds? He didn't say, well, let's talk about it. Let's have an interfaith dialogue and talk about, you know. Uh, no, he told them straight out that he, what you're doing is wrong. And that's after he called them to Tawheed. In fact, in Surah Al-A'raf, what's interesting about it is that in other suar, uh, worship Allah, you have no deity except him. Lut said that. And then he says, أَتَأْتُونَ ذُكْرَانَ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ do you approach the, the, the males uh, with desire and you leave what your Lord created the view of your mates? But in this Surah Al-Araf, it didn't even mention him telling them, worship Allah, it just went straight. Do you come, do you come and you approach the Fahisha like that? Shaib alayhi salam, he told them, Qala, ya qawmi, Allah, You know, worship Allah, you have no deed besides him. And then he said, So Ruth alayhi salam attacked the, the akhlaq the bad akhlaq they had, the bad character they had. So on the level, on the level of, of, of character and, 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 and good conduct. And then Shaib alayhi salam, he attacked it in terms of the corruption in economics, in the economic realm, the business and so forth. So after, after you, you, you deal with the, the foundation of Tawheed, then you start going after the uh, problems in the society. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, you know, he, he wasn't shy either. He was kind to his father, but then later on he did not shy away from breaking the idols. And his response to his people when they questioned him was that of sarcasm. You know, when, he, when they asked him, uh, did you do this? He says, no. He was just answering them to say, knock your head, wake up, right? The, the, big, the, large, the largest idol did it. Asked them if they speak. And of course, they, they realized that they were making fools of themselves. So Ibrahim alayhi salam wasn't. Now, <laughs> again, we talked about being kind, being polite, being wise, but that doesn't mean being wishy-washy and being, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, yani, yani taking the truth and the falsehood and kind of coming up with this mix that people don't even feel like they came out with anything at the end. The next foundation, uh, or the, 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 in, in terms of the foundation of clarity, um, like I said, kindness does not mean that one makes the message obscure and watered down. Um, Musa and Hura, 
We're told by Allah to speak to Fir'aun mildly, but Musa did not shy away from being clear and propagating the message. So they weren't going for, like I said, an interfaith dialogue. And interfaith dialogues, I mean, if you, if you really look at you know, the experience of Muslims in the West with interfaith dialogues, these are the, the biggest fraud. They're, 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 there's almost no khair that came, comes out of these. I've, I've seen them before, whether it's in my city or watching it online or whatever, and you don't really come out with anything. People come out confused. In fact, the audience probably come out more confused than they were when they, before they came to this interfaith dialogue, right? Um, so again, uh, just being straight, straight and, and clear in the message and telling people straight out, you know, not oh, all leads, all path leads to paradise in the end. And oh, you know, if you didn't hear about Islam, then well, well you're telling them about Islam right now. What do you mean if you didn't hear about Islam? I'm telling you about Islam right now. Well, why do I talk to someone? I'm talking to them about Islam and inviting them to Islam. Oh, but you know, if, if you don't hear about Islam, and maybe Allah will test you. In the, what do you get into that? You are calling them to Islam right now so that there's no hujja. They have no, no evidence at the end. Um, and the next uh, foundation, which I, I already talked about, is that the prophets, after being clear about uh, the message of Tawheed, they did not ignore the societal evils taking place. Like I said, Prophet ﷺ attacked homosexuality in the strongest terms. Like I said, an evil taking place in the realm of morality. Shu'aib ﷺ went straight after unethical business practices taking place, an evil in the economic realm. Uh, the Prophet Musa ﷺ confronted Fir'aun's enslavement of the children of Israel when Fir'aun tried to bestow his favors on him, when he told them, we raised you and so on. And then Musa said to him, So you, you're, you're bestowing favors upon me and you take my, all my people, you've enslaved them, right? So and this is the past favor which you reproach me, that you have enslaved the children of Israel. So the prophets, yeah, they were kind, they were gentle and everything, but when it came to saying the truth, they didn't, they didn't, uh, you know, they weren't wishy-washy about it. The next thing that is really important as well as the issue of allegiance, al wala wal bara. This is a topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about. They like want to brush it under the carpet. And uh, unfortunately, you find two extremes that some people have taken it and they've said, no, no, this doesn't apply whatsoever. And then some of them have taken to a point where it's like, whoa, you know, take it easy, man. You need to be a little bit more يعني, uh, polite with people, right? So it's not about family, it's not about tribe. You know, the wives of the Prophet Nuh al Lut, alayhim as salam, were given as an example of a, basically a betrayal against the da'wah. The, 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 the betrayal that they betrayed uh, uh, Nuh and Lut was a betrayal in terms of uh, going against their da'wah of, of Tawheed. Like I said, the Prophet Nuh's son himself is an example of this. Allah commanded him, uh, Nuh alayhi salam, to board the ark and with his family, wa'ahlak, right? He told them, with your family. Yet his son refused to board the ark and ended up drowning. And Nuh alayhi salam, after affirming Allah's promise, وَإِنَّ وَعَدَكَ الْحَقِّ He says, إِنَّ أَبْنِي مِنْ أَهْلِي my, my son is from my family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ He's not from your family. إِنَّهُ عَمْلُ غَيْرُ صَالِحِ His actions are corrupted. And some scholars said, الْعَمَلِ غَيْرُ الصَّالِحِ The action which is, which is not good was Nuh asking Allah about his son. There's different uh, explanations to this. But the bottom line is that uh, the, the issue of, well, you're from my tribe, you're from my family, I'm going to be easy on you because no, our allegiance is, is based on and this association is based on our aqidah, our tawheed that we follow as Muslims. And all the prophets did this. And if you look at the examples of, like I said, uh, Nuh and Lut alayhi salam and Ibrahim, of course, Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is the very important. And this verse we read in Surah Al-Mumtahana or Al-Mumtahana, إِذْ قَالُوا لِلْقَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّا بُرَاءَ مِنْكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ كَفَرْنَا بِكُمْ وَبَادَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ Very strong words. Indeed, we are disassociated from you and from whatever you worship other than Allah. We have denied you and there has appeared between us and you animosity and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone. Again, the prophets are told to be gentle, but when it comes to saying the truth, you have to be, you know, and of course, when I talked about gentleness, harshness, there's a place for that too. Those who are, uh, they have this inad, this, this stubbornness. Or when the, when, the, when the truth has been manifested in front of them as clear as day and they still deny and they still are stubborn, you know, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Those who oppress and go beyond bounds, those ones you have to set them straight. And, but, but again, that's the exception because I think we can see that the majority of people, even we're living in Canada, most people are, are, are quite receptive and curious about what we follow. The, you'll have a few bigots here and there that are like, you know, they have their own agenda and their own uh, preconceived notions. But even those people need help, subhanAllah. And about uh, allegiance, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a warning in, in, uh, in the Quran as well. He says, Bashir You know, give tidings to the hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites. 
that there is, that there is for, for them a painful punishment. Who are these people? Those who take the disbelievers as allies instead of the believers, at the expense of the believers, did they with them seek honor or power, right? But indeed, honor belongs to Allah entirely. So there's a very, very strong warning in this. Allah said about the Jews and the Christians, right? They are allies of one another. In fact, they don't like each other. Christians and Jews actually hate each other. But against the Muslims, yeah, they, they cooperate, right? So we have to be aware of that. And, and this is the general thing that we have to be aware of because we're talking about a aqidah, we're talking about a foundation, we're talking about a belief. They believe they're upon the truth. They believe that their way is the way to salvation. We have the right to believe that as well, right? And so on this basis, there's no mixing and, and, and uh, you know, um, compromising our principles. Yeah, we can coexist with you. We, we, we see you at the store. We see you at work. and you know, We treat you in a nice way. You're my neighbor. But I'm not going to join you in your, in, your, in your pagan celebration of Christmas, for example. Or I'm not going to you know, uh, compromise my beliefs to make you happy. Or my foundational principles. So the wala, the allegiance is based on la ilaha illallah and nothing else. And like I said, this is al-wala wal bara, allegiance and disassociation, which we should all really review every now and then and try to understand what that means and how to treat that in a balanced way. And all of the prophets applied this very, very important principle. So I have a few um, reminders. Uh, like I said, I don't want to take too long, so I'll give a chance if anyone has any questions or want to take a break. We have to always renew our intentions when doing this. You know, the art of the art of da'wah or how to do it. As long as you have these foundations that you know from the prophets and you apply those foundations, then bi ta'ala, Allah will grant you the tawfiq. Even if no one listens or follows, at least you've done your job right and you followed the prophets. Because like we said, some prophets on the day of Qiyamah will come with no followers whatsoever. Did that, does that mean that they failed? No, they didn't fail. They did what they were supposed to do. So always follow the haqq regardless. The truth, you should always follow it. Engage yourself in beneficial knowledge. This can't be stressed enough. You know, there's lots of distractions today. Social media is a, is a time killer. I mean, uh, so these days, I'm, I'm going to be frank with you. I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe in five, six years, I'm going to get off Facebook and just keep my YouTube channel and maybe a website and that's it. Because it, it's, it's draining. It's really draining. If you want to take the path of knowledge and you want to focus, unless you're able to control it, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Allahu alam. Like I might go ahead with this. I might not. We'll see how that goes. I still got a few more projects I want to work on. Uh, and like I said, don't worry about the outcome as long as you are taking the correct means and doing your best. And like I said, some prophets, like I said, had, had no followers. Um, and very important as well, in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want tawfiq from Him, you want success from Him, engage in voluntary acts of worship and seek Allah's assistance and rely on Him. All the prophets called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. You know, when the, whether, you know, in, in, in their da'wah, when they were in trouble, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Something as simple as, I mean, most of us, I think, you know, you sleep at night, you get up, maybe once or twice to go to the washroom. Okay, get up, go to the washroom, do your wudu, couple of rakah, go to sleep. Five, ten minutes isn't going to kill anybody. You know, we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah descends to the, to the lowest heaven, the Sama'at Dunya, and is, is asking if anybody wants anything. I mean, golden opportunity. 10, 15 minutes of your time every night. Imagine if you developed into that, into, into a habit. This will really, really help you. Um, another thing I guess that's important to consider in, in terms of da'wah is you should always look at who your audience is. Right? Investigate what they believe in. Look at what they're... Uh, yeah, and the understanding of whatever religion they have is you can't give da'wah to an atheist the same way as you would to a Christian we know that, right? it's not like a, a one size fits all yeah, there are foundations when you want to talk about tawheed to an atheist which we should it's not like talking about tawheed to a Christian or a Jew or whoever, for example, is or somebody who might b believe in Allah and a higher power or whatever they call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they believe Allah just kind of left everything and, you know, this world is not really of significance to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses in the Quran. We didn't create this world in, uh, in jest or for play, right? So all these things are answered, especially in the, in the surah that are Meccan, that were revealed during the Meccan, uh, before, the, before the Hijrah. And again, opportunities, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam tried many different ways to call his people. Layla wa nahara, day and night, uh, you know, in... in, in uh, uh, in groups, individuals, he tried everything. So this shows you that there are so many ways you can try. You're not restricted to one single way and, and don't restrict yourself to one single way of doing it. And one thing I want to share with you about my personal past is if you're in a position of authority or one in which people need you, give them da'wah in a casual way while granting them their needs. Like I said, I taught in 
maybe three or four different colleges over the years, post-secondary education, Conestoga College in Kitchener, Fanshawe College in London, there was a private college in London, Ontario as well. When you're a teacher, you're in a position of authority. So I found myself that, and I, I, kept, I kept in mind, okay, Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, he was in jail, he had the two mates in jail. What did they ask him? To interpret their dream. Right? Now, before I interpreted the dream, what did he do? That it, this is what my Lord taught me. And then he started going about Tawheed and explaining to them that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at the very end, if you look at the verses of Surah Yusuf, like verse after verse about Allah, about Tawheed, about this one and that one. And then in the end, take him to two lines or so just to interpret the dream. So if, if, if people have, they, they, they need something from you and you're in a position where they need something from you, that's a really good opportunity to give them because they respect you. So when I was teaching business and accounting and economics and some of these social sciences, I was able to really add a lot of things in a subtle way into the curriculum where we have to talk about God. You know, Allah Rasulullah says, Ta'isa Abdu Dinar, Ta'isa Abdu Dinar, the slave of the dinar, the gold and the silver is, is, is miserable, right? So you, some people worship money. So when we talk about in economics, about capitalism, we talk about interest rates and loans and stuff, I, I put that in and I, and I bring quotes even from people like John Maynard Keynes, who was an economist in, in the recent past. He talked about stuff like that, about, about God and false gods and this one. I'm like, and I bring it in. And I tell them about fame. I tell them. So there's so many things you can do in, in, in whatever capacity you have. So if you find yourself in a position where people need something from you, especially if you're a teacher in a, in a college or something like that, I found that this was very, very effective um, in, in what I was doing. This last slide. Um, just uh, uh, if you want to follow me online, if you'd like to have any questions for me later on, my, my contact information is here. I wrote a book, like I said, on Hizb al Tahrir, which has been out for a couple of years now, alhamdulillah. My second book uh, is actually almost done. Uh, it's uh, going to be on Islamic banking and riba and about the history of money and the gold standard and those kinds of things, inshallah. So that one probably in a couple of months will be, will be ready. Uh, Barakallah feekum, Jazakumullah khair for your patience. This is the contribution which I brought with me today. I know that the Sheikh mashallah, have covered a lot. But if you have any questions or anything like that, I'll, I'll gladly take them for about maybe five or so minutes to give you a break. Tfaddal akhi. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Okay, so I have two questions actually. Fadl. Okay, one in the, in the beginning of the talk, you talked about how da'a was fard al kifaya. So is there like a proof for that? Um, I don't know of any direct proofs to be honest. When I was looking, um, when I was looking at that, um, I, I got that from uh, I think an explanation of Sheikh Muhammad Hafun uh, Abdullah ibn Baz. He said that it's a it's a highly recommended sunnah to do da'wah, even though it's fard kifaya. And I think the the, the Sheikh can explain the proofs for that. But from my little understanding, like I mean, the prophets, for example, were the ones that were doing the calling, and they didn't obligate every single follower of theirs to do to do any calling. You know, when Nuh alayhi salam came, when the different prophets came, they did it. Yeah, some, some of them were involved in the da'wah, some of them were not, depending on their areas of expertise and what they were able to do. Some of them helped the da'wah in different ways, right? But I mean, even if we were to say that it is something highly recommended, that's what the scholars said, right? So if you're able to do da'wah in any way you can, you should. Especially if you're living in the West here. Many scholars say that uh, you're, you're living in the West, you know, you want to justify that, legitimize that get involved in da'wah somehow, or support organizations that, that do da'wah. And plus, not everybody's at the same level of knowledge, right? Somebody might be like a high profile da'i who's got experience, is able to refute this one and that one. Some of us may have a little bit of experience, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of information, right? So that's, that's my answer for that one. Jazakallah khair. And the other thing is, uh, I know da'wah is like da'i al-munkar and calling towards good. So I was wondering, how would you like do that with other Muslims? Oh, like in, in, in joining good and forbidding evil with other Muslims? It, it, depends, it, depends, it depends on who you're talking to. Like if it's a, a family members, you can talk to them in a certain way. Obviously, you can't talk to a stranger in that way. You just have to find, I think today people, unfortunately, um, they don't have a lot of thick skin. So they're easily offended and they take things personally, even though taking it personally is actually a good thing because that you, you improve yourself that way, right? So you have to find almost subtle, indirect ways of of trying to deliver this message to this, to this individual. Um, I think it was, uh, if I'm not wrong, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, the grandchildren of the Messenger وسلم, when they saw an old man who wasn't performing wudu properly, instead of going to him and saying, hey, you're wrong, they put on an act in front of him. 
One of them was teaching the other one how to do wudu, and then he learned from them, right? So if the person older, is he, is he your uncle? Is he your, your cousin? Is he someone younger than you? There's different levels. It's not a, like I said, it's, it's not a one size fits all. Allah You have to be careful with that. Go ahead. Asking the session from the dead and the saints, uh, a lot of the crazy things that go south in the subcontinent. One of their arguments is we know that we, they are not gods, not that they, uh, but um, it's, um, it's just like as you go through a doctor, go to a doctor for help and you're asking the doctor to help you out, does that mean that it's shirk? It's not, right? So it's just the very same way. We know we're not being sujood to them, but it's rather it's a mark of respect and it's, um, uh, we're still worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so there's no divinity that we are ascribing to them. So well, how do you re respond to that? Well, something? it's very simple. Uh, is the doctor dead or is he alive? Is he in front of you or is he on the other side of the earth? Let's say someone is going to this uh, so-called saints who are alive, and the same argument can be said, right? Yeah, you, you, can say, you can say the same argument, but at the end of the day, like when it comes to dua, so Sallallahu says that dua is al ibadah dua is worship, right? And literally, I mean, straight out. So when you're doing dua or when you're asking for help and you're calling for, for whoever you're calling to, this person has to be able to help you. And we have to go back to the Nabi, Sallallahu what he taught us and what the companions did. You know, what did they ask the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to do? Um, many of them asked him to do dua for them. So if you think someone is righteous and someone is good, yeah, ask them to make dua for you, but you also have to make dua for yourself as well. Because if we open up that door, then what's the difference between Islam and Christianity? Or other religions, where they have this middleman and they're calling onto this other, other than Allah and, and so on. Then, then the, this is, so, so when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to worship, it's something that we only do based on the texts. It's tawqif, tawqifi, meaning you, you stop, you don't go beyond the text and you have to follow it in the exact way, right? When the message of Allah is there are so many, so many proofs actually this topic about calling onto the dead, if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, Sheikh Faisal al Jasim, I don't know if you've heard of him before, he's mashallah, a hidden gem, mashallah. He's from Kuwait. He did a two part refutation of uh, Hatim al Awni, who was saying the same things as Yasser Qadi here in North America. Same exact thing, tashabahat qulubum, their hearts are the same about this thing. Oh, it's not shirk unless this person you believe he's this one and that one. He did a two part refutation. I translated all that. And there's PowerPoint presentations on my channel. You can download and get all the things if you want. So if you have any doubts about that, if you look at those two and read them, inshallah, if you have no time to listen to me, no, don't worry about it. Go to land, download those PowerPoints. The, if someone puts them together, there can be a little booklet with proofs about that. Um, it's, um, if, you, if the brothers can put the last slide on the screen, it's right there, Ustad Wasim Ismail. Just look me up online and you'll find that I'm on Facebook. I got a YouTube channel. Um, and it's Sheikh Faisal al Jasim. He, he did an amazing lecture. Like, if you, can listen, if you can understand Arabic and listen to him directly, you're probably better than listen to me. But I translated this in English, and I even took notes, and I actually sent it to him as well so he can see it. <laughs> so he, he, he was okay with that. Okay, okay. This is a deep topic, and in, inshallah, if Allah grants me life, like, I do plan on writing a book about that. That topic is very important, very important. In Sorry, English. Uh, quick question. So when we're approaching, we have an uh, atheist or uh, a Christian guy that's non-religious and a Christian guy that is religious. How do we differentiate when giving da'wah to three of them? How do you know like what they're upon? No, or, like how do I approach them? Oh, like with, a, with an atheist, you've, you've, you've got you to gotta start by, by, by asking him like, okay, why don't you believe in God? And uh, like, how do you believe that all this came into existence without a design or, or, or an order or whatever. Many times they're gonna, they're gonna come and tell you, oh, uh, if there was a God, then why does this world have what it, what it has in it? Why is it so miserable? Why is there killing? What? This is a very childish like, way of, of, of their arguments. And I have, like I said, on my YouTube channel, I have three videos, and I think it was a comedian, uh, what's his name? Uh, Stephen Fry. Uh, now we have comedians talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, 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 and telling us why he doesn't exist, right? I look at his arguments and, and, and saying that he was going to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how can there be disease and how can... So, so you need to ask him, like, like you, you when, you're, when you're living your life, don't you have a purpose in your life? Don't you have aims and objectives in your life? There aren't there rules in your life? So this entire universe that was created, you think that it just kind of just came like that without any order, without any, any consequence? Do you believe that somebody who does all this evil in this world and someone who's, who's as good as he can be, 
they both die and their end becomes the same. Is that, does that sound like justice to you, right? These are the kinds of things you hear them. Now, Christians, they're, they're, they're a tricky bunch because you have ones who say, well, I was born Christian and I, I don't really uh, believe in the Bible. And some of them say, no, I believe in it. And it's funny because I, I find each of the two has yeah, and challenges and some easy things about them. Like if someone, for example, is, is, is not a, a very strict Christian, you might have a, a way with them in terms of explaining to them Tawheed and, and showing them the difference and so forth. With the one who's religious, you can explain Tawheed to them, but then as Mashallah Sheikh Uthman does, you got to show them that the, the scripture they follow is, is not reliable at all, period. And tell them like, this scripture that you have is not what Isa alayhi salam said. It's not in his language. It can't even be traced back to him. So how can you rely on this? If you believe in Isa alayhi salam, how can you rely on second and third account uh, writings that came way after he supposedly died on the cross, right? That's, that's, what I would, that's what I would do, you know? And actually with all of them, I would tell them Islam is different than all of the other religions because Islam is you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. There are no middlemen between. That's what I would tell them. You have another? So if they tell me, like, for example, I'm Muslim. So I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah. So if they tell me, then Allah is wrong. It's going to be a very shocking uh, statement to me. So how do I approach it in a way that it's peaceful? And as you said, uh, how do I do that? Yeah, if, 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 if he challenges Allah and says, Allah, Allah is wrong, you, you just tell him, use an analogy based on this world. Tell him, if, if you go into a job and your boss tells you to do one, two, three, number one, right? Because your boss has more experience, he ran the business, he understands how to run it. If you question your boss, what's going to happen to your job? You're going to be fired. So what is to be said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has always been there and then we came from nothing and we came into this world not knowing anything and then Allah gave us the faculties to learn right? to learn. So you're going to question the creator who knows everything about you and everybody else and tell him you're wrong. Yeah, and it, it, like, like, and at the end of the day, like, you have to tell them there needs to be an element of of of, of reverence and respect for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You know, your own father when you're when you're young, you trust his judgment and he shows you the way because he's Rabbul Bayt, he's the Lord of of the household and he shows you the way. And you trust your father growing up and you're a kid and you're still learning. So right now, like, compared to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you're you're a nobody. Like, you're 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 a very small creation, and Allah is giving you the manual to follow life and to do things the right way. So to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wrong, لا يسألوا عما يفعلوهم يسألون. Right? Allah says, He's not questioned about what He does, but, but they'll be asked. So tell Him, you should be more concerned about you being questioned about what you're going to do. No, don't, don't worry about Allah, what He does. Because He does what He wills, and a slave doesn't question his master. Straight out. That's what I would tell Him. Yeah. Thank you. I'll bless you. Uh, I'm just going to ask, you know, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, to somebody, right, that's uh, basically agnostic and that, well, you know, when you convert like an uh, atheist to a theist, right, you explain rationally how the universe, there needs to be a creator. Then they're like, fine, but like, why do I have to worship one creator? So, how, what is explanation? Like, uh, how are you going to explain to them that there can only be one creator, there cannot be two or three, you know? There has to only be one. Yeah, it's, it's actually not that, not that difficult to, to explain it. I mean, even, subhanAllah, even when you go into like Greek mythology and, and this other, all this uh, folklore, right? When you read about these different gods, what do you read happens between them? They, they, <laughs> they fight each other. And, 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 and tell them that this, and subhanAllah, akhi, like these arguments, many of them, have been addressed in the Quran. So this thing about if there, if there was more than one then the Each one of them would take what he created and they would fight. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that, right? So he is the creator and tell him there's only one Lord and one creator. Um, and, and that's why the creation is the way it is. Tell him if there was more than one creator, more than one God, there'd be chaos. Right? There'd be there'd be a lot you you wouldn't have the order you have today. Just like for example, and what and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al ala in, in a family situation you have one head in the family, in a company you have one president. So what do you accept in this world that one person runs the whole company or family or whatever, but then you have a problem with someone running this entire universe? You know what I'm saying? That's how I'd approach it. And it, it, you almost have to be careful because you want to give them analogies here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this in the Quran. He gives analogies here and gives you know, parables. But then we have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's method is, is, is much higher. Sure, Akhid, Fadda. 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have a quick Salam. question. Um, you mentioned a good point earlier on, and I just have a question about it. Um, you said you can't take the branches and turn them into uh, foundations. So how do you combat someone who takes the branches and turns them into um, a foundation? Because you know, when you're using hadith and using the Quran, you know, they're using the same source that you're using to come up to the, uh, to the deviation that they got into. So how do you combat someone like that? Well, you, you, you basically, um, I, I would personally ask them for the proofs that they're using. So if some of them will use the Quran, for example, to legitimize their political movement or whatever. And uh, they will take uh, verses about the al-hukum and about this one and that one. Um, and say, well, because of this, we have to have this and we have to have that. So the, 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 dividing, the dividing line between those who say this and those who say otherwise is, let's go back and see how the tafsir is of those verses. How did the Sahaba apply those verses? What did they understand from those verses? What did they understand from the hadith of the Nabi Alaihi Wasallam? How did they apply them? Right? That's what, that, and this is where, you know, the, the distinguishing line between someone who follows the, the, the Salaf, the, 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 the Imams and the scholars and the Sahaba and the companions and so forth, and someone who just comes, wants to come up with, new, with a new um, yeah, an explanation. Like a, as an example, I just want to finalize, I'm sorry about Like when I wrote a book on Hizbat Tahrir, you read their material and it's like, wow, yeah, these guys have a point. But if you go back and dig deeply into their understanding, you'll find that it's Khilafah centric. Everything they look at is Khilafah centric. Based on, and then when you, even, when you tell them, Khilafah what? Like, Khilafah to Nabu was, was, was over in 30 years. Why are you calling it Khilafah after the fact? Oh no, it's about you know, them succeeding each other. I said, well, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called it Mulk. He called it monarchy kingship. Why are you calling it Khilafah for? Oh, the Khilafah ended in 1924. Uh, no, the Ottoman Empire ended in 1924. It wasn't a Khilafah. It wasn't a Khilafah like the Khilafah to Nabuwa. So they, they want to bring back Khilafah to Nabuwa and they're crying about the Khilafah ending in 1924. Like, okay, then that means that everyone's been wrong since Muawiyah gave it to Zayzid and all the way until then. Who understood it that way? What did the Sahaba give their pledge to, to Muawiyah and the majority of them give the pledge to Yazid? So you have to look at the historical context and you have to look at how they applied it and how they understood it. And the safest way is to go back to the tafsir bil athar based on the statements of the companions because the companions understood Arabic even though the, the Muhammad Sallallahu did not give, a, we don't have a, a tafsir of the whole Quran by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if the companions had a question, they knew the Arabic language, they would ask him. But the majority of the time they understood it because it was in their language and during their time. So they knew. Allahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallah Feek. Assalamu Alaikum Wa Shaykh. Alaikum Assalam. Wasim, don't call me Shaykh, please. Okay, Shaykh Wasim. Got it. Oh, go. Oh, man. Okay. Taib. Subhanallah. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your work in teaching. Secondly, I want to say that I like to ask you or people uh, questions based on their expertise. And I acknowledge your quite knowledge regarding economics and finances. Often times, even the Muslimin, they might know the different prophets such as Lut and Nuh. And they may know, okay, Lut is the one which, you know, fought homosexuality. Nuh is the one that, you know, tried to teach his people about the the ark but then they might not know about Abba Shu'aib and his fight with regards to the finances and economic crisis uh, of that time so oftentimes it's important for us to educate the Muslims on this and oftentimes in times da'wah the question may come up about why is riba pro pro prohibited why yeah. is interest such a bad thing right. so I was wondering if you could just elaborate on what are some things we can mention to prove to the non-Muslims and to give certainty to the Muslims themselves on why they should stay away from the riba what are some of the uh, practical reasons that, um, that harm the Muslims and all people at all times from the Chizak and Khair. Inshallah, that's in my upcoming book. <laughs> it's, it's a long topic, but this book, I promise, is not going to be more than 150 pages, but all the stuff you mentioned, Inshallah, will be answered. Maybe by the next conference, so I can bring a bunch of copies, Inshallah. We'll see. Barakallah feekum. And actually, Sheikh Karim Abuzaid is supposed to look at my book for me soon, so he's not listening to me, but that's okay. I, I think uh, my time is up, Akhi, right? If he has... The, the, there's just the brother there, or we can wait until the panel discussion. I'll be here this evening, inshallah. All right, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you, but I have to listen to the brothers there because there's a schedule, right? Subhanakallah, bahamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfirullah, wa tubulayk, barakallah fiqum. Is that from our panel or we'll give the brothers and sisters a quick five minute break again, inshallah, before we proceed?
نعبده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وعلى من اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين I begin this uh, lecture with what I began the previous lecture, I love the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, man araf Allah bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa af'alihi ahabbahu la mahala. Ibn al-Qayyim said that whoever learns about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names, attributes and actions, he will find his heart compelled to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like we mentioned, brothers and sisters in Islam, that the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only way to learn about Allah. Like we mentioned in the previous lecture, no one can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. We know that we will by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to see Allah in the next life if Allah wills because we're going to have 
another physical built up physical body not this body you know that right the same soul the same person but different what different physical body that can handle standing in the land of gathering for 50,000 years can you do this now with this body without drinking without eating you're going to be able to see the angels the jinn uh, people are going to drown, but they are not going to die. Drown in their sweat, but they are not going to die. Can you handle the sun only a mile away from the head? You will be able to handle all of that because of the different what? Different body. And one of these characteristics of this body that uh, the ability to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah wills in the land of gathering. But we know for a fact, one of the greatest pleasures in Jannah is actually to look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. But in this world, no. And I shared with you the evidence and the experience one of the uh, strong willed messengers had, Nabiullah Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And uh, we mentioned uh, that the only way, again, is to learn the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, we said, we have not seen Allah. No one created, no one who is created or is created, no entity is created resembles Allah. Then it doesn't make any sense to make up things about Allah like people do. You have to stick to the revelation in order to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed names. Revealed names. And he given us incentive. Uh, on the tongue of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith Abi Hurairah, radiyallahu anhu, qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, inna lillahi, Tis'atan wa tis'een asma. Allah has 99 names, 100. Ma'ah illa wahida man ahsaha dakhal al-jannah. And we mentioned ahsaha means how many? Four things. And, and that is why, ya ikhwa, the meaning of ahsaha is not memorize it only, is not to say it only, is not to read it only. No. Ahsaha, number one, step number one, you have to validate the name. How do you validate the name? You must have evidence. So the evidence will come from where? The Quran or, or add authentic to it. Because there are a lot of names which are mentioned in unauthentic narrations. So you have to be very careful. So the Quran and the Sunnah. So this is number one. Number two. What was number two? You have to understand and comprehend these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same manner the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions did understand them. لا تحيد عن منهجهم دونت and by the way this is where the primary defect of the ummah now that the majority of the muslims they do not relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same manner the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions did they do not perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same manner the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions did. And very unfortunate when people like us want to make a change there, they warn against you. They say this, you're disuniting the ummah, this is not an important subject, this is... What do you mean that's not important subject? It's about Allah. <laughs> you know, and I given you how many examples yesterday about the position of Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Umar, when he heard about the people in Basra saying that there is no what? 
You remember the hadith, right? Hadith Jibreel? The new faces or something? You guys weren't here yesterday with me? Qadr. Yeah, hadith al-Qadr. Seems like I have to go over it again. No, seriously. You guys know what I said yesterday? Yes. So why are you acting like you didn't have your lunch yet? Huh? Do you want some coffee? Huh? Let me have some coffee. <clears throat> and again, ya ikhwa, Allah, yani Allah has blessed me with, with, the, with the, this book, Know Your Lord. Uh, MashaAllah, yani, uh, I want to tell you, all that stuff is in there. Yani, take some time if you're in the field of da'wah and if you want to talk to people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, read that book. Yani, take some time to read it. Yani. Uh, so I'm, I'm really bringing these situations in, in, uh, from the first three generations of Muslims to uh, showcase to you, to display to you that the three generations of Muslims took that subject extremely serious. It wasn't something that is irrelevant, that you know you shouldn't address it. So Abdullah ibn Umar is in Mecca and he got two individuals coming from al-Basra, which is Iraq and the people there, the Jahmi, Ma'bad al-Juhani and all these guys, they started saying that Allah doesn't know things until what? They happen or after they happen. Nafu sifat al-ilm, they negated the attribute of what? Knowledge, the previous knowledge. You understand? We affirm that Allah knows everything before what? It happens. They said Allah knows after what? So they came, they said, Yabna Umar, inna fil Basra. There are some people in Al-Basra. Yaqra'oon Al-Quran. They are very eloquent with the Quran. But what they say, وَيَقُولُونَ أَنَّ الْأَمْرَ أُنُفْ Things happen randomly, without any what? Without any qadr. وَأَلَّا qadr. What was the reaction of Umar? What did he say? وَلَا أُبَرَاء عَلَى طول. Remember, وَلَا أُبَرَاء If you go back to them, let them know أَنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْهُمْ Oh, بَرَاءَهُ this methodology is a corrupt methodology. You can, they can do the same. I don't care. They can disown me too. This is the first incident. What was the second incident? Imam Malik. Someone came asking him how. He's asking about al kayfiya how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rise above the th rose above the throne? What did he say to him? Listiwa, rising above the throne can be understood from the Arabic language. Any Arabic knows what rise above the throne means. Ma'loom. Ma'loom fi man? Fi siyaq al-bashar. In the context of a human. Al-imanu bihi. You must what? Believe it. Why you must believe it? Why? ثم استوى على العرش. Quran ولا مش Quran? Seven places in the Quran. Seven verses in the Quran that Allah created the heavens and the earth, and then what? ثم استوى على العرش. So when you say that He didn't do this, then you're what? You're rejecting the revelation. And I want to tell you, if, 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 if this action is offensive to Allah, do you think Allah would have said it? No. Like the brother, I think a young brother was asking me about, uh, he has a Shari teacher. He said, uh, Yad, is, don't say the hand of Allah. Say the power of Allah. Well, if Allah wanted to say power instead of hand, wouldn't he have said it? Yes. So he, he used what? 
and <laughs> so are you gonna direct Allah to what to say and what not to say So they say Allah is uh, the Quran is not Allah's words, it's created. Yeah, but not the Ashara, no. Yeah, those are Mu'tazila. Al Jahmi will Mu'tazila. Al Ashara never say that. Al Ashara is between Sifat al Kalam Allah. Al Ashara affirms seven attributes. One of the attributes they affirm is Al Kalam, that Allah speaks. So they don't say that. We're talking about a, a certain sect. Tayyib. Where were we now? The second example, what was the third example? An Imam of the Muslims were jail, was jailed and flogged. Flogged. Huh. Why? Because of this issue. <laughs> His uncle would come to him, Ya Ahmed, Ya Ibn Ahmed, say what they want to hear, Ya Ibn Ashan, Titlam, Sijin. La, no, I can't. Those are the people the brother was referring to, Al Mu'tazila. You know, it's very dangerous when the imperial power sponsor a type of religion. This happened twice in history, by the way. And it's happening the third time now, in our time. Al Abbasin, Al Abbas, Al Bani Abbas, the Dawla Al Abbasiyah, the Abbasites, sponsoring. Al Mu'tazila, Wal Jahmiya, and they promoted the negation of the names and the attributes of Allah, and one of them is Al Kalam. That's when this fitna came. You see, a lot of you may not understand that the fitna of the creation of the Quran has to do with the names and the attributes of Allah. You see, these guys, they said Allah doesn't have any what? Attributes, any names. طب what about the Quran? The Quran is كلام الله. Allah said in the Quran that كلام الله. In Surah At-Tawbah, verse nine, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Until he hears كلام الله, the speech of Allah. لا 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 لا. Allah doesn't speak. No. طب what about the Quran? Oh, the Quran is created. So, are you saying like not kafar for like denying the Quran and Allah's hmm? attributes? Are they not kafar for like just, um, denying the Quran and Allah's attributes? Well, a lot of the scholars said they are kafar, but we're not going to go there now. I mean, let's just. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. Laha ma kasabat. They passed away, they died. But anybody who adopts their methodology right now. Certainly, you have to establish the hujja against them, and if they deny, if they insist, they are non Muslims. A shahid, or the important thing is Imam Ahmad, no. And he stood. You can say this stuff is irrelevant. You can say we have to skip names and attributes because this is going to divide the ummah. You can't, that's a very sick methodology. You have to understand the names and the attributes, and we're going to come to that. What was number three? Number three. No, that was number two. Number two was Imam Malik. See, you guys are not following me. Remember what I, I'm explaining? Ahsaha. Everything has a service. Ah, okay. You see that? That Mahdi is, is alive. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> we said we're explaining what? The hadith. The Prophet said what? Allah has 99 names, 100 minus 1. Whoever does what? Whoever does what? Ahsaha. Now, what Ahsaha means? Some Muslims now limited Ahsaha to Ghannaha. Whoever sings it in a nice voice. Especially if there is a wedding. Huwallahu alladhi al-maliku al-quddusu salamu. 
Uh, the, the, the names and the attributes. The only relationship they have with the names and the attributes is this. But if you ask them what Al-Malik means, what Al-Quddus means, they don't know that. ف... We're explaining Ahsaha. is not only memorize it either. That you... Buh, 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 buh. No. Ahsaha means those four things. Number one, validate the name. And we explained what it means, right? Number two, understand it the way the Sahaba, the Prophet understood them. <laughs> so she doesn't understand that? Why Siri? <laughs> the Siri is rude. Allah <laughs> al-Musta'a. Shaitan is active. Shaitan doesn't like that. <laughs> Number three, and we're going to have to come back and visit this again. Number three, every name has a servitude. You have to what? La budda an tatalabbasa bi'ubudiyyat al-ismi. The kalam Ibn Battal al-Maliki. Beautiful uh, scholar of this umm. He said, Every name has a servitude. You must exercise the servitude of this name in order to do Ahsa. Ar-Rahman. How do you do Ar-Rahman? Look at this. Don't give up on his mercy. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم You done so much mistake, so many, don't give up. Allah can forgive all sins. فاليأس من رحمة الله that means you're not leaving that name. Oh, by the way, this is one of the entries. One of the tricks of shaitan. You know what, what is the name of shaitan? Before he became shaitan, what was his name? Iblis. Iblis. You know what Iblis means? Al-aslu fil balasi al-ya'su. Iblis means despair. Is a derivative of despair. Min al-balas. Yablas. Yablas yani yayas. He despaired, by the way, from the mercy of Allah. That is why he decided to take on that path of, okay, yani obviously when he requested a respite, time to live until the day of judgment, you would think, okay, I, I just want to spend this time in repenting for what I have done. No, I want to go on with what? Yeah. So I don't despair. Also, if you are in the field of da'wah like myself, don't send people to despair either. Like the man who said to the 99 killer, huh? he said to him, what? You have no hope. No, don't do that. وفي حديث يا إخوة في سنن أبي داود Two brothers from Bani Israel. One of them was strictly righteous. He was straight. And he used to live on the top of the mountain. The other one was wishy-washy, you know, off and on, like many of us. Huh? But he was living in the valley downstairs with the people, just to show you that the people can mess you up. So his brother came to visit him. Subhanallah, when he arrived, he found him committing the sin right before his eye. So he said to him, Wallahi, la yaghfiru Allahu lak. By Allah, Allah is not going to forgive you. Allah revealed to the messenger at the time, Man hadha alladhi yata'alla alayhi, who's taking an oath on me? Let him know that I have forgiven the sins of his brother, and all what he has done of good deeds are gone with the wind. He needs to start working over now. Wa ahbattu amalah. You don't do that. 
You don't do that because in reality, eh, what? Allah can forgive any sin except what? And for dunya, Allah can forgive sin, right? In dunya, but sin dying with it, right? Or meaning on the day of judgment. But any sin, well, they can tell you, you could see somebody doing the all type of haram. All type of haram. You can you can label him a dweller of hell. You can't. Because he's under the will of Allah. Under the will of Allah. إِذَا شَاءَ غَفَرَ له وَإِذَا شَاءَ عَذَّبَ If Allah wills, he will forgive him. And if Allah wills, he will punish him. So don't get yourself in that area there, inshaAllah. So this is what? Two. Number three, you have to show mercy. Oh. شوف الحديث ارحموا من في الأرض Be merciful to those who are on earth The one in the heaven will be merciful to you من لا يرحم لا يرحم Whoever does not show mercy to others He will not be shown mercy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala هكذا If you want to receive Allah's mercy You yourself be merciful this is an example of living the name. Number four, ya ikhwa. With dua, huna, by the way, it doesn't mean dua haja. The scholars divided the dua into two types. Pay attention to this. Dua uthana, a supplication of praise that you praise Allah. And the other one is what? A supplication of need that you ask Allah for a certain thing. I want to ask you something. Which is better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? One or two? The breeze is much better. Because do you know what is good for you? Huh? Ya Rabb, Firari, Ya Rabb. Red Ferrari, Red Ferrari, you Ferrari out. Allah. So Ferrari was good. It's not good. With that, Subhanallah, and Matuthni Allah, with that, Subhanallah, had a dua, a dua, dua, no abbas, no dua, a car. The dua that you should make when you are what? At distress. What does it mean, distress, by the way? What does it mean? That you run out of all your means. There is nobody to help you. What should you say? La ilaha illallah al-azim al-halim. La ilaha illallah rabbu al-arsh al-azim. لا إله إلا الله رب السماوات ورب الأرض ورب العرش الكريم. That's it. That's the dua. What did you ask? Did you hear me saying anything? أثنيت على الله بأحب الثناء. You praised Allah with the most beloved praise He loves to hear. What is the most beloved praise Allah loves to hear? La ilaha illallah. And there is hadith Abi Sa'id that Musa alayhi salatu was salam asked Allah, Oh Allah, teach me something that I can invoke you with that no one else ever praised you with. Ya Musa, say la ilaha illallah. So Musa said, Ya Rabb, everybody says La ilaha illallah. Ya Musa say La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Wa izzati wa jalali. By my might and glory. If the earth and the heavens, the seven earth, seven heavens, are placed in one pan of the scale, and La ilaha illallah in the other pan, La malat bihinna La ilaha illallah. Yunus, Jana, in the belly of the wheel, what was his dua? وَذَنُّونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ 
فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين. There is another profound evidence. خير الدعاء دعاء يوم عرفة. The best of dua is the dua made on the day of Arafah. وخير ما قلت أنا والنبيون من قبلي and the best dua me and the prophets before me made was what? What was the dua? لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على This is the dua. هكذا. ف... I want to go back to number two. That we understand the names and the attributes in a manner that correspond in comforty, conformity with, in accordance with the first generation of Muslims, three generations of Muslims. What does it mean? Number one, you affirm and negate with an evidence. And that's the misunderstanding. Some people believe that they only affirm with the evidence, but you can negate as much as you want. Like, why, like that's why al-Ashairah they start running their mouth. Allah is in a place without a place, and He does this without does that. Where do you get that language from? Where? Ah, philosoph, the Greek philosoph. الفيلسوف ابن الذين الجريك اليوناني اليوناني المشرك جايب منه الكلام ده لا 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 أنا لا أتحدث عن الله بكلام فلاسفة I don't use philosophic language when I talk about Allah اقرأ كذا عقيدة الأشاعرة في 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 الله كلام كفر كله لا when we speak about Allah remember what any word that you say about Allah about Allah you know, I, I, I had this debate with this Christian. So the, you know, when you're debating, normally you come up with some weird things, you know. That's why never judge the aqeedah of someone from a debate. Like, don't go and pick on Sheikh Uthman because he said something. He's, he's debating. You may have to use some weird analogies to bring the person to their senses. So I, I said, you know, that the, the, the uh, subject of the debate was the uh, uh, divinity of Jesus. I said, listen, this subject is killed. I use the word killed. In, by one verse in the Quran kills it. Which is what? They used to do what? Jesus and his mother they used to do what? Khalas. The fact that you eat, that means you need. That means inta mutaghayir. You, you depend on someone else. And that's the same analogy, by the way, Ibrahim used with, the, with his people. You know when Ibrahim looked at the star? He said, this is my Lord. Don't think Ibrahim said, this is my Lord. لا, Ibrahim is debating. You guys know these verses, right? فَلَمَّا رَأَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي This is my Lord. And then, after it disappeared, he said what? That was, what was his point here? Some, some of you may think that because Allah, Allah because the God disappeared, is that what you think? What, what was his point so? The fact that you appear and you disappear, there are other elements that affect you. The daylight make you, make you disappear and the night made you what? So you're not independent. You are you're what? You're getting that. That's the same analogy. Some of you looking at me like this, like yeah, I'm, I'm saying something like puzzles or something. You guys getting this point or no? Yes. Okay. The important thing is the 
names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you negate, you must have evidence. Number two, this affirmation and negation has to be without, this affirmation has to be what? Without four things. When you affirm an attribute for Allah, you have to do this without what? The following four. Number one, negation. You can't negate the entire names, the entire attributes, or partially. You cannot do that. Two, ta'wil, without distorted interpretation. And this is what the asha'ira do. When they recite, yadullahi fawqa aydihim, the hand of Allah is above their hand, they take the apparent meaning of the word hand to a hidden meaning. They say the power of Allah, because the hand is the source of what? Of power. Allah, Allah is the power. Don't say hand of Allah. Don't say that. Say what? Power of Allah. Distorted, corrupt, ta'wil, interpretation. Number three, without tajseem, without that you resemble Allah. You see, Allah looks like that. Allah is like that. You don't do that. Here is the iffy piece, which is what a lot of us have a hard time with. Without dictating the nature, the modality, the reality of the attribute. You can say Allah does this like that. Like the brothers who were asking me last night about tanazzul. Uh, You're trying to dictate something. Don't dictate that. See, he, he descends in a way what? Suits him. Khalas. Well, this is extremely important, by the way. This is extremely important. <laughs> the scholars, they say what? You must cut off any hope that you can reach the reality, the modality, the nature of Allah's attribute. Look at this. Bil Janan, Wabil Banan, Wabil Lisan. Atiqad and Bil Janan. What is that? That. Okay, brothers, let me think of Allah, and I'm going to tell you how He rose above the throne. Oh, yes, Salam, Lawfi. That will help. You need to understand this. A, there is a, a, a certain tabaqa uh, for Sufiya. It's a tabaqa to the Hashashin. And I'm, I'm really talking to the Iqra Kedak al Kalam Hadaf al Kutub. Those who smoke before what they do what? Before they do that. Before they do their dhikr. Because that helps them to what? To imagine Allah in a certain way. That's crazy. Whatever your mind produces, what should you say? Subhanallah. And Allah is above that. Anything that your mind produces. And by the way, I want to tell you, shaitan sometimes attack us and get us to think of Allah in a certain way. And this, by the way, happened even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of his companions came to him and they said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, we think of Allah in a certain way that we can say them. Nata'adham. You know what the Prophet said to them? He said to them what? This is the purity of faith. But what that the Prophet is, is referring to here? Purity of faith in, in what? Thinking of Allah in that way? لا, not saying. 
that you don't say that. You don't run your mouth. You don't run your mouth. You, you know, that, that attitude that we get from the West, I have to express my feelings. <laughs> you know, good luck with that. We don't do that stuff. Don't run your mouth. اكتم ولا كلمة. تقولش ولا كلمة. والرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم actually in uh, مسند أحمد he said what? يأتي الشيطان أحدكم. The hadith is authentic. Shaytan will come to you. Look at this now. And he will ask you, who created the heavens and the earth? Shaytan is asking you. Guess what? Shaytan is going to help you. He's very kind. He's going to give you. Say Allah. Say Allah. You're going to say Allah. The shaytan is going to tell you that. And you're going to listen to him. Say Allah. Tab, who created you? Say Allah. Here, here is he's taking you. Who created Allah? That's in the hadith. Who created Allah? What should he? Imshi min hina ya ibnil. Get out of here. What, what should you say? Amantu billahi wa rasulih. I believe in Allah and his messenger. Don't, oh, don't run your head. You can't because you cannot reach. Again, we go back to the last. What is the last? Have you seen Allah? Can you see Allah? Did anybody see Allah? There is anything that exists that looks like Allah. Subhanallah. So how, how do you produce that? Based on what? How do, you, how do you know this is right? It doesn't make any sense. Think about it. Also, tahriran bil banan, that you draw a picture. But then, subhanallah, some of, just to show you that hadi al aqida mosaic, mosaic actually. Some of us, when we read the first ten commandments, the first ten commandments, what is the first ten commandments? Read the entire commandment, not just you shall not take another God before me. Open Sheikh Google here and ask him the first ten commandments. Can you read it all? All of it. The first ten commandments. You're not supposed to take to make an image of him. Icon of him. You can't. So you cannot do kayfiyya. You cannot do kayfiyya. You cannot do that. Or قولاً باللسان اعتقاداً بالجنان قولاً باللسان أو تحريراً بالبنان That you actually describe Allah in a certain way. You say Allah is this, Allah is that, Allah. But be careful here. Listen. Pay attention to this. What we give up knowing is how. But does Allah act in a certain way or no? Yes or no? You, it seems like you're not convinced. So, you see, we still believe that Allah does things in a certain way. So the action is what is done. But what matter to forward? التفويض هنا ماذا? What do you give up? You knowing it. You knowing it how? You don't know how. But the attribute or the action takes place or no? Yes. Come on, yes or no? Yes. Say it like you believe it. Yes. Ah, right here. So the action happens. But what I don't know is what? How? And don't even go to that zone. And here is the interesting piece. Allah did not make it mandatory upon us to figure it out. Did Allah ask you in order to be a, a, a sincere slave to me and in order to admit you into Jannah, you have to find out how I rose above the throne. Did Allah ask you to do that? Have you ever found a command like this? Allah didn't ask you. <laughs> Allah didn't demand you to figure it out. So what are you worried about? Why do you like to, to take extra curricula? In Islam, when there is no, uh, what, what do you call that, uh, uh, extra grades or what? Uh, uh, huh? Why? Why do you do that? Ah, fasad al-aql. Ah, that's when the, the human becomes what? Slave to the intellect. They think that they are very smart, genius. They think they are genius. Like many progressive Muslims now. 
They are gurus in their field, but you give them the mushaf to read, Wallah may Allah fiqra al-mushaf. He is a PhD in this field, but he doesn't know how to recite the Quran. He doesn't know how to recite it. We يتكلم في الدين لا 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 stay away from this area فهذا هو يا إخوة some few may you know may say what benefit do we get when we affirm the attribute one of the scholars who excelled in this field is Shafi'i is tying the rituals, everyday ritual, with the beliefs. طيب. In Salah, why do we look down? Why it is disrespectful to look up like this? Because who's looking at you in the Salah? Why you're not supposed to do like this? Because who's looking at you? Allah. Well, if you believe that, if you believe Allah has a face and He looks at you, if you negate the face, if Allah doesn't have a face, then khalas, do as He pleases. Some Muslims, they pray like that. Yeah. You believe is Allah above the throne, right? Yes. Sahih? Yes. Uh, well, if you believe Allah is everywhere, <laughs> Why do you do like this? No. You're, you're getting that. These names and attributes, they have what? They have connection, linkage to your rituals. Why, why in the Salah, if you pray, you're supposed to have what in front of you? And if somebody comes to walk in front of, between you and that sutra, you're supposed to do what? And who is sending him? Come on, guys. That's all connected to what? The presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you when you pray. When you negate these attributes, huh? then they have no value. They have no... لا. These names and attributes they have. I even mentioned the إخوة في ال in this book. I put together something called seven questions query. Actually taking you step by step in how to affirm without negation, without. I think it's chapters maybe seven or eight, something like that, in part three. You're gonna enjoy that. It says seven query S S Q sequence of questions query. Why do you have to affirm the name? Huh? Because it's mentioned in the Quran. But what if you do not affirm the name? Like, let's say, I even mentioned that in my book. Let's say the people who do not affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the throne. Let's assume that everywhere so what did you cancel from the revelation the seven heavens the water and what is above the water la al kursi al kursi is a component of what all of this is cancelled out all of this is cancelled out you guys getting the point or no all of this is what and those are what? Quran and Sunnah. If you open the Quran, those are authentic. <laughs> I mean, Quran is Quran. And authentic what? Sunnah. Huh? Al Arsh. Wa kana arshuhu ala. And his throne was above what? You cancel the water that is above the seven heaven. Wasi'a kursi yuhu. You cancel the, the footstool. So what are you going to do with these revelations? What? فهذا هو. One last thing, يا إخوة, before we close here. The human intellect must 
occupy themselves in this matter. And Allah knows that. And that's where we're tested. And that is where he revealed to his messenger the hadith is authentic, Sahih al-Albani, fi Mu'jam al-Tabarani, hadith ibn Umar. What did the Prophet say? Tafakkaru fi ala illah wa la tafakkaru fi Allah. If you want to visualize something about Allah, visualize some of the things Allah created, but not Allah. Don't visualize Allah. But let's take example of things Allah created. And that will give you what? That will give you an understanding who you're talking about here. <laughs> the throne, not the throne. Al Kursi. What did Ibn Abbas, what Ibn Mas'ud said about Al Kursi? If you compare the Kursi, which is a component of the throne, the footstool, with the heavens and the earth, it's like what? A ring, you throw in a desert. Who's the ring here? Who's the ring? The seven heavens and the seven earth is the ring. The desert is what? And by the way, the Prophet did not say desert, Sahra. He, what did he say? Fala. You know what Fala is means? Bound, boundary, boundaryless. Can you say that? Without boundaries, yani. Without boundaries. Desert without what? Without what? al Fala. Different to desert. Desert has boundaries. Fi Fala. طيب look at this look at this حديث جابر في سنن أبي داود the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says what أذن لي I was given a permission to describe for you one of the angels who bear the throne how many angels bear the throne ويحمل عرش ربك فوقهم يومئذ ثمانية his feet is in the seventh earth his head in the seventh heaven. The distance between his ear lobe and his shoulder would take a bird 700 years to cover. Now, <laughs> you have an idea who we're talking about here? Huh? Before Amma Hassan calls the Adan, just allow me two minutes. A Jewish rabbi came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدٍ طبعاً إِنَّا نَقْرَأُ فِي التَّرْحِ حديث البخاري ومسلم حديث أبي هريرة. I'm not making up this stuff. يا محمد أو محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم إِنَّا نَقْرَأُ فِي التَّوْرَةِ We read in the Torah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the heavens on one finger. Now your mind is going to play what finger? Huh? What should you say? Subhanallah. Shaitan is going to invade you. Finger, Allah's finger. Astaghfirullah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. You're tested with that, by the way. This is like a test, like any other thought, like any other devil thought that you, you have. You understand? Like you're thinking about adultery. You're thinking about stealing. That's exactly another test. That's what you don't pay attention to. But somehow a lot of Muslims feel like, oh, I got to express my feelings about it. No, that, you can't express your feelings about this, my brother. You don't, you don't do that. Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. That's how you express your feeling. Oh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the earth on one finger. Again, Shaitan is going to play with you. Get you to do what? Visualize it. Say what? Subhanallah. And if shaitan manages to get you to already think of the fingers of Allah in a certain way, say, Allah is above that. Allah is not like that. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem That's it. That's how you manage that. And the rest of the creation, and then he will shake them. He will shake the entire creation on his finger. Then he will say, Anal malik. 
I am the king. أين ملوك الأرض؟ Where are the highnesses? Huh? Your highness. You know, your, you know there's people in the earth? Highness. Where are the kings of the earth? أين الجبارون؟ Where those who used to oppress other people? Upon hearing this, the Prophet وسلم, smiled حتى بدت نواجذه until you could see his molar teeth. And he said, we read that in the Quran. And he recited the verse in Surah Al-Zumar, which says what? وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ وَالْأَرْضُ جَمِيعًا قَبْضَتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ مَطْوِيَاتٌ بِيَمِينِهِ So what's in the Torah is in the Quran? That Allah will have the earth and the heaven in his hand. فهكذا ف... This gives you an idea who are we talking about here. Now you think with your mind here, you can produce an image of Allah. Huh? Impossible. Impossible. For this is the subject you got to take on with Christians and Jews, if you want to give them da'wah. Any other subject, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. Especially if the person believes in his religion, if he knows his stuff. Why? Because the Christians turn God into a spirit, into no essence. He goes into what? The flesh. Jesus is God. Dual. That's how they end up. Like the people who say, the, you know, God comes on me. Wahdatul wujud. Christians, uh, Jews turned Allah into a human. He created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he does what? Don't say it, please. Please don't say it. It's very blasphemous. Don't say it. Huh? Then he, if, he say, if you say that he rests, that means he gets tired. That's a human thing. I go to sleep because I'm tired. Allah doesn't get tired. Oh. Inshallah, we're going to have Amma Hassan call the Adhan. Uh, there is an announcement. Announcement. Okay. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's Muhammad from the media. So we will take a one minute break. Uh, please uh, take out your phones and follow us on YouTube, Ilimcon, and Instagram at Authentic Ilim, and on Facebook, Karim Abu Zaid. So please take a minute before Asr, take out your phones. Uh, we will check on exit, you know, we'll check all your phones. And uh, the second thing is we have three days of beautiful footage from all the mashaykh over here. We are making a team of three brothers and three sisters. So please reach out to me. And we are going to make this content into short shorts and reels. Put it up over the coming next six months, eight months before the next uh, Ilm conference. Uh, also, the QR codes are on the screen. Uh, so people who are watching it live, uh, we are making a team of three brothers and three sisters who will review all the footage of the three days and inshallah make short sh uh, shorts for YouTube and reels for Instagram. So please reach out to me, brothers. And for the sisters, please reach out to the volunteers upstairs. And we will train you on how to do this. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fikum.
Um, first of all, uh, before starting at all, I'd like to uh, thank um, those in the background, those that have done everything to make this conversation possible. Um, I'd like to thank the Mashaq for inviting me once again to the AIM Um, yes, so in regards to dealing with the mis mis misconceptions, there's too many misconceptions to deal with. And it's really hard to prepare, it's really hard to prepare for everything. But inshallah, a lot of them can be dealt with swiftly without like any prior knowledge of the arguments. Um, so number one, like let's say uh, someone was going to approach you um, you're doing perhaps like some street dawah or something, or it could be like online dawah, it could be anything. And the person approaches you with something you've never heard of before. Someone approaches you with an idea, like uh, a claim, a really strange claim, like the Prophet, peace be upon him, permitted uh, cannibalism or something like that. How would you deal with that? It's something you've never heard of before. Um, and perhaps they would be quoting some Arabic um, and you know it's a legit quote from somewhere. How would you deal with that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to anything to do with Islam is you need to tie everything to the primary sources. So if you want to present anything that has to do with anything to do with Islam, it needs to be based on the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, especially when it comes to dawah purposes, especially when it comes to providing information to non-Muslims. Um, and uh, alhamdulillah, much of it is very easy, much of it's very basic, much of it's things that we we all know of, um, matters that have to do with tawheed, um, verses that every Muslim memorizes can be brought up, um, matters to do with the Prophet, peace be upon him, are very basic, um, and, and the basics are uh, what's mainly needed to do that well. However, when you go into the intricate things, when you go into uh, more specific details, you always have to be uh, familiar with what you're quoting. You have to be sure of what you're quoting. Uh, what I was appreciating when I was listening to uh, Sheikh Karim just recently, every time he's quoting something, he's telling you this is a sahihain, this is in Majm al Tabarani. He's telling you uh, about the Tasheeh, the authentication the Hadith has received. And these are very important things. And when when you come like that, um, it's it's not just beneficial for you, it's also for the person that's listening to you. It's beneficial for the whole community, the, the Muslims around you. B making sure you know where you're getting this information from is the first and most necessary step. Yeah. Now, uh, if, if you're going to do this, though, um, there's something that's going to occur naturally is you're going to have to second guess some of what you've heard of um, in the past, some of what you've heard of while watching TV, watching some YouTube, um, heard from a family member, heard from a friend, even heard from like a random sheikh on a pulpit. Um, you can you have to second guess a lot of things that you have no source for 
Yeah, everything has to be based on authentic knowledge at the end of the day. Now, it makes things difficult because you feel like you've accumulated a chunk of knowledge so that now you actually have to look up, you have to look into before you start using. However, despite it being um, not the easiest task, it makes your task when dealing with misconceptions easier or this narration when the person says that Islam allows cannibalism well you deal with that first and foremost by asking for a source where did you get this hadith from who narrated this hadith by the way just by asking that question you have pretty much um, dealt with the vast majority of the arguments that you're going to face, like randomly on the street, or, or randomly on the line, um, because most cases, those that are coming with arguments, they even these actors, they believe that Islam, for example, hypothetically, but they don't know why they believe in it. They got no idea. Is it taken off of some anti-Islamic website? Is it taken from a critical Islam? Is it taken from an authentic Islamic uh, source? Um, you never know. And they don't know sometimes. Um, so it's very important to simply say, what's your source for this? Why do you believe in this? Why should I believe in this? You got to tell me where it's from. So that's the first thing. Um, and like this can apply to uh, like a really, really common misconceptions. Um, well, inshallah, I'll, I'll get to that later. So if it's something that's not found in the Quran or the Sunnah, there's no reason to assume that it's obligatory in Islam or permissible in Islam or prohibited in Islam, right? Everything has to be based on a source. Um, yeah, so by the way, that is a very easy tip. Um, everyone should make use of this, but of course you have to apply it yourself once again, because your foundations, your faith needs to be based on the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, and just because it's something that's like uh, something, uh, just because whatever's brought up perhaps is something that's uh, um, something you find in the Muslim communities, it doesn't mean that it's something that's endorsed by Islam. Uh, we always have to clarify that the actions of some Muslims do not necessarily reflect the teachings of religion. Of course, it doesn't just apply to Islam, it applies to any worldview, any religion. Um, yeah, so first tip. Um, and tip number two, imagine you're approached by someone that provides you a reference for a hadith. You know, again, <laughs> now they're coming back with this cannibalism idea, but now they provide a reference. How do you deal with a report like that? Someone tells you, oh, and the Sunnah that up only hadith number 55, hypothetically. Cannibalism is permitted. How do you deal with this? So in many cases, you will like run into something like this, not specifically this, because there's nothing like this, but um, you will run into a question that you don't have an answer to, um, which is natural because we're all starting somewhere. And um, the vast majority of us uh, um, haven't been doing this for too long. And uh, it's natural to be surprised by some arguments and some allegations against Islam. So, of course, yeah, yeah, the, the obvious way is uh, thinking critically about what's being said, looking into it, um, asking them to provide the report, um, looking into the context, things of that nature. However, what's also extremely useful is simply turning around to those with you and to see if they have an answer. And that's one of the nice things about online Dawa, because usually you have multiple people like on the panel or on the platform. And even if you have like a weakness, 
Um, so for example, I'm, I don't know, I don't know too much about um, the Bible. I don't know too much about church history. Um, I could turn around and look towards uh, Sheikh Uthman, for example, and say, yeah, Sheikh, help me out here. Can you, you know anything about this? And it says it's something that he knows a lot more about than I do. And there's so many issues that can be solved like that when you're on a panel or when you're with a group of people. Everyone will have their strengths. Everyone will have their weaknesses. No one's a complete master in everything. So if it's something that's not your field, then the best, my best recommendation is to pass it on to someone else and to get someone else to provide an answer. Because at the end of the day, our goal isn't to simply speak or make that well for my edge for me to gain, for me to solve the problem. No, the, the intention is to spread the message. It's to spread la ilaha illallah. That's the intention. Intention. Then it's not about being the person to answer the question, but it's about getting the allegation answered. It's about providing clarity. It's, pro it's about providing guidance to those that are seeking it. So now that's one uh, possible way of dealing with the whole matter. Um, the other possible way is, let's assume that you get asked to this specific matter and you have nobody to pass it on to. Um, you're with a group of friends and you're asked, you're doing some street that way, you're asked about certain Darakutni, uh, for example, Hadith number 55, it allegedly says something about cannibalism. You're stuck with the allegation, you have no idea how to handle it. The best thing for you to do is to simply say, I haven't heard of this before. And that's much better than attempting to answer something and butchering the answer. What you can do is this, you can reassure the person that it's something you're gonna look into, you can reassure the person that it's not something that's fundamental to your faith and doesn't shake your faith. This is not shameful. This is not Ayyub, by the way. What's Ayyub is completely messing up an answer, completely providing uh, an incorrect answer that conflicts with Islam. That's the worst case scenario. You never want to give something that conflicts with the deen. What you want to give them is something that represents the deen. What you can say is this, you can say, listen, you've brought something to me that I've never heard of before, which is fine because I'm not a scholar. I'm not an expert in this field. There are people that are, um, I can reach them. I can return to them. I can ask them. I reassure you, I will do this. However, um, even though I don't have an answer, it doesn't change who I am at the moment. It doesn't change my perspective towards Islam. And the reason I'm telling you this is because my faith isn't based on that specific matter that you brought up. My faith is based on the foundations of the truthfulness for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the truthfulness of his message and the correctness of his message. That's what my faith is based on. And from there, what you can do is you can um, direct the conversation to, pro to positive proofs for Islam. And that's something that you can always be prepared for, as opposed to dealing with misconceptions. So, and, and of course, yeah, and, uh, there's so much to say. Every one of us has their reasons for the truth of Islam, and uh, the reasons are innumerable. You can just continue writing and writing and writing and coming up with arguments, and subhanAllah, like just in the past year, I've come across arguments that I haven't come across before for the correctness of the deen. So, hello. so in any case, um, what I was hoping, what I was hoping at Jamaa is we could do some, some a bit of a role play here because um, uh, the Ukhwa, um the brother sent me a list of misconceptions or types of misconceptions. It would be nice to go through these because remember, 
or um, point number two, when you when you deal with the misconceptions, um, it's always beneficial to pass it on to someone else. So if you do not have an answer, uh, a really good thing to do is to say, hey, how about you answer this? Um, you want to go ahead and share your thoughts? And, and through that, of course, we learn from each other and we um, filter out bad answers and we stick to the best answers for misconceptions. Sometimes there are multiple answers to a misconception. Some answers are better than others. Some answers are simply incorrect. And sometimes there's only one answer. But yeah, sometimes there are multiple answers to specific questions. So there's no harm in uh, going at it in this specific way. So, um, okay, let me, let me try to pose this question to you guys and hopefully I'll be able to hear you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute myself and I'm going to try to listen through the stream. Um, so the first one is, the first one is um, Islam promotes violence and terrorism. So when I was a teenager, um, I don't know if this is like uh, outdated, but like back in the day, the main thing that comes to the mind of a non-Muslim when you speak about Islam uh, would be like 9-11. Um, and it would be brought up. You, you hear about it a lot. Uh, Muslims have been accused of terrorism and whatnot. So uh, question number one, how would you deal with someone that says something like Islam approves of 9-11? Yeah, the folks. I'm gonna. Anyone is answering? Yeah, Anyone Mike. To give it a go? The mic, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, brother Farid. So, uh, the way I would, <clears throat> how, how I would address this is, well, every, no matter the religion, no matter the country, every type of group in history has created, has done some sort of terroristic acts, some sort of violent acts. And I would also tell them, well, when we go back to our primary sources of Quran and Sunnah, we don't find these uh, killing innocent people, these terroristic, uh, uh, ideologies that that they claim in Fox News, we don't find this. Instead, what we find is uh, self-defense. Even if there is uh, quote unquote uh, the 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 verses they would quote, these are actually self-defensive and not anything to do with killing innocent people. And I would show them the verses where it talks about it it being self-defense rather than um, and and I would quote those verses to them. And I would also, t uh, and I would let, I would allow that conversation to go into the, what Islam actually teaches us to b live peaceful lives, to be kind to our parents, to treat our mothers with respect, to treat our fathers with respect, and that's where I would lead the conversation. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think uh, in the Quran there's something saying uh, if you kill one innocent, it's like you killed the whole uh, humanity. So uh, that's what I would uh, say to him. simply say something along the lines of uh, the actions of some individuals do not reflect the actions of a religion. And yeah, again, yeah, the, uh, they were, I mean, it's, it's not even uh, an attack on an army or anything like that. It's a randomly uh, killing innocents that were working in uh, buildings. Um, so subhanAllah, um, Islam does not uh, endorse actions like that. Um, how would you folks deal with 
um, a hadith in which it says, and by the way, this is in Sahih Bukhari, I was granted victory through terror. They would say Islam promotes terrorism because of the, how would you deal with this? Uh, I would say that uh, the actions of the few people, these terrorists who like uh, try to cleanse the banner of Islam and scream Allah's name and they do their acts, do not reflect the uh, teachings of, of Islam or the uh, beliefs of the Muslims. Because I could like take up a, let's say, Canadian flag and like start like harassing women out on the street. Does that define what Canadian values are, what the Constitution says? No. It's the same way with Islam. Just because it's a foreign thing to you, it, that makes it easier for you to like group all of these like foreigners in that, like under that banner. But however, this is not the case. And Islam itself has like many rules of war, one of which is like not kill the innocent, not harm the innocent, to not like destroy places of worship, which these people exactly do. And there are like sources for this, like which you can like show them that this is what Islam truly says and not what the media like shows you or what these people claim to be. Yeah, Allah folks, it's in Hadith al Bukhari. I was granted victory through terror it would seem to be a correct translation how do you guys deal with that sorry um so <clears throat> i might be wrong here but i think i heard um that hadith before and there's in a the lecture and it was specifically talking about Ghazwat Badr when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, granted victory to the Muslims by uh, inducing terror in the uh, hearts of the disbelievers. And you know, the verses in Surah Al verse in Surah Al Imran and then the verses in Surah Al Anfal. So I think that's what the hadith is referring to. So it's important to bring back the context of the hadith and what the Prophet is referring to. I'm personally not familiar with that um, context. If you have uh, a reference, I'd happily look into it. Um, so what I've come across is it's simply saying that uh, the enemies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, felt terror um, way before he'd even reached them. Um, there is like a, an alternative report that says that um, I, I was granted victory through terror um, despite being like a month away. So it's, it's referring to, and by the way, this is in Sahih Muslim. Um, so basically, his, his, his enemy is, um, they would be terrified of him and his army way before they even came. Um, so that's from the Hadith in Sahih Muslim. It's not referring to um, the killing of civilians or anything like that. Then, of course, there's an equivocation that's occurring here, right? Because today, when you hear the word terror, you're assuming terrorism, you're assuming killing the innocents and whatnot. But uh, the uh, usage of the term terror doesn't just necessarily refer to that. And, and uh, of course, it always meant to simply um, striking fear in, in the hearts of opponents. Um, nothing to do with the killing of non-combatants or anything like that. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on here. Let's move on. Um, uh, Sheikh how about Muslims oppressing women and denying their rights? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, the most popular uh, 
argument that comes to mind is women aren't allowed to drive in Islam. How do you guys deal with that? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, so uh, about that, like, as far as I know, Aisha used to ride her horse. So that's, I don't need to go into detail, but as far as I know, that woman used to ride their horse, you know, so it's not like something new or whatever. Maybe like the driving the car is something new and that's not in every country. And about women's rights in Islam, like, women have lots of rights, we just have different roles, like the men and women. Like there is, um, like the woman, when you go to marry them, you pay dowry to the woman, not to her family. And that's just to, that's just to protect her in case that, um, like something happens to the husband or whatever. Like that's to protect her for after. And the money goes to her and she gets to spend it on what she wants or not spend it. And same thing if she works, if you allow your uh, wife to work, if she works, then uh, she doesn't have to spend the money on the family, on the kids, provide. The man has to do all of that. It's not like the men are oppressed, I'm not saying that, but we're, we have equal, we're both equal, but we have different roles, and that's just how it is in Islam. It's a very practical religion. Jazakallah khair. Who wants to answer? Someone raise their hand? Assalamu alaikum. So regarding this, I would firstly start with brother asked a very good question. I'm joking. But I would say about this is very stereotype. And I got this question last year when we had a Dawah event at college. And and I would have said firstly that same thing as the brother over there. But then I continue. I would say that what's the biggest country with the biggest population. I mean, biggest population of Muslim country in the world is Malaysia, and there the women could drive. So this is basically like Western ideology. They always look at Saudi, like Saudi, Saudi, Saudi. Like why they can't do this, why they can't do that. And also a brother over here, he actually said a good point. In Islam, when a woman leaves the, her house, she will be with a wali. And he, he give a good point if she's going out with the wali, then why she needs to drive, but she could drive, of course. This is my opinion. If I'm wrong, please forgive me. Barakallah, um, Say so the, the simplest way of dealing with it, uh, like this specific one, I would say is um, there's a narration in which Abu Huraira narrates that it's not permissible for a woman for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to travel for one day and night except with a man. Um, now there there are multiple wordings. Some some reports say two, some reports say three. However, like we, we do understand from this that travel is permissible um, for women. So some cultural practices, of course, conflict with uh, Islam, to be honest, Danny, or, or at least uh, limit, limit uh, some matters um, that uh, uh, Muslim women had more access to in the past. And the example of Malaysia, I believe you mentioned, is a good one. Um, okay, how about this one? This is, this is a bit more controversial. Um, in Islam, it's permissible to beat women. How do you guys deal with that? So, it, should I just stand up? For the, yeah? Okay, you got me there on camera. So, no, in Islam, the permissibility of uh, beating a woman, um, just saying it the way it is, it's like to beat, um, the context isn't given. And to understand that what is permissible of what you are allowed to do, it is the last case scenario, uh, or not last case scenario, but there's several steps ahead of it. And... Um, it's more of a slap on the wrist type of an action, more so than the beating of, you know, kicking and hitting and um, whipping and lashing at your, uh, at, at your women. 
So this whole concept that Islam allows the permissibility of women, rather Islam restricts already in which in um, uh, uh, many societies predating um, you know, the rights of women in which it became illegal to hit women, Islam came and said, you must advise your women, you must speak to them, uh, you must boycott them for you know, speech for days if they're not uh, persistent. Um, and then finally it would come to the point of where uh, you would hit them with a toothbrush. And now this pain, is, uh, this hitting is not to inflict pain on them and to bruise them. It's more so like a, a shaming thing. Like an, you know, slap on the wrist. It's not to hurt the child, you know, or, or to hurt somebody. It is more so um, like, a, like a cautionary thing. Uh, disciplinary, and, and at times it's more of like a, uh, um, like a shaming thing than it is to inflict pain on them or to bruise them. Assalamu alaikum. So I had this question to my sheikh, and he told me that to hit uh, is not actually the action of hitting. It's just like he mentioned the hadith, the Prophet showed how it's done. It's just like taking the siwak and just to put it uh, onto the woman, just to show that this is the limit. And this is how he demonstrated and he showed me. And regarding uh, uh, like uh, hadith wise uh, there's many hadiths the Prophet also mentioned that the best of you are the best to your wives so this is basically contradicting or uh, beating because Western media like I said they're like beating oh why do you beat your wife why do you beat your wife and stuff like that these are arguments that will always come and this is how I would reply to this question Just like to remind anyone who's ever going to use that report, it's, in that, it's actually narrated by Aisha. Um, the best of you is the best uh, to his wives. It's found in Sunan Tirmidhi. Definitely, um, it doesn't mean beat your wife black and blue. I'm pretty sure that's not what's meant by being the best to your wife. Um, moving on, let's move on to the idea of forced conversions. Any thoughts on forced conversions, folks? It is Islam promote forced conversions. Can you some of these are easy, by the way. Some of these don't require too much of discussion. But I mean, they come up a lot. So can you explain further, like what exactly you want to ask the question? Okay, so, so by forced conversions, simply um, forcing someone to convert to Islam. Um, so, I would reply to this with, uh, first of all, I think there's a ayah in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah where it says, uh, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي. Um, so that's uh, one of the eyes you could use. And another example is ومن شاء في اليوم ومن شاء في اليكفر. So like, it's up to you. Like, uh, no, there is no compulsion in religion. And um, even as a Muslim, you, you you don't have to, like, you're not forced to pray. It's all up to you. So um, yeah, in the end. Like, I don't think there's any evidence that they can use to um, bring forth to show that, oh, we force anyone into Islam. And uh, if anything, why would anyone be forced into Islam? Because then they wouldn't just follow it and that would be a bad example. Um, we want someone who has uh, ambition, we want someone who has passion, um, who chooses to follow the right path, who chooses to follow the Sunnah of the Rasulullah. And um, like when you teach a, a kid Quran and you're forcing him to read that Quran, you can tell that he has no energy to read it. And there's a clear difference between someone who has passion to uh, seek knowledge and uh, be a hafiz of the Quran. You can tell he's always memorizing, he's always uh, keeping up with his health. But then when you're forcing it on someone, and I'm just giving this as an example, but you can tell that they don't want it. And that's like a good example of like, there's no need to um, enforce anything on anyone.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we all know the narration of uh, regarding Umar radiallahu an, where he had a slave, and he would advise the slave to accept Islam. And every time the slave refused him, he would stop himself with uh, the ayah of the Quran that the other brother mentioned, la ikraha fid din. And that slave eventually, as, as the narration goes, I think, died on kufr. And throughout the history of Islam, there have been recorded populations, uh, minority populations of non-Muslims living in the Muslim lands, whether it was with uh, the Khilafah Rashida, whether it was with the Umayyads, the Abbasids, and even the Uthmani Khilafah. In fact, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the Jews were able to still uh, exist after the Inquisition was because of the Uthmani Khilafah. They had some place to flee to. And that is all for me. All right, you guys hear me, by the way? I was uh, speaking a bit there. I don't know if my voice came through. Oh, I'm frozen? Okay. All right, you guys hear me, by the way? Okay, I'm not frozen. <laughs> I was, I was looking at myself in the screen. I'm like, am I frozen? And I, and I realized I was just not moving. Like, um, folks, so, yeah, a very useful, um, definitely using those verses work. Um, however, I just want to point out that, like, literally not praying could, like, take you out of the DN. Difference of opinion, but it seems like the majority um, hold the view that um, not praying, yes, does take you out of the DN. So, technically, if you're a Muslim, you're technically forced to pray. Um, unless you no longer want to be a part of the end, which is another topic completely. Um, number four, Muslims worship a different God. If someone came up to you and asked you, or said to you, you Muslims, you worship a different God. You don't worship the God of the Christians and the Jews. What would you say? I would just ask them to bring a, uh, I would just show them the Arabic Bible and then take them to the New Testament and then I'll show them John and then I'll show them where it says Allah and it, is, it literally says the word Allah so that's what I would say um, I would say that it's true Muslim, we don't worship the same God that Jesus and the Jew worship. Um, the different, we believe that our Rabbi never had a son, and we never had a son. Um, we don't believe that in the Trinity. That's the way Christians believe. And the Jew believe that um, Hussein is uh, Ibn Allah, as the Quran said. So that's the different, we will say. Allahu Akbar. So I appreciate the second answer and the first answer, definitely. Um, so the, the, both brothers were lo looking at this from a different perspective. Um, the first brother was simply lo looking at it as uh, God, as in God, God the Father as uh, seen in Christianity and, and God in the Old Testament, while um, the second brother was looking at it like, no, nah, they worship Jesus and they take Jesus to be God. Of course we don't worship Jesus. So yeah, I appreciate both answers. He, there, there are multiple ways of approaching this. Um, I think the simplest way, or the simplest thing to say is, listen, we believe in the Lord of Abraham, the Lord of Moses, the Lord of the previous prophets. We believe in that God. We believe in the God of the Torah, right? We believe in, in him. Um, however, uh, we disagree with some of the things that you attribute to him. Um, however, ultimately, ultimately, it is the same God. Um, and yes, of course, we deny that, uh, we deny the concept of the Trinity and all that. But we do believe that the message that 
the deity sent to uh, the previous prophets um, sent another one, and then that is a it's a continuation. That's how I would say it. But yeah, um, yeah, so sometimes sometimes you have multiple correct answers in regards to this stuff. What would you say if uh, someone said that Islam is incompatible with modernity progress? It's a weird one, but how would you guys deal with that? I would say that modern values are incompatible with humanity. Uh, these, like many of these modern values, you've seen the uh, destruction of the uh, family structure of the individual, of society, and all these like things that they produce is, or they promote is that my body, my choice, I know what's best for me, and all this, which is objectively not true. Like these things always lead to your destru destruction. Whether like it was the Romans, like every empire that like had this thing, always was without fail destroyed by their own doings. And these things, like it shows time and time again that these are not compatible with human values. Now you don't like hearing this, but this is what you need to hear. The truth is rarely something that you like to hear. The truth is bitter, it's hard, but that's life. That's how the world works. Uh, alaikum. Uh, modernity is like, uh, of course it wouldn't be compatible with Islam because Islam is complete. Uh, modernity is like a progress. Uh, it's trying to change, it's trying to evolve, right? Well, Islam is already complete. It doesn't need modernity, right? Um, it doesn't claim subjectivity. It claims objectivity, so it would, of course it would be correct. Like it, it, of course it wouldn't be compatible. I'm, I'm trying to deal with uh, a random non-Muslim in the comments, by the way. <laughs> Do excuse me for getting a bit distracted. of technology is it referring to the acceptance of like liberal values so it really depends on where they're coming from um yeah sometimes you know it's it's silly stuff like uh, muslims are against technology things like that weird things or uh, muslims did not develop technology um we didn't develop them we'll buy them we'll buy them we'll use them uh, it's, it's not an issue in any case let, let's let's move on um, okay, this is a really weird one, and, and I have no idea who, who made up these questions, but these are the questions that I received, so um, I'm posing to you guys what I've received, and perhaps like a bunch of this stuff is um, something that you guys hear a lot in the West, but uh, they, they do seem a bit strange to me. Misconception number six, Muslims are all Arabs. Yeah, folks, let's, let's get rid of this one quickly. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, this misconception is pretty common. So, I'll first address it by uh, speaking of how Islam first spread throughout the Persian continent. And then, the Islamic missionaries, uh, they even ended up going to the Indian subcontinent. This is pretty early on. And how I'm pretty sure about like 40% of, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like 40% of Africa is Muslim. Uh, a lot of uh, the South Asian subcontinent is Asian. And how Islam is not limited to Arabs because even the <clears throat> because even the like original message of the Bible, the original message of uh, the Torah, 
they come back, they allude to Islam essentially. So, and we even have the verse about how there's a prophet sent to every nation. And we see like remnants, even in, I think there was a Brazilian tribe. It had uh, signs of a like, complete tawheed and that they worship one God. And this is a tribe in the, like the middle of like Brazil. So yeah, that's all. Sorry. So uh, I would say, um, if you look at the population of the world, right, the Muslim population country, in countries like Indonesia, in Pakistan, in India, there's hundreds of millions of Muslims, and around 80% of Muslims are not Arab. So I would use this as uh, evidence against their misconception. All we need to do to erase this misconception. No? Okay. I can repeat that, please. <coughs> can repeat that, please. All right. Um, misconception number seven Islam encourages intolerance towards other religions. How do you folks deal with that? Assalamualaikum. So, personally, from learning from the Sira, I would first start with just the Prophet وسلم, himself. Um, Medina, which is a well known Muslim uh, place, visited by many, um, I would just say that he, the Prophet وسلم, didn't come from there. He came from Mecca and went to Medina, and initially, uh, there were many, um, well, many of the Yathribites were actually um, Jewish. Right? And I would explain how this is one of uh, the first places where um, I, I, b I believe that it's, it was an uncommon thing at the time where uh, there was the idea of a freedom of religion, right? Because Islam itself, as someone asked earlier, it's a religion that um, allows people to only convert from their own free will. Therefore, they weren't able to just uh, force everyone to convert. Alhamdulillah, eventually that happened uh, from their own free will. Not completely, but the majority at least. Alhamdulillah. So I think that would just be a good point. Well, uh, in Surah um, ch chapter 60, verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, uh, you know, dealing kindly with those who neither fought you uh, or drove you out of uh, your homes. And this is talking about the uh, non-Muslims. And it says, Allah loves those who are fair. So for one, we can also remember um, just historically looking at uh, when, you know, the Muslims um, conquered uh, Jerusalem. At that time, there's no Jews. When uh, Umar ibn Khattab went there was no Jews. The uh, Christians had driven out the Jews, and he asked for the relocation and the reassimilation of the Jews in, into the population. So, if Islam has no tolerance, um, we would have not, you know, historically done such things. And on top of that, uh, we know that non-Muslims do live in Muslim countries, and we're not talking about recently. We can look at places like Egypt. Coptic Christians have lived alongside Muslims for, you know, as far back as Islam goes. So. Um, to say that Islam has an intolerance towards other uh, faiths is an incorrect statement and the Muslim world and in the fact that you know non-Muslim uh, uh, you know Christian Arabs uh, uh, and you know Christians uh, not just Christians actually different faiths of uh, different Muslim countries do exist is in and of itself evidence that there's a huge tolerance uh, from Muslims towards non-Muslims uh, Brother Fadi this was our last uh, response and uh, we are out of time after this inshallah All 
right. Um, so in regards to the issue of intolerance, I really, I really believe it depends on what's meant. Um, is what's going on like, is, is it the idea of absolutely no tolerance as in uh, end all religions, end anyone who believes in any Islam? Of course not. Of course that's not what's going on. Of course there is... Um, there was coexistence and there is coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslims. There always has been, right? So I guess it, it would de depend on what is meant by intolerance in this situation. Um, does Islam um, treat like other religions uh, in the same way as it treats uh, adherence to its own religion? No, of course it doesn't, right? So like, for example, we have jizya. We have matters like that. Um, there is an issue with like... Um, uh, like some specifics when it comes to uh, fiqh matters um, in, in which a Muslim is favored over a non-Muslim. So you're, you're going to have some favoritism there. However, um, it's incorrect to say, you know, it's, it's complete intolerance, um, which is fine because at the end of the day, you know, Islam is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the only correct religion. So it's, it's natural for there to be some favoritism. Um, so I, I w what I would do is when faced with questions like that, with terms that or to a degree ambiguous i'd always ask what do you what do you guys really mean by this what do you mean by this word where are you go where are you going with the word intolerance that's how i would do it again multiple ways of approaching these things um all right do we have time uh, folks for for another one or how much are we on time no we're actually uh, out of time unfortunately ah <coughs> uh, we are out of time oh mashallah yes this, okay <laughs> I'm just realizing the, the message. I'm just realizing the, the message. It's a bit of a delay. He's watching my stream and announcing. Hello, hello, Sheikh. Hiyakum Allah, Habibi. It's a bit of a delay. He's watching my stream. Allah, Hiyak. Just wanted to say salam, Habibi. Just so. Allah wa rakib wa rakib salam. to share my thoughts and um, uh, folks yeah, you know, it's, it's a learning process inshallah um, we keep on doing this we keep on uh, upping our game we keep on uh, learning from these experiences and, and I wish you all the best with uh, your endeavors and da'wah and spreading la ilaha Allah um, thank you for hosting me barakallah feekum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh wa barakatuh
What time are we? What time are you like? Are you tired? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salam ala khatim al anbiya ashraf al mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. So Alhamdulillah, you've had a lot of lectures and a lot of talks and a lot of training and a lot of practice and Alhamdulillah, earlier today we went, uh, Brother Nazir and other brothers, we went out and we did some da'wah on the street and I was there for about an hour, Alhamdulillah, we had two people accept Islam and one of them actually took the shahada, Alhamdulillah, the other one accepted but wanted to wait for the shahada but Alhamdulillah they accepted and that tells you that there is a very important job that you have upon your shoulders. There are people that are wanting to find the truth. I mean, imagine, hidayah is from Allah, guidance is from Allah. But imagine if we didn't go out, because today we were debating in the morning, should we go, should we not go? If we didn't go out, these people had the thirst for the truth, but they, they wouldn't have had that means, you know. A lot of times when we go out and do da'wah, it's really, I mean when you watch, I don't know, if, maybe you guys have seen that we have a channel called One Message Foundation, so there are a few videos. Sometimes we have this crazy debate that will be really intense and we'll go evidence and evidence and we'll show the truth and the person still won't accept Islam. And, and again, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam couldn't convince his own uncle because hidayah is from Allah. Hmm? And at the same time, sometimes we go out to the park and somebody will come up to us and, hey, I want to become Muslim. And you're like, whoa, uh, do you know about Islam? He goes, yeah, I've been reading and I, I just was looking for a Muslim. And you talk to them and they take their shahada. And, and what's very important is to know that you can't guide anybody. If anybody here thinks that I'm so intelligent that I'm going to go out with this great debating skill and people will become Muslim, Man, you need to check your aqidah. Hidayah is only from Allah. All of us only wish that Allah makes us the sabab. And this is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine somebody is heading towards the hellfire. And guidance is from Allah. They have that want to know the truth and you just become that means. And they accept Islam upon your hand. You became that means of them knowing Allah, knowing the purpose of their creation. Imagine every salah they make. Look, I'm just going to be, you know, we've already had enough lectures. I'm just going to be straight like I'm being real with you guys, right? I'm not depending on my actions because I'm telling you like I'm not a great guy. Right? I have a lot of weaknesses, a lot of shortcomings. Oh, you're agreeing a little too much there, bro. <laughs> Do you know me really well or something? <laughs> he was like, yeah, you are a pretty bad guy. <laughs> right? Huh? Oh, does that mean that I'm bad? <laughs> all, of a, all of us a little crazy? Yeah. Right? I mean, my salah, I don't think it's going to meet the, the level of you guys. Like, I think you guys were better than me. Maybe my dhikr, I don't think it's as good as you guys, right? So, I have to be real with myself and think, look, uh, I'm not taking Jahannam as an option. Like, Jahannam's not an option. You can't, you know, like, like if you're drowning and the water's taking you down, drowning's not an option. You got to do something. Like, you got to try. Even if you don't know how to swim, you got to, like, do something, right? So Jahannam is not an option, I can't spend you know, even a second, I don't want to see Jahannam, right? And if my amal, I mean Allah knows best what Allah accepted from us, right? How do you know a single sajda that you've ever done is accepted? If that's not, so, so what's my plan, right? So my plan personally, I'm sharing personal information here, is if I can be a means of somebody better than me coming to Islam, and by the mercy of Allah, I get the reward of their actions because Allah made me the means, maybe that's what can save me. Right? So even if one person gets guided to Islam through you from kufr, imagine every salah, every dua, maybe they'll do a hajj that'll be better than yours, maybe they'll memorize the Quran better than you, maybe they will give da'wah and thousands of people become Muslim through them. What a beautiful business. Right? What a beautiful thing. And again, 
this is not something, uh, I want to emphasize this, this is not something that means you have to go out and debate. Da'wah is not about debate. Yani, sometimes you do have to debate. Da'wah is done differently. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself banned pretty soon, so this is going to be the lecture, just in case. <laughs> I'm going to mark when I got my Canadian visa revoked. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have visa. Um, in the time of the Sahaba, عنهم, sometimes the da'wah was a sword. I mean, we're not ashamed of any of this. Like, we're not, like, I don't know, people became like cowards nowadays, right? No, sometimes Islam would be spread using the sword. I'm not saying with the sword, not by compulsion. We don't force anybody to become Muslim. But sometimes the blockade to da'wah was like the Persians or the Romans not allowing the da'wah to go. And the Sahaba went with the sword. And they sacrificed their lives. And from their sacrifice, from them leaving their houses and leaving their environments and leaving their leaving the best environment, Makkah. Imagine, imagine being in Makkah in the time of Rasulullah sallam, in the best generation, in the best place on earth. Imagine being in Medina with the Rasul alayhi salatu salam teaching people in Masjid al Nabi, like what a beautiful environment. But then the Sahaba left that to go out and spread this religion. And many of them, they died. They became shuhada. Their graves can be found all over. And they did it, why? Because they realized the importance of saving mankind from the hellfire. So they went out, right? And da'wah at times will be with lisan, with the tongue. Right? Like, you look at many of the Sahaba, they went to different areas, they gave the da'wah, the people became Muslim, they said, okay, no fighting, no problem. You keep your government, you keep your wealth, we're not here. You're a Muslim now, alhamdulillah. That's all we wanted. Da'wah at times will be the qalam, the pen. The great ulema of Islam who wrote about Islam, who wrote any rudud to the shubuhat of the kuffar and things, this is their da'wah. But everybody should have some involvement in it, right? Now we see many of the people, like there's a brother that took shahada here live with you yesterday, right? This brother, I never spoke to him. He's not from San Diego. He never came to Balboa Park. He found out about Islam through Instagram. I don't have an Instagram channel. <laughs> I don't even have Instagram, right? Somebody somewhere took our videos, posted them, and from that, Allah guided this person. Right? So, what does that mean? That means all of us are involved. And whether you are known or unknown doesn't matter. In the end, all that matters is that Allah knows. That's all that matters. Somebody, maybe even a sister, sitting in her house, in her abaya, in her hijab, in her niqab, in, her, in, the, in, in the protection of the sharia, ah, she's sitting there and maybe making clips and posting them. And from that, Allah is guiding thousands of people around the world. She's not on TikTok making hijab tutorials with makeup on and things. And, no, we don't violate the rules of the Sharia ah for da'wah. But she is active in da'wah. You know, there could be a 12 year old brother somewhere, you know, he's still in, I don't know, middle school, 12 years, <laughs> right? And he takes these videos and puts them on TikTok. I've never downloaded TikTok on my phone. I've I don't, never. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a dancer. I don't like dancing, right? But there's some 12 year old sitting somewhere that's taking clips and putting them on TikTok. And the most, like when I see people that are like, hey, I've seen you somewhere, there's mostly TikTok. And I don't even have a TikTok. OMF doesn't have a TikTok channel, right? But somebody's involved in that da'wah. So we need to all be practically involved in the da'wah. And one of the very important aspects of da'wah from the practical aspects of it, Pay attention. Is the post shahada. Right? Okay, somebody took shahada, hugs, takbir, woohoo, now what? Right? Alhamdulillah in San Diego, we have, Jazakallah khair, we have a whole yani, uh, focus, which one of my sons, mashallah, and one of the few other brothers they, they work on, which is post shahada. Teaching people wudu, teaching people salah, dealing with people's personal problems. If the sister takes shahada, husband's not Muslim, now what do we do? 
Brother takes shahada, parents kick him out. Now what do we do? Brother takes shahada, doesn't have a job, what do we do? Right? And this is where we always, in our da'wah, we always go back to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Our da'wah cannot be based on new principles. It has to be based on the Qur'an was sunnah. Some people always come up to me, I've come up with this amazing da'wah formula, and if you use it, then this is... Like, I already got a formula. What's that? Qala Allah wa qala Rasul. That's my formula. That's all I need. So when you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when somebody would become Muslim, he would assign the Muslims to be there for them, to teach them, to educate them, to help them financially. You know, even when you look at the hijrah, when the people made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, there, were, there was a akhuwa, there was a brotherhood that was made. Where at a time, they would even inherit from each other. Until uh, the hukam came that, no, you don't inherit from each other. But that's how close of a, of a bond they had. And as we find, Ibn Kathir mentions in Bidaya wa Nihaya, that when the Sahaba from Mecca came, many of the Ansar, they were, they were so hospitable that they would tell them, look, you're my brother. Whatever I have, half is yours. Imagine somebody just comes from another city, you don't even know them, and you're like, okay, my house, I'm going to put a wall in the middle, half of it's yours. I got two cars, here's the keys to one of them. Even they, and they went to another level, they even said, like, I have more than one wife, I'm going to divorce one, you take one. Like, they were that hospitable at that time, right? So, it showed this brotherhood, and when somebody accepted Islam, many of them would stay in Medina, and they would be, Ashabu Sufa were not, Stagnant. I mean, some people would come, they would stay in the masjid, they would learn, and then they would go move on. So the number would fluctuate. So some of them would become Muslim, they would stay in the masjid. And the Sahaba would bring them food and teach them, and they would learn aqidah, and they would learn manhaj, they would learn Quran, they would learn sunnah, they would learn whatever they had uh, to benefit from the Prophet والسلام, And then they would go back to their areas, and then they would give da'wah. So, what is the practical message? When somebody becomes Muslim with you, now you have to make them a da'i. No, that's not always going to happen. It's going to happen sometimes. Somebody will become Muslim and then they'll leave Islam. It's not your fault. I mean, you're not held accountable for that. There are Sahaba that became Muslim and became Murtad. And some of them, like Ayyash radiyanu, he came back to Islam. Right? So, guidance, once again, is not from you. But your job is to do the work. Right? So if somebody becomes Muslim, now you have to think, okay, how can I make this person a Dai? How can I make this person understand the ahkam of sharia that they need in their daily life, right? So we, we've made videos on wudu and salah that we share with them. Then we have brothers who call them, follow up with them. We have barbecues for the revert sometimes, you know. We bring them all together and, and you have some of the brothers who have knowledge sit with them to have uh, any entertainment time. You need to figure those things out for yourself. Right? You need to figure out how are you going to deal with those challenges, right? But that's a part of da'wah. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at, at, at the One Message Foundation channel, you'll see a lot of people, like our brother Richard, our brother Matthew, you will see uh, our brother Saul, uh, you'll see, who, who you will see videos of them when they were not Muslim. And you will see videos when they came to debate with us. And you will see videos when they took their shahada. And now you'll see videos of them giving da'wah. Now you'll see them, mashallah, upon the sunnah, you, if you come to San Diego, you'll see them in the Durus, our brother Ben. SubhanAllah, we've had at least twice that I can remember that people came at the same time, a brother and, 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 a, and a female, and alhamdulillah, they both took shahada and we did their nikah right there. <laughs> no, you know, lengthy discussions of families and mahar and this and that, no. Made a wali and khalas, yani two witnesses. Yani. So, these are things that are practical steps. Now we have to look at da'wah from a practical perspective. But I tell you, if we do not fulfill this responsibility, if our neighbors and our co-workers and people around us die on kufr, and we had the opportunity to convey the message to them, wallahi, we will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. We will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. This is the responsibility we have upon us. So every one of us has to get involved in the practical implementation of da'wah. 
Now, since we've had a lot of lectures already and a lot of lengthy talks and Sheikh Ibrahim Zidan and Sheikh Kareem and our Brother Farid, they've all, mashallah, partaked with such knowledge to you. This is, from the practical perspective, I gave you this. Now, I'm going to open it up once again because earlier we had this uh, scenario uh, kind of conversation, it was very beneficial, that I want you guys to hit me with the hardest questions you guys get. Right? Don't take it easy. Right? I want the hard stuff, right? Because... There's a QR code you can scan to join the Dawa group. Because before leaving here, we want to practically instill the practice, meaning that we have brothers from Toronto that do do da'wah and we're going to make a schedule and we're going to have, have yani, istiqama, inshallah, steadfastness in going out and speaking to people about Islam. But first I want to set up this opportunity where you can ask me questions that you're afraid or that you're apprehensive when you get out on the street and the sisters have a mic as well. Okay. Sisters have a mic as well, apparently. Huh? We'll start with them. Shafni, man, you're really pro sisters here, mashallah. Good. Khalas, sisters, I'm just trying to help the brother out. <laughs> Khalas, sisters, we can start with you because earlier we didn't get any from them. So go ahead. You guys can ask your question first. Are you going to make me read? Are we, is there a question upstairs or? If my tea runs out then we're going to be in trouble so. This one the sisters? <laughs> um, yeah, sisters have questions, just give us a minute please. Okay, inshallah. Alright, uh, in that minute we'll take the brothers. Go ahead. Uh, this one I've heard in real life. If Islam is like, says that all races are equal, why are only the Quraysh allowed to, allowed to rule? Excellent question. The question is, if in Islam all races are equal, why are the Quraysh the only ones allowed to rule? First thing, that's not true that the Quraysh are the only ones allowed to rule. And no doubt, if you look at the history of Islam, we've had Khulafa and leaders who have been other than Arab even, right? There is the hadith about the 12. Give it to me as a I'll put it with the other questions. Uh, about the 12 Khulafa that will be all from the Quraysh. And as in the sharh of that hadith, many of the ulama have mentioned that this is regarding the particular 12. Meaning that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiyanhum, and then some of the ulama put Hassan and then Amr ibn Abdul Aziz from them, all the way out to Mahdi alayhi salam. And those, by the will of Allah, they were chosen to be from the Quraysh. But Rasulullah also told us that if anybody becomes an authority over you, you obey them. Right? And that's why we see in the history of Islam, other than Arabs, Salahuddin Ayyubi and others, who did rule the Muslims with the Quran and Sunnah, the Muslim Ummah gave them bay'ah. So there is no racism or any virtue of a race over another in Islam except with taqwa. If we look at the best of mankind, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was Banu Hashim from Qurashi, Arab. But at the same time, the one clearly given the glad or the bad tidings of Jahannam, Abu Lahab, is also Banu Hashim, Qurashi, Arab. So in the end, it's your Iman and your Taqwa that gives you distinction. Tayyip sisters, are you guys ready now? Yeah. as alaykum. Wa alaykum as We have a couple of questions. We've gathered questions, so... Um, first question. Um, what is the question? If Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was to be an example for all time, why did he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, marry a young girl? Something that is difficult for people to accept today. Gotcha. Um, so, everybody heard the question? Yes. Okay, good. The beautiful thing about Islam is that it is an example for all of mankind and all times. So, if Rasul Alaihi only married women over 18, right, and under, I don't know, 40 or whatever you want to 
gap you want to make, that would not be a practical model for all people of all times. Because yes, maybe in the Western society today, we have set up an artificial standard because there's no legal or natural biological reason for it that we say, okay, 18, you can get married, right? But where did we come up with that? Right? And in a society where at times, like in the olden days, when they didn't have schools, they didn't have high school, they didn't have middle school, they didn't have college, you know, in societies where once your body was physically ready for marriage, you were to marry. In that society, if we were to say, no, you cannot get married until you're 21, for example, that would not be practical for that society. So what does the Sharia set? It said something that is very beautiful. Rasulullah married women that were much older than him, and he married women that were younger, as long as they were physically ready for marriage, which is a biological indicator, right? Which says that this person is ready for marriage. So now we go with the urf of the time. For example, here, if the custom is that somebody waits till they get, you know, they're 16 or whatever, 18, I don't know, then that's fine. Sharia doesn't say you have to marry somebody yani, from the age of Aisha radiyallahu or the age of Khatija radiyallahu or Safiya radiyallahu anha. No. And if you are in a different society, even today, in many parts of the Muslim world and other parts, you will see people that get married much younger than what we see in the West, right? Even if you go to the Philippines, if you go parts of Africa, if you go to Afghanistan, if you go to those areas, you will find people that get married very young ages. And it's hypocritical for us to sit here and judge them by our standards. Right? Just like somebody any, if in another country might come up with the minimum age of marriage being 30. And then they sit at, look at Americans or Canadians getting married at 16 or 18 going, oh, that's so unacceptable. No. Nature gives you certain physical signs that somebody is ready for marriage. And what we find in the West is a very hypocritical society, right? Because if you look at the age of Mary, and as mentioned by biblical scholars, it's between 12 and 14. And you can Google this. And the age of Joseph being at around 90. But nobody is objecting to that. If you look at the vast majority of the kings that we had, they married girls that were very young, and European kings all the way down to seven and so on. But then when we say that, they say, oh, no, no, that was a different time. Okay, well, this was a different time as well, right? If you look at the Bible, you find Rebecca, according to the verses from the Bible itself, when you put it together, she was at the age of three. So now, how is that not something that you object to in the West? Even if you look in the West, People, I mean, I'm going to be blunt here, people are having sex when they're in middle school, when they're in elementary school. In San Diego, we have a middle school that has a daycare center because so many of those girls already have kids. Well, why is it okay for them to be having sex but not to get married? <laughs> you know, this is a hypocrisy and we don't agree with that. The Prophet ﷺ, he married women that were of different ages, that were of different backgrounds, some of them, and I have a series on, uh, on the seerah, with every marriage, I explain the Islamic benefit of the marriage, why it was done. None of them for just physical enjoyment, right? These are all that give practical implementation of Islam in different times, in different societies, in different places. And we stand by that. Alhamdulillah. Your sisters still have the mic, so go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Right, so another question is, if I am counseling Muslims, counseling Muslims or non-Muslims LGBTQ as a good social worker, what should I do? Oh, that's a great question. If you're a social worker and you're counseling somebody who's got this issue, then counsel them, you know, just like you would an alcoholic or somebody who's, I don't know, into bestiality or something weird. You, you may want to give them good advice. Yes, all, all perversions are the same to me, right? So you may want to give them any good advice and, and give them, uh, inshallah, a means of guidance towards recognizing their creator and accepting their, the, what Allah has and nature, as you could say, even if they don't believe in Allah, has naturally given. When you look at the... The, the, the aim of any species is to procreate and to further the species, right? Like bees, they, you know, and birds and the bees, I can, right? So whole the point is to further the species, right? That, that's what nature 
even if you don't bring religion into it, that's what biologically you do. And that happens with a man and a woman. That's how it works. Okay? Any species, any type of, even if you take lions or monkeys or you know, octopus or whatever, right? if, if it starts being man and man and woman and woman, that species will not exist. It will not survive if that becomes widespread. It's the way it is. Right? So we're not, as Muslims, we're not bringing something unnatural. We're not bringing something that you won't find in the old scriptures. You will not, not something new. We are showing that we believe in a lifestyle that has been the natural method, the predominant method throughout history and throughout religious texts. You can live in Levit Leviticus, in the Old Testament, or Romans, in the New Testament, or in the story of Lut salam in the Quran. This is the natural way to be. Now, there is a, a push for us to be silenced. If you say something, you're cancelled. Well, cancel me. Go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> what are you going to do to me? You going to put me in jail for it? <laughs> right? I'm not afraid. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to speak my mind. If you got freedom of speech, I got freedom of speech. And if you want to put me in jail for it, man, Yusuf salam went to jail. I'll do time. I'll get, I'll get my work out in. Right? I'm not scared of any of these things. We speak the truth. With hikmah, with wisdom, we want good for everybody. If somebody is involved in any kind of sinful behavior, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's pornography, whether it's whatever other disease of the heart that there are, or LGBT, XYZ, we want good for them. We want them to come back to their natural state. And inshallah, in a nice way, we can explain that. All right, hold on. Let me see if the sisters have any more. We'll give them one more, then we'll come to the brothers. Sisters. Um, okay, so how do you address people who feel, who feel like the Salafi da'wah is too difficult, especially related to Hayat? Related to what? Hayat. Hayat, like shyness or Hayat, like life? Oh, no, no, sorry. Related to hijab. Ah, hijab. First thing, uh, da'wah salafiyah is not something new. What, what does it mean, salafi da'wah? It's not a cult, it's not a sect. You don't have to listen to one particular shaykh to be salafi or so on. What is the da'wah salafiyah? It is to say, that the best example that Allah has given for us are the Anbiya and then the Sahaba and the Tabi'un and the Taba Tabi'un and the great Imma and Ulema of the early generations like Abu Hanifa and Shafi and Malik and Ahmad and those great Ulema. This is the best example, right? And, and this is for the whole Ummah. This is not like a group. It's not like, you know, we have Salafi only meetings, like you got your little Salafi card, you know, you know. No, it doesn't matter what you wear, it doesn't matter, you know, where country you come from. That's not what it is. It is to say that many of the people, they started to bring what was, what was introduced to the Ummah later. Like the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya, who, who brought Ilmul Kalam and all these things that were introduced into the Ummah later and they preferred that the way of the khalaf and this to say no we want to go back to the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the way of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum and the best of the generations that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised in the hadith about the best three generations that is da'wah salafiyah so da'wah salafiyah is not about how much hijab you wear or don't wear or how long you're bearded or it isn't or what color your thawb is or isn't that, that's not what it's about Right? It is a manhaj an aqeedah, a belief system to leave that which was introduced later, to stick to that which is from the early generations. And every Muslim should be on that. Now, there are those who will bring يعني, certain bid'at, like this tariqah and this way and this method, and, and they will prefer that over the way of Rasulullah sallallahu and the Sahaba. Even though that sounds crazy, but that's how it is. Some people, they say, you know, you wake up, you have to make this dhikr, and this time you make this dhikr, and this time you do a backflip, and you do this dhikr. I'm not kidding. Go check it out, right? I mean, I've got videos, you know. You know they, they, I got this, this video of this maulid thing, and these guys are like, who, ha, who? they're like, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're practicing some hip movements for, for what? A bunch of guys, but maybe they're, right? But, but, but this is not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they prefer this way. So we say, no, this is not the way. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us how to make salah, how to make yani, your adhkar. There's a hadith, a sahiha, on which the dhikr you should be making from the Rasul alayhi salatu salam. We say we prefer that. That's da'wah salafiyya, right? When somebody says, no, uh, Allah doesn't have sifat, and Shaykh Karim, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him, he explained this already, or, or they deny the, some of the sifat, or they give ta'wilat from their own minds, we say no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do that, the Sahaba didn't do that, we stick to what they stuck. They believed in it, they accepted it, they left it, bila kayf, and we, we stick to that, that's da'wah that salafiyah. And every Muslim should be on that. Now, when it comes to the matter of hijab, there's not an issue of da'wah that salafiyah or da'wah that mu'tazaliyah, I don't know, or jahmiyah. Uh, if it's in the Qur'an, and it's in the hadith sahihah, then every Muslim has to follow it. And if you don't, ask Allah for forgiveness. And ask Allah for tawfiq and ability to do it. But it's not like, okay, if you're a Salafi, you're going to wear hijab. And if you're a Sufi, you're going to walk around in a miniskirt. No. <laughs> Even though, I mean, we see that sometimes, but that, that's not the way it is. If you're a Muslim, then whatever Allah has ordered in the Quran, whatever Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam has shown us in his way, is your way. And if you reject that way, then check your iman. All right, inshallah, brothers, go ahead. This brother had his hand no, for a long time. I want to add that about the LGBT thing. They said that all they say that this homosexuality is fine a lot of other species as well. Okay, like, yeah, so good. No, no, good question. So people say that you do find certain incidences of homosexual behavior amongst animals. First thing, I've actually read those studies. And it's such a minute amount, it's ignorable. You, you, in fact, if you actually look them up, you will find that, that the observation of those animals are sometimes performing the same acts with, with, with pieces of wood and things. Like a dog humping somebody's leg. Like, like that's not really a, a evidence for the natural way. But even if they say that, okay, do you find cannibalism in those cultures, on those species? Do you find incest? So are those okay? To them, yeah. Well, then tell them, lakum deenukum wal yadeen. Khalas. Faddalu, brother. This is one issue. Oh. Uh, one issue that I uh, found very recently was the matter of the concept of hell in Judaism. Yes. That uh, the origin of J uh, Jahannam was from some valley named Gehennam uh, near hmm? Gehenna near uh, around the Dead Sea, and uh, some people use that as a way of refuting the Quran. Uh, Got it. What is the origin of that? Easy. When we talk about Jahannam or An-Nar, these concepts have predated any valley. Now, today we have a place in San Diego or in, in the US called Death Valley. Okay. Does that mean the concept of death came from Death Valley? <laughs> or is it because that valley was so hot that people started calling it Death Valley? Right? We have a, a place where Imran used to hike called Devil's Peak. What is it called, Devil's? In Yosemite, right? right? Does that mean the concept of shaitan came from there? No. Look, linguistics sometimes develop. And no doubt that there may be places that were given such names because there would be a harsh environment. But we know that Adam alayhi salam and, and, and Nuh alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam warned their people about the Nar and about Jannah already. And whether you call uh, al qariya or Haqa and these different names for the Day of Judgment, for, the, for a Nar, these are just names given to describe. So this doesn't mean that we, we took this concept from a valley. That, that just doesn't make sense. We can predate the message of the Anbiya to any valley there. Right? So these are just people trying to make little tricks. Right? We tell them, look, we believe in the Quran. And the Quran tells us there is a place called Jahannam. Whether you call it An-Nar, whether you call it whatever else, al qariya we believe in it. And those names... But the linguistics of that may develop. If you look at Al-Qa'ra, there is sarf. There is, you can look at the root word and all of that. But that doesn't mean that's where we got the concept from. Well, I'll give some other brothers a chance when you got... About this. All right, go um, ahead. From a second perspective, an atheistic perspective, in ancient Judaism, there was a concept of um, hellfire. Like in many of the things in the Old Testament say that justice is like only in this world. And my Jewish professor explained that this concept comes from like Zoroastrianism, like a, a hell, an afterlife. So, so the Jewish perspective of hell... F uh, changes. I spoke to a rabbi, a young student rabbi, or young rabbi, I don't know what to call him, um, and he told me that today I don't believe in hell, but a hundred years ago I would have. So I don't know what that means. You know, this is confusing to me. But 
Anybody else's concepts, Zoroastrians, Hindus, Jews, doesn't matter to us. Our aqidah is not based on them. Our aqidah is based on qala Allah wa qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam. And we believe in it 100%. So whatever any other faith had or didn't have, whether Zoroastrians had this idea of this half, I don't know, like a half lion, half bird, half guy, the guy with a big beard, and, like, and that was their idea of an angel, maybe. Well, nothing to do with us. <laughs> Our uh, idea of Jibreel alayhi salam and Mikail alayhi salam and the Malaika have predated all of that. Fadlu, the brother in the cool green jacket, shirt. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum um, as so my question is related to um, Safat. So how would you respond to someone who says that um, Allah's characters, does Allah need his creation to exercise his characters? No. Um, and how do you balance? That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> but how do, you, how do you justify that Allah is merciful and Allah can punish at the same time without having his creation there? The first thing, we don't need to justify anything. Allah is Rahman, Allah is Rahim, He is Shadidul Aqab, He has said this about Himself, Khalas, that's it. We don't, we don't need to get into this philosophical or discussion. Look, Ar Rahman is from the Sifat Dhatiya, this is from the Dhat of Allah. Even if there was nobody to show Rahmah to, Allah is still Ar Rahman. That's how it is. He is the Khaliq before there was the Makhluq. That's His Sifat. He is, the, he is the one. He doesn't need anybody or anything. The fact that Allah is the Khaliq, Khalaq, the Rahman, Rahim, whatever sifat, if they're in the Quran, if they're in the Ahadith al Sahiha, we believe in them as they are, and that's it. And if somebody says, no, you have to have a creation to show mercy, we tell them, where did you get that principle from? If it's not from the Quran and it's not from Hadith, ma salama. You can keep your Greek philosophy to yourself. So I'm gonna go for the left because I've been taking everybody from the right. So the brother in the cool Emirati tov and stylish glasses. Zakallah khair first of all. Um can we do a small role play? Go for it. Okay, so I'm gonna be an atheist. May Allah um, protect you. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So do you actually believe that someone up there is writing your sins or what you do good, what you do bad? Well, I, I believe there's angels here that are writing my sins and I believe there is one up there that knows everything, yes. Okay. And when you guys do your movements, praying, movements. Um, what, what it, like, do you guys talk to someone? Do you get connection to someone? Yes. How do you feel? when you I feel amazing. <laughs> I feel bliss. Okay, I have a Hindu friend, they pray to some Statue, or they feel good after praying to them. No, no, I, I don't doubt that. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that point. Okay. Tell me this. Where did you come from? I came from China. China? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's like a, yeah, a friend okay, of mine. I got you. I got you. You came from China. No problem, bro. All right. Now, where did you, as a person, originate from? As a human being, where did humanity come from? 2.2 billion years ago, from. 2.2 billion. Fungus. You even got that date. Excellent. Go ahead. From Just fungus or... From fungus? Or like some weird... Man, you need a science class, here. but go ahead. So, 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 2.2 billion... Now, this is great, because when they say something like that, khalas, you just won it. Like, they just lost, right? 2.2 billion years ago from a fungus, prove it. Common ancestors. We're common ancestors with what? We learned it in biology. You learned 2.2 you learned billion years ago in biology? You should have failed your class. <laughs> okay. No, look, let's talk science, right? I'm not, I'm not afraid of science. Jump in because I'm a biologist, so I can challenge you quickly. Oh, let, let me deal with him and then you can, I'll deal with the biologist in a second. Go. At this very point, I can basically push you a little bit. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Take two, two at a time. Yeah, so basically all the science we do is mm -hmm. based on homology. So we, really? we treat cancer genes in mice mm -hmm. and they work in humans. You, you basically well, not, not always. First not time. always. <laughs> like, I, I actually do cancer research, so like not always, but yeah. this is how we basically okay. test the genes. Like sure. we screen all the genes in mice, and then they, we take it to human, and Got it. sometimes it works. Sometimes right? it works because I do work in clinical trials, yeah. and there are times when remedies are tried on animals that don't work in humans, and that's why yeah. to get FDA clearance. Bro, yeah. I work in med devices, I got you, right? <laughs> right? Sometimes you have to start with animal trials, but then you have to show human results. Yeah. And many medications have worked in animals and didn't work in humans. In fact, do you know what's the closest skin type to humans? Pig. Pigs, not monkeys, by the way, right? Do you know we share about 70% of our DNA with, with bananas? 
I think 70 or 50 percent, you can look it up, right? With bananas. Okay, 50 percent, we'll, we'll round it, right? Does that mean that we came from bananas? According to science, really? that would be... So really? According to science, be careful with that statement because that's not true. Because science, as you well know as a biologist, is really the observation. It's a process. You have a hypothesis, you put it to the test, you check for repeatability, right? You see whether you can repeat the results, then you can show cause and effect, right? So, I mean, science isn't just like this blanket statement, right? So, we have never been able to prove in a clinical trial, controlled environment, that we came from bananas, right? We've never, right? The, so, you can't say according to science we have. What you can say is that we do find things that have similar building blocks, right? Similar genetics. No problem with that. We believe Allah created all of us, right? We will have similar living cells in us, no problem. But the question I have is where did you get 2.2 billion years from? So gotcha. this is based on pseudogenes. So okay. the, the idea that in our genome, there are genes that are not functional. Okay. You, you find them functional in other species of the past. Gotcha. Or other like, species that are they might be... Not my be question. 2.2 billion, where did that number so come from? So basically you, cal you can calculate the uh, probability of DNA mutation over time. So is that a fact or, or a theory? You can calculate the mutation sure. rate in... in, in but that's still a theory, right? Because you yeah, can't so test it. Yeah, so basically to explore it back to sure. the timeline, it's, it's Can a you test it in a controlled environment? Uh, mutation in one generation, yes, no, no. but not the like age, The age, 2.2 billion yeah, years coming back. Is, you cannot you test it. Cannot uh, yeah, test thank it, you. but... So if you cannot test it, that means it's not a scientific fact. Right? So science is basically, if, if you know how science works, yeah. it's, it's a null hypothesis sure. versus alternate hypothesis. Um, you, I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but could you um, put more volume to your voice? We can't really hear you from the sister's side. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> no, the other guy. Oh, the other guy, brother. Sorry, sorry so mm -hmm. when basically null hypothesis means that there's this 2.2 million doesn't exist. And then you okay. do an experiment and say, okay, fine, this is the mutation in X, Y, Z. And Excellent. then you put a five person probability, right? Excellent. Uh, that you might be out because of chance, it can happen, but 95% of the time, like it wouldn't happen this way. Excellent. So there's so, a probability. So, so th that is different from something that we can prove with repeatability in a controlled environment. Right? Yeah. So it's a probability, science is probability. Yeah, but again, like for example, if I say that Tylenol takes care of your headache. So what I can do is in a controlled environment, I can have a placebo, I can have a sugar pill, and I can give actual Tylenol and see in a controlled environment that if somebody had a headache and they took this medicine and then they no longer had a headache, that we can say that does have an effect. Right? Right or wrong? Yeah, it's okay. It's right. So in that way, you could not give me 2.2 billion years in a controlled environment. Yeah, so you're making a calculation. What you're doing is that you, you, you're pushing forward a premise that yes. cannot be fulfilled because we can't go back there. Exactly. So in the information we have at hand, this is the best, best explanation. I disagree because you are again making a calculation based on what you feel could possibly be without any controlled environment testing and there are others who will put forward different numbers and different theories that have equal or if not greater probability so we're guessing here right so let me ask you now when you go back to the first living cell did it have to have a minimum set of genetics yeah 20 nucleotides thank you who made that probability no no <laughs> the first living cell without the minimum set of genetics would have collapsed. Yeah, so they're basically the smallest yes. thing that can have any catalytic activity okay. is a 20 nucleotide long RNA. Okay, genetics. Yeah, this is... Okay, so look at the minimum gene concept. Yeah, that's right? 20 nucleotides. So I think it's more like 200 something last time I checked, but yeah, look it up. Now, the point being, the first living cell would have had to have those genetics in place for it to function right and we can test that we can take genetics out and we can see a living cell collapse so now my question to you is who put the minimum set in place for the first cell to ever have survived 
So there's actually a paper about this. Go ahead, I'm listening. Basically, you just stop me because I can keep going on this. Keep going. <laughs> so, so there's actually a paper on the probability of abiogenesis. That's the term of coming from like non-life to life. Okay. And that basically states that 20 nucleotide uh, RNA sequence that catalyzes something, so and the probability of that happening is 4 raised to power 20. So okay. that's like in billions, but it it can't b basically happen once in our universe. That's the so point they push for. The minimum gene concept. As you can see, um, I mean, I can look it up, but I think the minimum that we have seen the genetics is 250. So I just looked up the study right now, right? You had to have had 250 genes for the first living cell to have survived. So the question again is 250 genes, without that, a living cell could not have survived. Yes, yeah, so this is. So the question is for the first living cell, who set that entire set of genetics for it to have survived? Because under that, it could not have survived. Yeah, so the idea is that the, the smallest catalytic part, like let's say a gene, okay. comes into being 4 raised to power 20, right? Okay. That's a probability. If that happens 250 times, Disagree. Again, no, 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 no. That, that's not the way it works, right? So if you have a genetic gene and it starts to develop, right? It starts to split. But for it to be a living cell, it had to have already had 250 genetics. And if you fell under that, you couldn't even have a single living cell. So that right there, the question would be, who set that minimum? It cannot be at random, right? Just like, for example, you have two eyes, right? You have two ears, right? If you have random mutation, why don't you have a horn? Why don't you have wings? Why don't you have claws, right? This can't be considered random mutation. So what we can prove in a controlled environment is even the first living cell would have to have a minimum set of genetics. And randomly evolving would not show survival. Right? This is something that you can theorize, but you can't prove. Now, as a biologist, and being just honest, you tell me this. I have an iPhone here. All right? yeah, I've, uh, I use it, so I know. Good, good. So that, that, that's good. So, just for the benefit of everybody else. Yeah, right? so just to, for the people, who, if somebody is challenging evolution, this is actually from Rich Dawkins. Mm -hmm. uh, is that he said that a complete eye without any component of the eye missing, it can't be selected for. So there's no natural selection exactly. until the vision is there. Like exactly. the whole camera is there, you cannot select a part of it. Exactly. So how come Good each, each part of the eye got selected randomly. Exactly. So it's, it's not possible. Because it's very natural important. selection would require that there be some functionality. Yeah, and if there's no vision, then just two pieces of gel in your face would make no sense, yeah. right? So that means natural selection would be proven wrong by that. Now, the question here, again, I, I know you've gone through this already, but the question, I have a phone here, right? Three cameras, face recognition, apps. If I told you, out of random mutation, and out of just billions of years, pieces of sand came together to make this phone exactly the way it is. All the functionality, the cool cover, look, look, look check this out. It even has like a little thing, so you can put it like <laughs> right? Even that, I didn't buy this, nobody made this, no Chinese factory. Billions of years, grains of sand made this phone exactly the way it is. Would you believe me? If I was a physicist and I believed multiverse theory, then I would. would you believe me? You, no, as a I, person. I, I, I don't anybody, believe. anybody arguing with you that says yes, they're just being insincere, walk away. Yeah. Okay. And anybody who knows that they wouldn't, then you would tell them, what's more complex? The human body or this phone? So to say that you randomly mutated, doesn't make sense. All right, brother in the back. <coughs> So I just wanted to add to that. The simplest thing is uh, when a Bedouin came to Rasulullah and asked him, like, how does Allah exist or uh, how do you prove this? The, the most simplest explanation Rasulullah gives to this Bedouin is that he shows him like dung, animal dung. He says, you see dung here. Would you believe it if I told you an animal went through here? He says, yes, the evidence of the dung. So similarly, everything that's here, the creation, is the evidence that a creator was here. Right? It's beautiful. Yeah. So, but uh, my question is, um, would it be considered sunnah to marry really young? Like, 
as in marrying a girl who's really young. Sure. And Good I mean, question. Like, okay. Uh, when we talk about sunnah, there are things of adat and things of ibadat. Okay. Adat are things that have to do with the natural environment of where you live. For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rode a camel. Right? Can we consider it an ibadah to ride a camel? No. That was the means of transportation of the time. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he ate dates and water, right? And that's a natural. Now, we can say there are virtues of breaking your fast with dates. That can be considered an ibadah. But regularly, what they ate, where they lived, in a desert and so on, this is not ibadah. This is not worship. Okay? And the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he made the hijrah to Medina, and he saw the people, they, were, they, were, they used to cut the... the uh, a plant to make a clipping, right? They would put different species together of the plant to have better results. And Rasulullah, why do you do that? Because he's not a farmer, right? So they thought that they shouldn't, but that's not ibadah, right? So they didn't do it. And then their crop didn't come out as well. So then he told them, look, I'm not a farmer. I'm not here to teach you how to farm. I'm here to give you uh, lessons about the religion. So if you're farmers, farm the way you want, right? So in those things, the adat, are not governed as sunnah in the sense of being mustahab. So, if you live in a place and that place people marry young, marry young. If you live in a place where people marry at an older age, that's fine. None of those are considered to be from the ibadat. All right? Now, what we can say from the uh, ibadah, for example, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he saw Abdul Rahman bin Auf radiyanhu, and he told him, what is this color on you? And he says, I got married. He said, did you see her? He said, no. He said, you should see her. So there is love. Yani, so that you do have compatibility. So you can say it's from the sunnah that you see within limits a spouse you're going to marry. From the sunnah that, yani, or from the things that are obligatory, but meaning from the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to have two witnesses, right? To have a wali. Those things are things in the sharia. Those are ibadat. Right? But if Rasulullah married from a certain race or a certain tribe, we don't say it's sunnah from the ibadah to marry from that. Those are adat. Sheikh, uh, this guy needs a follow up. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, it's just a follow up. So, would this same argument apply in the concept or like the uh, context of multiple wives? Like, um, so, with, because I've heard opinions, sure. some people are like, the sunnah is to have multiple wives, and some people are like, is the sunnah is to only have one wife, or like... So know? again, that, 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 there's no sunnah here, because yes. Rasulullah married Khatija radiyana, and he didn't marry any other woman as long as she was alive. And he married other women afterwards, and so on. So here, it's not about, yani, this is sunnah and this is not. Here it is your situation, right? You're married, you one wife, she's happy, you're happy. Khalas, live your life. Adam alayhi salam, Hawa alayhi salam, they live, right? No problem with that. If you're married and there is some situation that you need to take a second wife, no problem. Alhamdulillah, as long as you do it within the halal, within the way of the sharia, no problem with that. But neither one of them can we say, no, this is sunnah and this is not, inshallah. Uh, <laughs> I knew they were going to jump in on that one. Go ahead, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Go ahead. So my first question is, um, I recently came across a statement of a sheikh, and this is something I've heard in the past as well. And the sheikh he's Salafi, and he said, um, Allah has two eyes, and the reasoning he used was the hadith that the Dajjal is one eye, and your Lord is not one eye. So yes. because of this, the Sheikh said that Allah has two eyes. So my question is, wouldn't this be affirming something for Allah that He didn't affirm for Himself? Or is there another proof um, so, that would be used for that? Go ahead. So the first thing about having two eyes, this is one of the adilla, and there are many others, and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen has explained them as well. So no doubt we confirm that which Allah has confirmed about Himself. And we leave it at that. We don't ask the kayfiyah, the how of it. But this is not the only evidence. And inshallah, if you like, we have on the Majid Ribad channel a series that I did on Aqidah from Lumwa to Atiqad, where we discussed this issue in great detail and mentioned many other adilla for it, inshallah. Go ahead. Second question for the sister. Go ahead. Um, my second question is, how do we differentiate between a person or a scholar 
um, let's say if we're reading a book or listening to a lecture, how do we differentiate between a person of a Sunnah that may have fallen into mistakes regarding some of the attributes of Allah and is still part of Ahl Sunnah and between someone who is no longer part of Ahl Sunnah and is of a different sect that negates the attributes of Allah? That is a great question. Um, uh, and the short answer would be, we ask the people of knowledge, right? We approach somebody who is knowledgeable about these issues and you ask them. Because the long answer would be, you would have to evaluate whether their deviancy took them out of Islam, like the Mu'tazila, seeing the Quran is makhluk and so on, um, or if it doesn't, if there were minor ta'wilat, um, that would not take them outside like uh, some of the scholars like an ibn Hajar and others. Uh, but again, that's not something a Aam person can really evaluate on their own. So I would suggest that you ask the people of knowledge and say, you know, like this person or this sheikh or this imam from the past, can I still benefit from their books? And depending on your level, it depends. Many of the people of the past they had some mistakes and this is like a new thing right now where if somebody makes a mistake khalas, you throw them off the manhaj you burn all their books and you in here like this is this is a strange thing because even if you look at al kashaf of zamakh shari or if you mention uh any razi and others they had their mistakes but that doesn't mean that their works were totally abandoned rather rather uh, the ulema like Ibn Hajar and Zaylai they wrote their hashiyat and al-kashaf and ulema still benefited from their works but again we don't also say, you know, you take some work that's filled with modu hadith and you just hand it to the awam so that, you know, they, they don't know what's right from wrong and they start developing wrong ideas. Rather, we try to protect the people by keeping them within that which is authentic. And at the same time, just because a shaykh or an imam or a book even has a mistake, it doesn't mean that we, khalas, we burn it and throw it away, right? So, getting that balance is something that the people of knowledge should be showing you, right? So, if you are not sure, Ask the people of knowledge about that particular book and about that particular scholar. Inshallah. We'll give sisters one chance, one more, and then, because earlier they didn't get any, and then we'll get back to the brothers. Sisters, you guys want more? Or? <coughs> you have your chance. We have a few more questions. Okay, get, let's do one more from the sisters, and then we'll do some from the brothers, and we'll come back to you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Can I ask you a question that you guys on the previous one? Okay. Uh, so knowing the, um, I guess, the place of a scholar that a scholar holds, how do we ally not compromising our deen and having Hosn Adhan in this scholar? Um, for example, he might have uh, repented for something that he previously said, or so how do we uh, ally on both? It's a good question. We always have Hosn Adhan for everybody. Right, for every Muslim, we think good about them, right? We don't assume bad, we don't try to find faults, we don't try to misuse people's words, we don't try to clip and bait and all the stuff that people do nowadays. This is wrong. As a Muslim, we should always think good about people. And many of the scholars in the past, even when they were, I mean, even uh, like Abul Hassan al-Ashari, we have uh, Al-Iban of Yusul uh, al his book, where he made tawbah and it's well documented. And others that died at the time saying that I am on the aqidah of the, I mean, the, the uh, awam, the regular people and I give up this yani, kalam and all this stuff so we think good about those scholars we, we hope a good from at the same time if there is a particular book that they wrote depending on when they wrote it and what mistakes there might be there we can ask the people of knowledge about that book and be careful not to yani, uh, corrupt ourselves and our uh, mindsets with something that has mistakes uh, we try to keep to that which is authentic but we always think good about our, our scholars it's not our place to say this, this scholar is in the hellfire and this scholar is like this and he's from the dogs of hellfire. This is not your place. I and mean, the ulema of Jarhu al-Ta'adil would sometimes even have harsh words because that was their place. But for us today, it's not our place. So if you are looking to benefit, and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uka. Have hirs for that, have a zeal for that which benefits you. If you're looking to benefit, then don't worry about this person and that person. Instead, go to a person of knowledge and ask them what they, what, what's the beneficial books you should read. Get those books and benefit from them and increase your iman and increase your uh, khushu and salah and so on. That's what you should worry about, right? Now, the people of knowledge, sometimes they have to look at the books of the people of the past and their mistakes and clarify that's their job. 
right? And I mean, just to give you an idea, so for example, on the Majdribat channel, we have a playlist of the five essential books for every Muslim household, right? So we talk about Quran and Tafsir and Hadith and books that everybody needs and books that are I and mean, inshallah beneficial for the, everybody without having to worry about you know uh, fabricated hadith and things like this go check those lists out buy those books benefit from them if you find a book that you're not sure about ask the people of knowledge but it's not your job to be looking at a book of a scholar of the past and be like this guy he's in hell <laughs> you know astaghfirullah you know, it's not your job all right brothers go ahead Um, regarding to one of the brothers who was asking uh, about um, his sifat uh, of Allah, um, like uh, was it there before he did the action? Uh, can I say, in, in, from a aqidah standpoint, that his sifat or his uh, his character was eternal, already with him? Therefore, like yeah, he, he wouldn't need any. Yeah, so there are sifat dhatiya and there are sifat fi'liya. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, Allah subhanahu wa spoke to Musa alayhi salatu salam. So this happened at a particular time, right? No doubt. But then there are sifat that are from the that of Allah, that he's Rahman. He's always been Rahman, even when there was nobody to show mercy to. And inshallah, I mean, this is a short answer. But if you want to go into the depth of that, we have the Aqidah playlist. You can watch it and get all the answers, inshallah. The brother in the white. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I have a question uh, more so regarding the Dawa scene. Right. Um, I'm sure uh, you've noticed this, but um, many of the people that uh, approach us for Dawa, um, they're more so hostile um, in a sense um, to the practices of Islam rather than the concept of Islam itself. Um, one of the things that um, race is regarding slavery in Islam. Sure. I know a lot of shuk, um have addressed this, um, but um, in the context of slavery and um, how would you sort of um, argue uh, for the implementation of slavery in Islam uh, when one could argue that during the time of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, at this time, uh, Hummer, like alcohol, adultery, all of these things were banned, but slavery wasn't. So, so uh, again, so the first thing I would say is, uh, if somebody asked me that, I would say define slavery. Go ahead. I think like s the subjugation of like. Okay. So, so like for example, you go and subjugate the people and take them as slaves, like the Europeans did in Africa. Yes. Well, well then we don't have slavery in Islam. Owning another person. Hmm? Owning another person. Okay. So, when we talk about slavery, the first thing is to understand what are you talking about, right? Do we have the concept of prisoners of war? Yes. And that's what you're talking about. Ghanaim, like taking from people that are fighting you and you take them as prisoners of war. And you have that in the West. I mean, when America went into Iraq and Afghanistan, they filled these jails in Abu Ghraib and the Gitmo with what? And just, <laughs> right? So were those people able to leave? No, right? Uh, so the point is, in Islam, we never had slavery in the way of the Western concept. The Western concept of slavery where they would go and there would be free people, not at war, they were just walking around Africa and people would go and kidnap them and throw them on boats and then bring them to the Caribbean and then sell them in the US and force them to be labored and took away their religion and took over their names and raped and massacred and did all that. We never had that, alhamdulillah, and we don't have that today. Right? Yeah. What we do have is a concept, and alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful concept, that when you take people from war, that are trying to kill you, you're in, you're in war, you're fighting, right? Instead of just killing them like the people used to do, you keep them with you, under your authority. This was a war, right? And you treat them well, as the Prophet ﷺ has shown us, you feed them like you feed yourself, you clothe them like you clothe yourselves, and you show them a practical example of Islam. So inshallah, instead of you just killing them like others would have done, you have them become Muslim. And we have nothing against that. Go ahead, brother in the black. And then I'm gonna go to that side. You're next, inshallah. When you first uh, began giving da'wah, what was the biggest challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? 
That's a good question. Uh, when I first giving, started giving da'wah, um, when I first started giving da'wah, it was very different because I wasn't really a part of any organization. I didn't have any backing. I didn't have... Um, I was standing around in very bad neighborhoods. So probably the biggest challenge was not getting shot, you know. Because <laughs> in those neighborhoods I had history and there were some people that still didn't like me. I don't know why, right? Um, so, you know, it used to get sometimes where you'd be standing and talking to somebody and somebody drive by and like, hey, aren't you that guy? And you're like, look, bro, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here for that. Like, you know, and then it would get, it would get, yeah, like that kind of stuff. So, so um, I, I think that was a challenge. Um, as the da'wah grew, some of the challenges that we faced, uh, how did I overcome that? I, I just made du'a that I don't get shot and I didn't cause problems and I just went there and spoke to people. Um, what was trying to gain knowledge, you know, because it was difficult. But alhamdulillah, like I left the U.S., I went, I spent time overseas, tried my best to know what is right from wrong so that I, I can convey the correct message. So, and that's very important as du'at, you should also be tulab ilm. Brother in the gray, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. I have a quick question. It may not be quick, but let's see. Uh, it's, uh, it's regarding it's a follow-up question to what the sister asked. So recently I saw a clip of someone on YouTube and he was basically, he brought up uh, something that Jalaluddin Suyuti, he said that he specifically, he made istighatha with a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not sure if you're aware of this situation, but... Uh, as Salafis and as Muslim, we have we know the hukam of someone that makes istighatha with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and especially an alim and like someone that contributed so much to the ummah. So, what would be the response to that? Because that person he left it as a question, like he ended the video on that. Okay. So, this is the question to the Salafis. I got Like, you. what is your response to this? So, so Salafis once again is not like a club or something, right? So, inshallah, every Muslim should follow the Salaf of Salihin. So, it'd be a question to every Muslim, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, once the first thing is, who is our Nabi? Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammad alayhi wasallam. Everybody agree on that one, right? No Qadianis here, right? So, if our Nabi is Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu salam, then he is our example. After him, after the Rasul والسلام, the best examples we have are the Sahaba عنهم, and the best of them, the Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali عنهم, and so on, right? Past that, we don't have to defend anybody. Scholars made mistakes, scholars made big mistakes, right? Now, did Imam Suyuti make Istaghatha? I don't know. What book is it in? How authentic is that narration? Many things were attributed to scholars that they didn't do. What are the wordings he used? Don't know. And beyond, to be honest, don't care. Because he's not an example for me. What I would say is show me from the Rasul alayhi salatu salam. Show me from Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum. And then we'll speak. Right? If a scholar, let's say Al-Ghazali, or let's say Ibn al-Arabi, or let's say Al-Hallaj, or whatever, or, uh, you know, Jalaluddin Rumi, right? whatever. If they do something, it's not a hujjah for me. I don't have to defend it. I don't have to deny it. I don't have, it doesn't matter. As an academic exercise, I may want to look into it just to see how it is. But that's not a hujjah at all. And it's not my place to now make takfir on them, right? Rather, I would say, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ خلاص. Quran. So uh, I don't want to take up any more time. So what about all the, the the writing and the work and like the efforts that he's given inside the religion? Sure, may Allah accept it from him. Any, like I said, uh, I mean, even if you take other scholars, many of them they wrote amazing works, and we benefit from those works, and they made huge blunders, and we ask Allah to forgive them for those. Right? We don't take any of them as masum. It's not ambiya. Right? So their actions are not a hujja. Evidence from Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam, that's a hujja, right? Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, for a long time, he had some beliefs that his own students debated with him. I'm not going to get into what they were, but you can look it up. And he changed his view. And he changed his view to such a view that he said, if anybody else still holds that view, I consider them kafir, right? But this means that he was a human being, 
he was upon a mistake. Alhamdulillah, he was such a great scholar and had such humbleness that when his students showed him the evidences, he changed his view. Right? So that is great. But let's say if he didn't, does that mean that view is correct? No. Right? We, as Abdul Qadir Jilani said, Zin bil kitab was sunnah. We weigh everything with the kitab and sunnah. So if somebody wants to argue a point, tell them, bring me from Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam. At minimum, bring me from the Sahaba. Other than that, not even going to get into that argument, right? Now, Jahiz and the Makhshari and stuff, they have great works in, in Balagha and things. We study their works, but it doesn't mean we accept their aqaid. Tayyib, no? inshallah. I think I'm going to give the sisters one chance and then we're going to stop from Maghrib. We do have a lot of written questions. Uh, we'll go over these in the QA uh, panel. But sisters, you have an opportunity. Yes, there is one question. Good. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Salaam Alaikum. Can you hear me now? Yes. Alright, Wa Alaikum Salaam Alaikum. So I have a question. Uh, according to Surah Al Ma Maida, uh, those who uh, do not judge by Allah uh, has revealed are truly disbelievers. Hmm. So my question is um, if uh, we are voting for any candidate who does not represent Allah's Sharia, uh, does it mean uh, uh, we are accepting their ide ideology and. Um, you really do want me to get banned from Canada, don't you? <laughs> so the first thing is, we as Muslims do not vote for or do not promote any system other than the Sharia of Allah. The Sharia of Allah and the laws of Allah is the Haqq of Allah that should be implemented. I'm not going to be shy to say that. Right? Having said that, at times, as Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen and others have explained, there could be a maslaha, meaning that there are, there are two harms. Let's say there is one party that's going to go and say we're going to ban all masajid. And another party says, no, we're going to let the masajid be. Now here, not to agree on their platform or to vote for them, to support them. But you could say, look, there is a harm for the Muslim community. So to repel the harm, you should vote so that we don't get masajid shut down. There is sometimes that situation, the ulema review that. But to be, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm this, I believe in this party, I believe in the democratic system or the socialist system or the communist system, is kufr. May Allah protect us from those things. May Allah keep us that we believe that Ahsan al hakimin is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is the one who has the right to the hukum. No doubt to that. At the same time, we do realize that there will be situations where you will utilize a vote just to repel harm, the maslaha, that would harm the Muslim ummah. But again, that is not to become a part of that system. That is only to repel harm. Good seeing you guys in Canada. Next time I'll see you guys in the US. <laughs> uh, I think we'll stop for other. Okay, 10 minutes? Khalas, man, go ahead. Um, so this is an argument I've heard a lot from atheists. I'm not going to say the next. there's kids here, but they say that why would a god that's like so powerful and great care about someone as insignificant as me committing sins? Gotcha. Question. Why would a, a God that is so powerful and great, the master of the universe, care about something as insignificant as me committing sins? Because Allah is so great that He can pay that detailed attention to every single one of us. Listen to our dua, see our condition, judge ourselves without any affair overpowering another. Right? Uh, meaning that for us, because of our limited abilities, if we're looking at big picture things, we can't look at minute things because we're limited. But Allah is so powerful and His knowledge and His ability is unlimited. So He can pay attention to you as an insignificant being and your dua and your situation and your sins and your good deeds without it distracting Him from running the universe. That is the greatness of Allah. Yeah, Habibi, go ahead. In the black. Wa as alaykum as salam. Okay, so I'm just going to say one thing before I ask Okay, so I disclaimer. I learned this from you, okay? okay. So it's like uh, we interpret the Quran using the Quran. Yes. Then the second step is using the words of the Prophet. Alayhi Hadith, <laughs> yes. Then the words of the Sahaba. Yes. Then the set of the Tabi'un. Yeah. <coughs> yes. And uh, Arabic language. Language, uh, and it has to be that parent me. Yes. As far as I so, I mean, there are times when there will be majaz. But then you have to have adilla for it. Okay, go ahead. So, 
And just, what's the sixth? You forgot the sixth, man. The sixth is the... Ishtihad of ulema based on these five. Good, good job, man. So, so like, using all of these, how would you... Because I know a lot of times we use evidence of science. Sure. Of, like, the Big Bang and all these things. I don't, know. I don't really talk about the Big Bang Theory in the Quran, like, I know other people do, I, I personally don't, but there are things like the development of the fetus uh, that is in the Quran and it is very clear with the Arabic language and it's been explained by the Sahaba and so on. And we use that as a miracle of the Quran because the Prophet ﷺ could not have known that, right? And Allah revealed that in the Quran to show that this is not a book from the Prophet ﷺ about the salt water and sea water mixing and so on, about the different, there being planetary bodies having a, an orbit. I mean, these are things that are in the Quran. And earlier ulama like Ibn Kathir and others, they explained these in their tafasir. And we use that, alhamdulillah. But we don't give our own new interpretations either. You know, like some people, they're like, oh, the seven samawat are the seven layers of the ozone and this, which is wrong because the first sama has all of the galaxies in it. Zayin as sama ad dunya bi masabi in Surah Mulk shows that all the planetary bodies are only in the sama ad dunya, the first sama. So we stick to what is there evidently in the Quran that the ulema of Islam have already explained as miracles, we use those. We don't come up with anything that's new and you know, kind of our own ishtihad and things like this. No. Hayakumullah, the brother in the blue. So, yeah, uh, Islam is the right path. Why yes, it is. Why is there so much suffering, so much war and, um, going on in the Muslim countries? Good question. If Islam is the right path, why is there so much suffering and so much war in the Muslim countries? First thing, there is war and suffering everywhere. I mean, you look at South Sudan, you look at other countries, look at Ukraine, right? So, I mean, it's not just Muslim countries. But this is a part of this, the test of this life. There's going to be wars, there's going to be suffering. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests, right? Ashaddu bala'an anbiya, thumma salihin, right? So the hardest tested are the prophets and then the pious. So when the Muslims are on the religion, then no doubt the victory of Allah is with us. As we have seen during times of the Khulafa and after them, during the times when the people were on the religion, they had victory after victory. And when we fall off the religion, that Allah tests us to bring us back as a reminder, right? But we, when we talk about Islam, talk about evidences, talk about the Quran, talk about the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. That is what shows right from wrong. Not how rich Muslims are or how poor Muslims are or how, you know, because even if you go there, by the way, I mean, Muslims are rich. <laughs> Just because there's war in some countries doesn't mean go to the Gulf, go to Malaysia, you will see excellent examples of great first world countries, more advanced than the U.S. Right? This question is more from a non-Muslim perspective. Yeah, yeah, I know. So th that's the answer for the non-Muslims. I know it wasn't your question. Yeah. Uh, Allah, brother, here, here, and here, and then we'll stop. Go ahead. Yeah, so Alhamdulillah, the Quran has many miracles. Yes. Uh, one ayah that's been a source of confusion for me is in Surah, uh, Surah Tarish, where it says that the sperm comes from the ah. third cage and the back. Sure. Uh, when we talk about the development of the sperm, and then there's, I'm planning a whole video on this, so I'm not going to go deep here, but this is the origin, where it originates from. And there's scientific evidence that the origin comes from further up than the actual testicles. This is where it stores, and then there's a tube that it exits out of. But that's not the origin of it, right? The origin of it is further on. And inshallah, I have a whole video planned on this. When we post it, we'll give you the scientific studies and everything, inshallah. Faddalo. So I have a question regarding, like, how do we explain the coexistence of other and free will? So I'll ah, give it to you. Easy. I was given like two examples by a word said like in our community and basically the first thing he said was uh, he said how can Allah like what's the point of him testing us and everything he, his knowledge encompasses everything he already knows who's going to Jannah who's going to Jahannam got it so how like what's the point of this and then the <coughs> second question is how uh, he asked about how if Allah is like omnipotent then how can he like allow or either he, he's or Rahman or like shaitan cannot, uh, he cannot like manipulate people. He cannot allow this and be Rahman at the same time. Okay. Or he cannot and he gives power to shaitan. Got it. Easy questions. About Qadr and free will. And I'll, I'll address both questions. So first question being, if Allah knows everything, then what's the point of making a creation and going through this test, right? 
Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not force you to sin. And he doesn't force you to do good. He gives you that choice. And whatever you decide, you will be either rewarded or punished. The fact that Allah knows is the greatness of Allah. But it doesn't force it on you. Right? I'll give you an example. Let's say you're going to take a test. And this is a human example just to understand a concept. Of course, the mithal of Allah is ala, right? Tell you, you're going to go take a test. I'm a professor. You're my student, right? And I see that you're not studying. And I see that you're not trying hard. And you're out partying. And you're drunk the night before, right? Not you. This give me an example, right? Now, as a professor, knowing with experience, I know you're not going to pass this test. Right? So I tell you, look, if you want to pass this test, you got to stop what you're doing. Otherwise, you're not going to pass it. Right? Because I know you're not going to pass it if you go on this path. And let's say you continue doing that. Now, I know when I give you that test, you're going to fail it because you didn't study. And you were out partying. You didn't even sleep. You can't even barely walk. Does that mean I'm forcing you to fail the test? No. no. Say that Allah has everything written already, so Again, what does it mean written? That's with the knowledge of Allah. It's not forced on you, right? I'll give you another example. Let's say, and this is a human example to understand concepts, right? If I break a time machine, and I go in the future, and I see, what's your name? Sufyan. Huh? Sufyan. Sufyan. I see that you got this really nice Lamborghini, and you crash it, because you went way too fast, right? I come back right now. Now I have that knowledge. Does that mean that I forced you to do it? You made the decision. Even though I know what's going to happen, it's your decision. Right? So, the greatness of Allah is that He's Alim. He knows everything. But the mercy of Allah is that He did create us. And He did give us choice. And on top of that, even though He didn't have to, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us warnings. He sent us messengers. He sent us the Quran. He brought you in such halaqat of knowledge. Now, you have a choice. It's your choice. You can choose right. What's today, Sunday night? You could be here in the masjid or you could hit the club. You could be here hearing about Allah or you could be drunk in the street in Toronto peeing on yourself. It's up to you. It's your choice. There's people right now, right? Now, if you have that choice, your reward will be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing what's right. And your punishment will be there for choosing what's wrong. But out of His mercy, He gives you opportunities to make tawbah. He gives you signs. He gives you reminders. He gives you hardships to bring you back. And if you still ignore that and continue down your path, it's what you chose. It's not that He's not merciful. He's very merciful, extremely merciful and forgiving and loving. But if you continue down that path, that's up to you. you know? If I'm a police officer, for example, and I see you speed, and I stop you, and I tell you, hey, stop speeding, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you off this time, but I'm warning you, don't speed. And then you continue, and then I keep giving you chances until you crash, is it my fault? No, well, it's your fault. I was you know, letting you go so many times, right? How many times in your life you sinned? You broke the laws of Allah. You did what's wrong. And Allah still gave you life. He still gave you risk. He still gave you opportunities for tawbah. That's the most merciful. But if you insist on it, then that's your choice. Right? Secondly, Allah is all powerful. Shaitan cannot do anything except by the will of Allah. But Allah does not allow shaitan to force you to anything. All he can do is whisper. Right? Even on the day of judgment, when people blame shaitan, he will say, I just told you, why'd you do it? <laughs> Why are you blaming me? Allah being all powerful doesn't mean that he's going to force you to enter Jannah either. Then you didn't earn it. Allah gave you that ability to choose right from wrong. He warned you against shaitan. Adul Mubin in the Quran, he warned you. Don't follow his footsteps. Don't listen to him. But he's not going to force you not to. You have to make that choice. You earn what you sow. Right? Most people, they just use this as excuses. Right? It's just an excuse. Okay, but I think it's time for Adhan. So we'll just take one more on the black shirt and then we'll go. Or go ahead, this brother, sorry.
خلاص we'll, we'll finish afterwards then after Maghrib inshallah hmm? we'll do it afterwards inshallah we'll begin with you and you inshallah fadl <coughs>
في جنات النعيم ثلة من الأولين وقليل من الآخرين على سرر موضونة متكئين عليها متقابلين يطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون بأكواب وأباريق وكأس من معين لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون وفاكهة مما يتخيرون ونحن طير مما يشتهون وحور عين كأمثال اللؤلؤ المكنون جزاء بما كانوا يعملون لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا تأثيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما وأصحاب اليمين ما أصحاب اليمين في سدر مخضود وطلح منضود وظل ممدود وما وفاكهة كثيرة لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة وفرش مرفوعة إنا أنشأناهن إنشاء فجعلناهن أذكارا عربا أترابا لأصحاب اليمين ثلة من الأولين وثلة من الآخرين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين وأصحاب الشمال ما أصحاب الشمال في سموم وحميم وظل من يحموم لا بارد ولا كريم إنهم كانوا قبل ذلك مترفين 
وكانوا يصرون على الحنث العظيم وكانوا يقولون أئذا متنا وكنا ترابا وعظاما أئنا لمبعوثون أو آباؤنا الأولون قل إن الأولين والآخرين لمجموعون إلى ميقات يوم معلوم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
keep it with you. you take the key as well. There's something in the corner, just push it in the front. Give it to her. Right? Yeah. Okay, I'm not a person of the person. I'm not a 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 person. I'm not
عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. So, Imran, ready for the tashkil, man? <laughs> Alright, brothers. So, alhamdulillah, you've been hearing all these beautiful talks from these beautiful mashayikh and these beautiful examples that we have here. But we want to have action. Right? Conferences and lectures should not be without action. Right? So, in your community, there are people that are dying on kufr that have the haq upon you that you convey the message to them. So, alhamdulillah, like I said earlier, we went out. I was only there for one hour here downtown, and we had two people accept Islam. And I'm sure if you guys go out, who know the culture better, who know the norms better, more people will accept Islam. And these are people that could be saved from the hellfire. So for action, we have a QR code the brothers can give you. We want everybody to scan it. We have our brother Atilla who has been, mashallah, doing the da'wah and going out. We want brothers to take practical steps. So if you're from Toronto or the greater Toronto area, I don't want you to leave here until you have signed up, even if you can give one hour a month. But sign up your time so you can go out and you can establish the da'wah and have consistency, istiqama, huh? even if it's a little bit. Because that's the point is to revive the ummah and revive this concern of people being saved from the hellfire and do it with action. So everybody ready, inshallah? Mustaad. Uh, a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, make sure that if you participated uh, in the uh, da'wah uh, boot camp this weekend, that you uh, registered your name with the brothers who uh, register on the table outside, I think. So this way, your certificate of participation would be uh, sent to you online insha'Allah. So make sure that if you have not registered, we have your correct authentic name that you want to appear on that certificate so that we can uh, email it with an email, valid email address so we can email it to you uh, insha'Allah. Uh, just heads up, uh, our next uh, conference, inshallah, will be in Birmingham, England, if you want to take an international trip, uh, August uh, 6, uh, that weekend, 4th to 6, inshallah. Uh, then we're going to have something in Labor Day weekend in America. Uh, that is uh, September 2nd till the 4th, I think. Uh, most probably is going to be uh, in the East Coast. Uh, then our next uh, conference will be here in Toronto, uh, the weekend of the 26th uh, of December, uh, which they call it uh, what? Shishmas. Shikmas. Shirkmas. Yeah, Shirkmas. Yeah, the Shirkmas weekend. Insha'Allah, so this is what we have in mind. We would like to plan uh, another da'wah boot camp, insha'Allah, uh, maybe uh, in Denver. Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, there is another name for Thanksgiving now? No? Massacre of indig indigenous people? Yeah, massacre of indig indigenous people. Uh, weekend, insha'Allah, maybe in Colorado, in Allah Ta'ala. With this, inshallah, we have a huge list. Just uh, see what uh, Sheikh Uthman has in hand. List of questions. Uh, so I think it's uh, the brothers who wrote these questions. They took their time. They contemplated. And the sisters, brothers and the sisters. So let's begin with those, inshallah. Inshallah, what I'm going to do is, alhamdulillah, we have the benefit of having our two beautiful brothers here. I'm going to hand some over to them and then I'm going to start going through some of these and then we'll try to get through them as best we can and then we'll start taking live questions inshallah. So here you can read these first. 
Sheikh Halas, you can read this. And I'll begin with these in the meanwhile. So this is uh, addressed to me, so I'll take this. Uh, it says, Dear Sheikh Uthman, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah. I'm grateful and thankful that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala allowed us to be at the same place. Reason for this is because I was never a person who believed I could do da'wah, but you inspired me to do it from my character and conviction of Allah. Uh, there was a girl who came to my house to care for my grandmother. We spoke and I gave her da'wah about our belief. She said it was not a, uh, that it was a sign from God before meeting me. She said God doesn't make coincidences and she met Muslim after Muslim. I gave her a copy of the Quran and Ahmad Didad's book about the Bible, it says about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and a book about Allah's hundred names. Uh, what else can I do to help this sincere woman who is still keeping uh, contact with me? So what you can do is after giving her those books, follow up. And one of the questions we should always use in da'wah is to ask somebody what's holding them back from accepting Islam? Meaning that once you've given the Qur'an and they've read it and they've read the books and they're still asking questions, ask them what's holding you back? And whatever they may mention, then clarify those doubts, misconceptions, and then tell them, look, if you believe this is the truth, if you believe there's only one God, if you believe that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah, then you need to accept it. And if you believe two plus two is four, then what's the, what's the point of denying it, right? So this is what you can do is follow up and ask her what's holding her back and then continue with giving her the information until she accepts this Islam. Uh, is it obligatory to make da'wah directly to non-Muslim colleagues and friends or is it enough to be uh, indirectly through our actions? The best thing is to do da'wah directly. But sometimes in workplaces you cannot. So then use your akhlaq, your manners. But you, you do want to, like imagine this. If somebody, if there is a virus out there, may Allah protect us all, and it's, it's, it's destroying people, and you have the cure, right? you know the actual cure, not the fake stuff people have out there, but you have it. So, would it not be obligatory upon you to share it to save their life? Or would you be like, nah, I'm kind of shy, I'm just going to show that I'm okay? No, <laughs> but the akhirah is more important. Somebody going to hell is worse than them dying. So you should do your best, but with hikmah, looking at the situation, inshallah. Okay, so uh, I guess the question here um, is in the context of studying at a, at a Christian university. A Christian university. How can I engage in da'wah in a safe way without conflicting, given the fact that I sign in a consent to study in a Bible perspective? Uh, given the fact there are a lot of similarities between Christianity and Islam. Um, what I'm wondering is, is what's the purpose of studying in a Christian university unless something is maybe only available there and not available anywhere else. If you're going to be studying in a Christian university and, and looking at things from a biblical perspective and you have no choice but to go to that place, um, because sometimes you know it makes me wonder like these days if a Christian uh, school or university is, is better or worse than the ordinary ones which are just all over the place, right? At least in a Christian university they might still have some, some good morals and things that they promote if they really are studying the Bible. What I, what I would say is, is nothing is, is, is really wrong with studying um, the books of the people of the book, but you have to make sure you have a foundation yourself before doing that. Like early on we know that uh, Umar ibn Khattab was if I'm not wrong, had a copy, copy of the Torah, and Nabi Sallallahu was pretty angry at him for that, right? Um, but then, obviously, Nabi Sallallahu being being a Nabi, um, he he had an encounter with the, with the Yahud about the uh, the legislation of, of stoning an adulterer, right? So he, with the, if I'm not wrong, with the with the help of Abdullah Ibn Salam and the Shiuk, maybe you can correct me on this one. Um, he told them, move your hand and read, right? So. If you're finding yourself in that situation, uh, it's not negotiable that you have to make sure that your foundation of the perspective of Isa from Islam is clear. That you know your stuff before going in and uh, studying their, their books. Because if you don't have a foundation in Islam yourself, and you go into a, a Christian environment, and they're basically wanting you to study 
especially the aqidah matters from their perspective, then that's a problem. Now, the similarities about like family values and morals and all that stuff, that's, there's no harm in that, really. But make sure your aqidah is sound. And the second question, men nowadays think marrying four wives is something good. Not all men. Okay, I'm not one of them. However, is it allowed to marry more than one wife without having permission from the first wife? Nothing I'm aware of says that you have to get permission. In fact, if you have to get permission from your first wife, then you shouldn't be getting married to a second. Uh, you know, who wears the thobe or the pants, right? So, I mean, this is uh, getting into a danger zone here with this, but... Um, to be honest, the, uh, the best answer that Sheikh Karim gave last year in the conference, which I recently shared on my Facebook wall, about this is not being something very simple. Um, the society you live in, the West, the materialistic lifestyle that we have here, the cost of living, um, the complexity of it might make it very difficult. You know, you have to look, and the, the Sheikh Mujzallah Khair, he answered it really well. Like, you can't, oh, it's the Sunnah to marry for, let's go, man. You know, take it easy, man. If you have one wife, if you have one, one household, and you're already established and things are going well, and you're busy with doing all these great things, and you have children and that, just settle down. Take it easy. Don't, like, do this at the expense of what you already have. You know, we say, don't sacrifice your capital to gain a profit. You know, uh, don't try to, don't bring harm, uh, more harm than benefit in this kind of situation. So, I think some of the brothers like need to calm down. Many of us aren't even married to one yet, so take it easy. Barakallah Take as many as Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. I have a friend who eats uh, food in uh, fast food, uh, meat from fast food places, yani. Not, yani, zabiha, right? Um, I think the brother or the sister feels bad for them and they've been trying to convince them that it's not lawful to do that. So um, I think they are asking us to make dua for him. Can you please make dua for the brother? <laughs> ya Rab, Ya Rab. Uh, I think they also wanted to uh, like uh, mention the uh, punishment for doing that. Uh, brothers and uh, sisters in Islam, very unfortunate that um, we have a lot of jurists who have taken this matter uh, very easy, uh, very light, uh, in the West in particular. Um, and these brothers, unfortunately, uh, they follow these jurists. You know, uh, they have like a principle there, as long as someone said it's permissible, then you're good. Just do it. This guy said it's permissible. Uh, but they don't realize that they are obliged, mandated, to figure out uh, the uh, correct ruling on a matter before they uh, associate uh, their action with uh, a human being who can be wrong. Uh, we understand that a lot of the people who uh, came from, uh, you know, the uh, scholars or the students of knowledge who came visiting from the East, uh, they uh, considered the uh, food that is sold uh, in stores and in restaurants, uh, people of the book. And they applied the وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ And the food and the meat of the people of the book is halal for you. Uh, McDonald's and uh, KFC and are not people of the book. I mean, these are businesses. Uh, what is meant by the people of the book here is a co-worker or a neighbor who invites you to his house or to any place else and he offers you meat, uh, you can say Bismillah and eat it. That is permissible. Uh, and the wisdom behind that, that you don't want to turn that person off because it's very offensive if you invite me to your house and then I say I don't eat your meat. It's very offensive. So it was, it was meant to be uh, a source or a means of bringing uh, affection in the hearts of those people towards Islam. 
But here you are, you go to McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't know what kind of affection are you bringing there. You just crave for uh, hamburger. <laughs> That's really, in reality, what you're doing. Uh, the uh, text regarding uh, this matter is uh, crystal clear. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ Mayta is haram. What else do you want? Mayta is haram. What is mayta? Any meat that was not slaughtered according to the Sharia of Islam, that the person who slaughtered is on Tawheed and he says, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and the slaughtering happened on the throat here and the blood was filtered out of the flesh, that you're not eating blood. وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Do not eat from that which Allah's name was not uh, mentioned on it. These are crystal clear texts. You can't just compromise them because uh, of ambiguous uh, ruling that uh, someone uh, ruled. Uh, add to this brothers and sisters in Islam, the uh, brothers who are strict uh, followers of uh, Imam uh, Abi Hanifa, may Allah reward them because of their position on this subject. Alhamdulillah, in America and in North America, we have all these halal stores. Has it been for them, quite frankly, we would be all eating in uh, McDonald's and hamburger and Kentucky Fried Chicken. But these brothers, subhanAllah, they believe that they have to eat the biha. Something that is slaughtered according to the Sharia of Islam. And this is why we ended up developing uh, a culture or uh, industry, the halal industry. Imagine that. It's, it's actually outdated. We created our own circle of, uh, of uh, finance, of money. You know, people hired, people... Uh, likewise, you know, that's the problem that we're suffering. Uh, when it comes to housing, we can solve the issue of housing as Muslims also very simple like this. But the problem is we get all these halfway solutions. Halfway solutions, they dissolve the strength of the Ummah. People who follow these weak fatwas and uh, unfortunately uh, now we have to suffer until we convince people of the right way to do this. فنسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى يعني من باب حتى وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان. يعني how in the world you as a Muslim, especially in Toronto here, I mean I walk around halal 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 halal. Why do you go and benefit a non-Muslim and leave the Muslim brother who invested his money in order to provide halal food for the Ummah here? Yani, uh, out of ta'awun, co cooperating on what is good for the ummah. Fa it doesn't make any sense, quite frankly, inshallah. Fatal Sheikh. So we have uh, a couple of questions here. Um, just out of curiosity, okay. <laughs> say someone transitions and performs all the uh, transitional gender surgeries, then discovers Islam and converts. Would they be required to undo the surgeries or would they go on with their life from there? So, so just to be clear, when you, when you do gender surgeries, it doesn't change your gender. I mean, just to be clear, right? It doesn't change the piping inside your body or something. You're just messing with the apparent, right? For example, a man, if he, right, doesn't mean he has haid now, right? So just be clear, right? And the same thing on the other side, you know, you, you don't really become a man. You, you try to imitate something that you're not. And Islamically, whatever you were born with is what you are. So if you mutilated yourself in some way, you undo that the best you can, whether it's hormone therapy or whatever you need to do, and be as Allah created you. Um, second question, assuming that a girl cannot marry without the permission of her father, which is true, she needs a wali, uh, what is she to do if the reasoning for his objection is something like racism? In that situation, because that's not a valid shari'i reason to reject the proposal because of the race, the girl should 
contact the local scholars, the local uh, imma, ulema, uh, imams of the masajid, and have them intercede with the father and explain to him that in Islam we accept and reject proposals based on a person's religion, based on their akhlaq and not based on their race. And if the father insists, she could go to a qadi or a scholar who can then make somebody else her wali, like her elder brother or her uncle or so on. Um, because in the Sharia, there are certain reasons you can and certain reasons you cannot reject proposals. She cannot just go on her own and get a court marriage or whatever. No, you, you must have a wali for a valid nikah. But if a wali, for example, is not Muslim or is alcoholic or his reasoning is wrong, she could go to the scholars and they can intercede, inshallah. Okay, here it says, I have um, some Iranian friends who are Shia. And because of their experiences with the Iranian government, they hate Islam. How does one give da'wah to them? More so because they do not even want to do anything with Islam. Okay, so in this situation, it depends on, on how they are. Okay, if they're curious, especially if they're curious, and, and they know you're Muslim, obviously, you're Sunni, um, and you may have discussions with them, the first thing you have to do is you have to, you have to feel the water. Meaning you have to understand, like, what the reservations are. Because you don't know the extent of the damage that's been caused to them. And it, it is true, people, uh, I mean, uh, I'm going to say it openly right now, like the Shia are, are a worse enemy sometimes than even the outside enemy on Islam. It's a fact. You can check history, see the defeats that happened to the uh, Dawla al-Abbasiyah, and you can, you can get into a lot of things. So today, they are uh, a, a threat to Islam from, from within because they say we're Muslims, but then they have this Islamic Republic and all this other whatever they say. So you need to find out what this person's reservations are. I'm going to actually, subhanAllah, this should remind me of actually a story that happened to me years ago. When I used to go to a gym uh, that was uh, part of the building, I, I, I used to rent an apartment. And there was this young man there, and I, I sensed that he was Persian. I wasn't sure exactly. But we would talk sometimes, and uh, he obviously knew that I was, he could tell I was Muslim or Sunni or something. And, um, and he saw me listening to something. I had my little uh, phone, and I, had, I was listening to a lecture, or Quran or something. He goes, what do you listen to? I said, well, I'm listening to this lecture. He goes, oh, really? He goes, I, I go, so, he goes so what do you do? I said, well, I, I focus on Islam, and I look at what sets Islam apart from other religions. And he's like, really? What, what, does, what, does, uh, what sets Islam apart from other religions? I go, you don't know that? He goes, no, I don't. So then I started getting into Tawheed and about calling on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was shocked. He had no idea. Wallahi. So I explained it to him and, and I told him how, in Shiism, how they, they give the Imams infallibility and they call on to them for, for help and how this is shirk and stuff. And I was like, he was talking to some alien or something. So it was really strange for him. And I was patient with him and I showed him and he realized, he says to me like, this is no different than Christianity. I said, yeah. They called to Teresa salam and Maryam, here you go on to Fatima and Hussein. Straight out. So, find out the reservations of this person, what kinds of misconceptions they have. Most of the time it's actually very easy. And you can tell them, listen, governments, whether it's Iran or any other Muslim government, not that Iran is a Muslim government to begin with, but any Muslim government, um, they don't represent the religion, per se, in a, in, a, in a comprehensive manner. So you need to go beyond regimes and beyond rulers and kings and whatever it is and investigate the faith for what it really is because all throughout Muslim history the, the, you know, the monarchy or, or caliphate, whatever you want to call it, has its ups and downs and, and you can never like trust your religion with a government because when people are up there in power things happen which are not necessarily Sharia compliant and that's, that's my answer to that. Uh, I have or I heard that if you call someone a kafir and he, if he's not then it, it comes back to you uh, and then the questioner is really engaged in figuring out uh, how to become a Muslim again that's what worries him uh, yes the hadith is authentic في صحيح الإمام البخاري حديث ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما uh, that uh, if you call another Muslim a kafir and if he is not it comes back to you 
but again, uh, you really have to understand the uh, context of this hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger are warning us against uh, rushing into uh, calling other people kuffar. Uh, because when you label someone to be a kafir, uh, you're passing uh, a list of ruling on that person. Uh, first of all, he's no longer uh, qualifies to uh, for us to eat his uh, meat, right? His meat, we can't eat it. He cannot marry a Muslim woman. Uh, even if he's married to a Muslim woman, he has to divorce her. Uh, of course, there is that other ruling that actually, you know, uh, uh, the execution thing, which we have to be very careful because you have to have uh, a head of a state and a court room for this to happen. Uh, we cannot do, it, cannot do it as individuals, otherwise it becomes like a barbaric uh, society. Uh, so it's a serious matter, that's what uh, meant by the warning here. Uh, you know, if you want to come back to Islam, first of all, make sure that this person that you label to be a kafir is uh, somehow uh, yani, uh, fixed first. Make sure that you make up with them first. You uh, ask for their forgiveness and, uh, and then just say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, and uh, you become a Muslim again, bi idnillahi ta'ala. That, that's it for now. Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, we have a lot here, so I'm going to try to go through these quickly and then we're going to start taking the live uh, just with one more question after this. So, uh, Nike logo in Greek mythology is of a goddess of victory. Is it haram to wear Nike clothing? So, out of taqwa, if you don't want to wear them, that's great. I myself went through a stage when I cut it off the clothing of my children and stopped buying it. But there are some brothers who sent me some research that the word Nike, it, it was used for a Greek goddess, but it also comes from the Greek word for victory and fighting. So the original word is actually not about the goddess, she was named after it. Um, just like the word victory is from a Roman god, right? But we don't use victory as a Roman god, it's, it's a word about being victorious, right? So in that sense, the word in itself is not the issue, and even the design was something that was designed recently. So if you represent the Nike as the goddess, then that would be shirk, and we wouldn't do it. But the word in itself actually doesn't have that root. If you look at the root word, you go deep into it, it actually came from the word for, for fighting, and for attacking, and for victory. So I would say in and of itself is not the problem, it's what you represent it with. Um, is it haram to live, to lie in your resume? If I lied about my experience in resume and got a job, is it haram income? <laughs> it's haram to lie. So, I mean, if it was on your resume or in regular life or in your college application, it's haram, it's haram. You can't justify lying. Um, if you got a job through lying on your resume, if the job is halal, your risk is still halal. We're not going to say that the job and everything that you earn becomes haram but your action is wrong. My son is 13 years old and sagging his pants, is it haram? Uh, sagging the pants, there is a few issues. One, many times it shows the aura. Uh, we don't want to see any the moons being shunned. So, uh, you know, that would be a problem, obviously. Secondly, as many of the ulema have written, that this was something that was began by the qomilut. They were showing off the merchandise. So, in that sense, it would be haram. Don't do it, inshallah. And uh, the Sheikh mentioned that you can uh, integrate da'wah as a teacher uh, into the curriculum. Um, did he intend general or about God or specific da'wah? I mean, obviously when you're a teacher, you're sharing knowledge and you can definitely bring even to a non-Muslim student uh, critical thinking skills that would guide them towards Allah and towards the mission of their life. Uh, as a teacher, when the topic of evolution comes up, what is the best approach? The best approach is to be objective, which is to show that it's wrong. Uh, it's not something that is scientifically proven, and we have many videos and stuff, we discussed this. So, to speak the truth is the truth, and if you can't do that, then don't teach. Um, being a Muslim in a non-Muslim country, is it acceptable? Uh, as the Sheikh has already answered this, if your intention is for da'wah, and you are able to fulfill your religious obligations, then that's fine. If you're unable to, then make hijrah. Uh, how do you deal with the stereotypes of marriage 
Example, Muslims cannot date, non-Muslims do not understand the reasoning. Um, that's not a stereotype, that's a fact. And the fact that we don't date is because we're not looking to just yani, um, have casual intercourses and spread STDs and things like this. Rather, we're looking for a spiritual partner for the rest of our life. If dating made marriages successful, then in the West you would have a higher rate of success, but you don't. More than 50% of marriages in America end up in divorce, even after they dated for 10 years or whatever. So that means this is not a successful model. Rather, marrying somebody upon piety for the sake of Allah and, and in looking for a spouse with similar values is what it makes us successful and that's what we do as Muslims. My parents are telling me you aren't allowed to live on your own without a mahram, but in the society we're living in, is it allowed for a woman is it allowed for a woman to live on her own? So there are some things women cannot do without a mahram like travel and so on. I mean, if there is a necessity, she could live on her own, but then you put yourself at danger. You put yourself at the danger of your iman, the danger of temptation, the danger of being attacked and so on. So the best thing is she should live with her parents and then when she's married, live with her husband and so on. That's the best. Even though technically, I mean, she could live on her own, but then she would have many difficulties. Like for example, if she's going to travel, if she's going to do certain things, it would be difficult. And we know that, I don't know about Canada, but in, in the US, home invasions and rapes and things are very common, more than we'd like to talk about. We kind of brush it under the carpet, but why would you put yourself in such an environment? Um, if Allah's mercy is infinite, then how can it be split into 100 parts as the hadith mentions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful. His, we cannot count the mercy of Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set out this to be a part of his mercy and he made it and he saved 99 for the day of judgment to illustrate mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show the believers on the day of judgment. One part is all of the mercy. Imagine uh, every mother to her child and all this mercy is just one part and 99. But this doesn't mean that Allah doesn't have more mercy than this. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specified and it's in the hadith and we believe in it. Okay, Bismillah. This is a long one, but I'm going to try to summarize. I didn't understand the first part about marrying and hijrah, but I'm just going to read the last, <clears throat> the last part. Question is, if somebody converts to Islam to marry somebody while their full intention was to marry the person instead of it being for the sake of Allah, does it make the person a Muslim? Now, the reality is you don't know the person's heart. If he says, I'm going to be a Muslim, he's going to be a Muslim. Like, you can't say, well, oh, because you want to marry her, you want to... Now, I, I was just remembering, actually, a story of uh, Arumaysa bint Milhan, actually. I was trying to remember her name. Her kunya was Umm Sulaim. Uh, when, her, when her husband passed away, we have Abu Talha al-Ansari, who wanted to marry her, and he was of a high stature, stature who was rich and everything. Um, but she told him she won't marry him, and, and, and we explained that she's a Muslim. And so he did become a Muslim, and, and they got married, and this was during the time of the Messenger Wasallam. So, had this been a problem, that, uh, that someone becoming a Muslim to marry a, a Muslim woman is an issue, the Messenger Wasallam would have, would have done something with it. Now, as a, as a caveat to this, just, just to put a, a disclaimer, uh, today, we need to be careful with this. Uh, for, for example, a sister wants to marry this, this uh, guy, for example, and he says, I want to become a Muslim. You gotta make sure this person, like he's become a Muslim, he knows what he's talking about. Because they'll, sometimes they'll just say, I'm a Muslim, and then he'll come and he'll mess around, and then a divorce happened, he turns around, and he says, I'm, uh, I was just acting the whole time. And, I, and I've seen this before. And it's a very unfortunate thing. And the opposite is true as well, right? If, if, the, if you wanna marry a, a woman, for example, who's an atheist, and she becomes a Muslim and all that. So in today's terms, you know, we, we obviously don't know what's in the heart, but we need to be smart and, and, and learn from experience. And to be honest, Yani, I sometimes have a hard time understanding why would you want to go into that realm of the unknown. If you have all these, for example, a sister, uh, there are all these good Muslim brothers, why are you putting your hopes in a guy who you don't even know if he had, is going to become Muslim really or not, and what's he going to do, and what his history is, and, you know, and the same thing for brothers, yani, why, why would you, even, even though you're allowed to marry a Christian or a Jew, a Jewish woman, why would you leave your Muslim sisters and not marry them instead? Don't they have more priority for you, over it? And, and you don't know. And then this society, like this woman you're going to marry who's going to be Christian or Jew, what's the guarantee she's going to become Muslim later on? Who's going to raise your children? 
So again, to say that it's not right for this to happen, it can happen, but we got to be careful. And that's Allah Alam, my, my shallow knowledge about that. Uh, two questions here. Uh, one of them uh, is about wearing thawb. Uh, is it a sunnah? Uh, and I, I mean, uh, they mean by sunnah, yani it's something that you recommended for you to do. Uh, I consider it a recommended thing to do myself uh, because uh, you as a Muslim living in a pro-dominant non-Muslim society, uh, you should, uh, as a matter of fact, you have to disclose your identity. Don't hide away in a garment or... Um, so it is recommended, uh, highly recommended that you uh, look like a Muslim, uh, talk like a Muslim, walk like a Muslim, eat like a Muslim. Huh? That's al wala wal bara. You know, that's loyalty. I'm loyal to this religion, you know. But when you go and dissolve in the middle of this shirky culture, so what did you do? You know, uh, I understand that uh, your Islam can be depicted or illustrated through other means, like your uh, beard, uh, like uh, Alhamdulillah, the way that you conduct yourself. Uh, but quite frankly, I see the fastest way to uh, associate yourself with Islam is uh, the thawb. And just uh, look at the uh, Jewish community. You know, when you see the, uh, what is my hamaka, hanaka? Yamaka. Yamaka, when you see the yamaka, right away, you know, you don't, right away, that's, you know, that's what you need to do as a Muslim living in this society, quite frankly. I mean, this is very important. And, wallahi, I always think about our sisters who, uh, who walk around wearing their hijab. You cannot imagine the spiritual support that you provide for them. When I walk at the airport, that's, that's how I, you know, uh, and Sheikh Uthman, I, you know, likewise, alhamdulillah, you know. They, they, they look at you, salamu alaikum, you know, they, they get that strength, you know. They, you give them support. The sister is out there, you know, looking like a Muslim, wearing her hijab, and she's walking down the airport. And your excellency wearing uh, some, uh, you know, whatever it is you're wearing, alhamdulillah. Uh, the second question is uh, uh, regarding marriage. Uh, I think that the question is, should I marry first and uh, before I get a job, or should I get a job before I, I marry? Uh, quite frankly, marriage has nothing to do with a job. Marriage has uh, something to do with your fitna. Uh, you know, marriage is a protection uh, from uh, the uh, fitna uh, of the opposite gender. Uh, fitna to nisa uh, for the men and fitna to rijal uh, for the women. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi hadith ibn Mas'ud, he says, Man istata'a minku bulba'ata fal yatazawwaj. If you're able to get married, uh, get married. Wa man lam yastata'a fa alayhi bil sawm. Uh, if you are not able, then uh, you can do fasting. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, marriage also is a financial and uh, physical and psychological uh, responsibility. So you must at least have some plans. Uh, if, I mean, you must have some income if you're thinking about marriage that you can provide for your family. Because uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned الرجل راع في أهل بيته وهو مسؤول عن رعيته كلكم راع All of you are custodian and you're responsible for your custody uh, The man is responsible for providing for the family So you know you have to figure out how are you going to support this family uh, So those are the two variables that you have to have in place in order to decide to get married or not so this was sent especially for me, so I'll address these. Um, workplace da'wah, and I'm going to do it in a brief manner. Um, we want to give da'wah in every walk of life. 
right? Because the people you interact with at the university that you won't find anywhere else, the people you interact with at work that you don't find outside, your neighbors you will interact with in a different way. In every walk of life, you want to give da'wah. But in a way of wisdom, hikmah, you don't want to get fired, you don't want to be at the workplace with a big sign, Jesus is a Muslim, and you know, <laughs> right? But many times at work, because I work in a regular job, right? Uh, there are opportunities, you know, certain things happen, people bring up certain subjects, and you have the way to bring in da'wah, and if you see the conversation is fruitful, you can continue it after work. Like for example, if you're not allowed to speak about religion at work, you can do it during your break or during your lunch break or after work. You can invite them to the masjid and so on where you can utilize. And, and I worked with JWs and Mormons that, that did it. I mean, they were actively you know, involved in the da their da'wah towards batil at work. So alhamdulillah, I work with a lot of scientists and many times when we're looking at you know, development of you know, different types of viruses and antivirus and things like this, I asked them, when, do you think this came by itself? Right? And many times we have conversations, I give them, a, they, if they ask or if I, I offer sometimes to give them a Qur'an within the boundaries. And I can tell them, okay, you know, I'll see you after work and I'll give you a Qur'an. So it's nothing against the rules. So you should try to do your best within the law and within the rules of your workplace. Female da'is online. Alhamdulillah, da'wah should be something that everybody's involved in. Men, women, children. But in their own capacity, within the rules and regulations of the Sharia. What we find sometimes, uh, and, and before I even address the female, I mean, I'll, address, I'll address males, right? Some brothers, they have their online da'wah platform and they have music in it. And they have dancing in it. And they have haram elements in it. And, and we do not allow this, right? There are brothers who make comedy skits for da'wah. And they have many haram elements in it, including you know, inappropriate words and things. And we, we condemn this. Da'wah is done under the guidance of the Qur'an and Sunnah. That's our da'wah and the way of the Salaf al-Ummah. Yes, we utilize every means for da'wah, including online means. This is the way of the Anbiya. They would, they would write letters, they would, they would do everything open, secret, you know. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He utilized a, a platform that was developed by the Mushrikeen of Quraysh, which was they would go on a particular mountain and say, Wa Sabah, to warn the people. And he utilized it, he warned them. But what they would do is they would take their clothes off. And this I discussed in the Sira Durus, the Ahadith and things, but just shortly. And this was a warning sign that the Mushrikeen had. Now Rasulullah went on the building, but on, on the mountain, but he didn't take off his thobes, meaning he didn't take off his clothes, meaning he utilized the method, but within the halal. So if you utilize Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, if you're really old, MySpace, I don't know, right? Um, that's fine, but not with haram. So some of our sisters, when they go on there and with makeup or not proper hijab or even yani, conversing in ways that are not appropriate and so on, then this is not da'wah. Now you are violating the rules of sharia. Hmm. So, even the, there's a brother, may Allah guide him, and I spoke to him personally, I'm not mentioning any names. So, he had a video where his wife, Muslims, yani, put a hijab on him, and you know, this was their da'wah. No! <laughs> uh, a, a man wearing the dress of woman is haram. La'an Allah ala rajul muannatha, yani the, 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 the man who acts feminine, right? Wa imrata mutarajjala, and a woman who dresses like a man. So, so this da'wah is not acceptable. Many of our sisters, may Allah reward them for their good intent, but when they, especially with, when like, their, their zina, whether it's their face or makeup, whatever, is showing, and they're out there having conversations with non mahram men, this leads to fitan and problems, and we don't allow this. But at the same time, sometimes uh, there are certain situations where a sister maybe speaks a particular language or knows certain things, where from her hijab and things, she can put content out there, alhamdulillah. And most importantly, many of our sisters, may Allah reward them and bless them and put it in their mizan. What they do is they take our videos, they take da'wah content, they make clips and they post them. And they are a part of the da'wah without violating their uh, haya, right? And that's the way of da'wah. But when you have sisters trying to, you know, some sisters that are, uh, you know, out there joking about their personal. And, and I've unfortunately been made aware of some of these where they talk about some of their personal, personal life. Like what they do with their husbands. Haram! Well, they talk about these things on an online platform. Rasulullah talked about the one who and he lays with his wife and talks about this in the sin. Imagine a woman 
And this is going on. Today they go on a podcast and talk about, you know, different... Anyway, <laughs> may Allah protect us. I can't even talk about it. Um, the third, quickly, manners and characters, characters of male da'i, whether you're male or female, a da'i should first and foremost work on himself. May Allah protect us all. None of us are going to be perfect. I mean, uh, the brother sitting up here, we have our own shortcomings, some more than others. But we all have our own shortcomings. But as people who are calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should always work on ourselves first. We should always try to rectify ourselves first. We should always remember that what we're doing is for the sake of Allah, not for fame and not for money and not for popularity and not to have an ego and things like this. And we are trying to follow the way of the Anbiya. And the Anbiya were the best of people. And the Sahaba who had the best of akhlaq. So we should always work on self. Many of the du'at, unfortunately, and as the question has come up, they, they, they're very, um, I don't know, uh, any, uh, some, like astaghfirullah, I know some that even miss salah. I know them personally, I'm not mentioning any names. How can you miss salah? <laughs> You're a da'i. <laughs> salah. <laughs> and you cannot, this is, this is a red line. Man tarku salah faqad kafar. This is very, very serious. So as du'at, and inshallah all of you will be great du'at, you need to always humble yourself and check your niyyah and check your ikhlas and check your own self. Once again, that doesn't mean that you'll be perfect. None of us are going to be perfect. We're always going to have a struggle, but we should never give up that struggle. We should always try to work on ourselves. Khalas, we're done with the, the ones here. You want to start taking, Sheikh? Okay, sure. You so, pick. Yeah, but the or should we pick Sheikh Hasim? Yeah, Hasim. have him be the bad so guy. You're going to be the bad guy. So you pick who, yeah. whose hand? Okay, I'm going to have a bias to yeah. Londoners now. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> From the UK? No, I'm just kidding. No, UK. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, you pick. Where are we going? Whether in the brown. Go ahead, Akhi. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you? Mike. Hold on. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, so I was wondering, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he, he said in his book, Madar Jasalikin, that Shaykh al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he, he used to say, Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, La ilaha illa ant, 40 times between the Adhan of Fajr and Iqamah to soften his heart. This specific action is not found in the Quran and Hadith, so would it be to do such a thing, would it be classified as bid'ah? And any other similar thing, to say any sort of adhkar in any certain time of the day, that is not precisely from the Qur'an and Sunnah, but you just, you know, you just want to say it. I got you. Yeah. So, personal ibadat on things that are not tawqifi, okay, you can do for yourself. As Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi or other ulema, how their own personal things that they like to make dua with, right? That's not a bid'ah. If they made that a practice, that would become a bid'ah. Or if they attributed it to the Prophet ﷺ without adilla, right? Meaning, let's say for example, you love Surah Rahman, for example. And you, lo you love to wake up and after Fajr, you like to sit and read Surah Rahman. It helps your Iman. No problem with that. But if you make it either into a practice, meaning you tell everybody else after Fajr you need to make this, you need to read Rahman, or you add virtues, if you read Rahman after Fajr, then Allah will put Barakah on your risk and you'll get a Ferrari or whatever, right? You know, you get, if you read this at this time, you'll get this, and then it becomes a bid'ah, right? So let's say if you just love saying La ilaha illallah, and the only time that you have is after Isha, and you like to just sit and remember Allah and say La ilaha, nothing wrong with that, right? But if you make it a practice, or you attribute to it that which is not in the hadith, then it would become a bid'ah. Clear? Barakallah. <laughs> Go ahead. This one will... In, uh, in, in da'wah, we, sometimes we get uh, a lot of skeptics and haters, uh, right? So one common question we get a lot is the gender relations. Uh, Bismillah. So we get a lot of questions on gender relations in Islam in between husband and wife and one question that always comes up is the concept of consent okay. right like if the husband invites the wife and then a, a, a deep dive into that like say on a, under an Islamic state if like an army takes over a tribe um, and you know how, how far does that concept of consent go and you know even if it's somebody who's not your wife 
does she still have to? So this is something we get from uh, atheists and from. Good question. So we get this question all the time, and if you guys don't mind, I'll take it because I deal with it all the time. First thing regarding consent between a husband and wife. Of course, Islam fosters a relationship between the husband and wife where they should both be considerate for each other's feelings and each other's needs. But one of the core concepts that, that people cannot deny is a part of marriage is to have a sexual relationship. I mean, you can deny it if you want, but that is true in any culture across the world, right? So that means this is one of the reasons why you get married. And if a husband does not have that comfort at home, then no doubt he's going to start going astray. And if a woman doesn't have that comfort, she could go astray as well. So if either spouse is not fulfilling that without valid reasons, they have reason for divorce, they can go to a qadi, they can go to somebody and ask for uh, a khulla or talaq or so on, because that is a right that they have upon each other. Okay? Secondly, regarding prisoners of war and so on. Once again, Islam doesn't have the concept of slavery as Western ideas have. For example, George Washington, as well known, he raped his slaves. And those slaves were free people that were enslaved and, and brought unchained and so on. In fact, there are people that today that are African-American that have done DNA tests that, that say that they are from the lineage of George Washington. That's the only lineage he has left. So having said all that, um, the point there is in Islam, we don't have that. If somebody is a free person walking around, you can't enslave them, you can't force them, you can't do any of that, right? In Islam, you do have a concept that if there's a war and there's somebody trying to fight you, this is a time when you're killing, you're at each other's throats, literally, right? And you become victorious. You do take them as prisoners of war. The norm of the time was that you would kill them off, right? But this is wrong in Islamically. We don't want to just kill people and send them to hell. Rather, we want to bring them in our house. We want to protect them. We want to keep them. And we want to show them a good example of Islam. And that's what happened. If you look at some of the greatest scholars of Islam, they were from the Mawala, yani people who were taken as, as the Mawla, the, the freed slaves that were taken in war. For example, Nafi', the great scholar of Hadith and Faqih from the Fuqaha of Medina, he was the Mawla. He was a freed slave, Abdullah ibn Umar. He was taken in war. Abdullah ibn Umar freed him and taught him till he became a great scholar. Hamran, this, the Mawla of Uthman, Radiyanu, same case, right? So in that sense, you're not going to protect them. You're going to keep them. They're going to be a part of your family, basically, right? So now if you take a woman and now she was at a war, she was fighting with you, and now you're going to keep her, you're going to feed her, you're going to take care of her as you feed your own family, no doubt that you will have relations with her because it's just not natural that it wouldn't. Right? So that is not a random woman. That is somebody that's now a part of your milkia. Okay. Where's the Londoner is that? It's about something it is. So um, on the street we, we and it's, it's they are very popular the H T guys uh, in Canada. What? I uh, I three. Yeah, I three guys. Yeah. So basically, they come up to us all the time and they're saying, "Your dava is this is not dava, right?" So we had a discussion with one of their like the top guys, and he basically sent me quotes from Imam Nawawi, Qurtubi, Ibn Hazm, uh, Ibn Tahmir Ramalay, uh, Baghdadi, Nasafi. Basically, they they're trying to prove Sorry. that. Did you just add? <laughs> was the last one there? <laughs> Nesafi? Yeah, Nesafi. Nesafi, the, the one who wrote in Aqaid or? I don't know, oh, it, it's, it's text anyway. is like... I'll just they're saying it. that all these scholars are saying the Khilafah is an obligation. Yeah, they say that there's no Islam without the Khilafah and the Deen is not complete without the Khilafah. So, and and the, it's, it's ijma of, of the scholars and of the Sahaba. So how do you respond? Okay, now... People get hung up on, on, on terms without looking at the reality behind the term. And I was talking about this today. I'm just going to talk about that and I'm going to answer your question. And this, we got to be very careful with this. These brothers, I3 or Hizb al or whoever they are, because I3, many of them, they, the reason why they're, they're in I3 is because they don't like Hizb al methodology, but as far as the ideology that they have, it's the same thing really. It's like Pepsi and Coke, you know? So they say that the Khilafah ended in 1924. 
even though the Messenger وسلم, talked about succession, how we have a Khilafah Rashidah for 30 years. And this ended when Al Hassan anhu, surrendered it to Muawiyah anhu, who in Al Bidayah when Nahaya said, Ana awwal al Muluk, I am the first king. Muawiyah said he's a king. And, that's, and the proof of that is that he gave it to his son Yazid. And there's details in history about that. And you can, you can read that, but you've got to be careful with Yazid because a lot of lies have been attributed to him. But I mean, he was, wasn't perfect. He's not a Sahabi or anything. But that. Now, when they say that uh, all these scholars are saying the Khilafah is an obligation, the obligation, if you look at the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, about obeying the rulers and how we're going to go through these stages of, 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 of governance, how it's going to be a Khilafah, uh, first of all, it's going to be Nubu'a uh, Rahmah, Prophethood and Mercy, Mulkun wa Rahmah. And I'm combining between a hadith right now, by the way. There's different hadith about this. And then, uh, and then it's, there's going to be Mulkun um, Aad, there's going to be biting kingship, where they're going to be fighting, and then Mulkun Ja'ad. There's going to be. Uh, so Rasulullah spoke about these, these stages of governance, and he gave them names, and he explained what they are. And in the same context, he said, Obey the ruler, even if he does this and this to you, right? So these brothers, when they're talking about Khilafah and Khilafah, what they want to do now, they want to bring back Khilafah to Nubuwa because we don't disagree with them that we are in the stage of governance today in history where the next stage naturally will be Khilafah to Nubuwa. Now, we believe in this, they believe in this, but the difference between us and them is that they have an own, their own way of looking at it, which is quite detailed, and I wrote a book on this, where they regard basically what we have today as we're back to the Meccan period all over again. So they're saying that the whole world is Dar Kufr now. It's all a land of, of Kufr disbelief. We're back to square one. To me, when I hear that kind of speech from them, it's like saying the Messenger وسلم, failed. That's, what, that's how I take it. Allah forgive me if I'm wrong. Because you're saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He said, I've completed my religion. And, I've, and, I, you know, and all this other thing. And now you say that we're back to the Meccan period all over again. So you're saying that all the legislation, all the Sharia that we had, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the religion is now gone and we have to start all over again and the whole world is that of kufr again all these arguments I have so the obligations brothers and sisters is that there has to be governance there has to be rulership that's why the, the sahaba they took, it took a few days to bury the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in order to assign the next successor that comes after which is Abu Bakr Siddiq by ijma right so it's important to have a khalifa a malik call him whatever you want sultan right but to get hung up on these semantics about if they got a problem with the Khilafah ending in 1924 and they say that technically the Khilafah didn't end in 1924 it ended when Hassan gave it to Muawiyah started to burst their bubble right but that's what it is now if you want to say no no but it means succession and the Sharia being implemented that's a different discussion now some scholars say that if a ruler uh, rules by other than Allah what Allah has revealed and, and that's an opinion out there that he becomes a kafir it's out there and then some, some of them said, no, it's kufr doing a kufr. It's belief that's lesser than, than major disbelief. And there's, there's details about this. But who decides this? And these brothers, whoever they are, whether it's I3 or Hizb al-Tahri, they're probably going to come after me after this. It's fine. Right? Who put you guys in charge of being Ahlul Halli wal Aqd? Who's the person who's responsible to implement the Sharia and to have a universal caliphate and to do whatever? Who's responsible for that? The people in authority. Who are the people in authority? The rulers. The scholars, the, the uh, governors, the army, those are the ones who are responsible. So may Allah forgive me if I'm wrong, but this is my deduction from their methodology. Don't get hung up on their slogans. They're, they're just very emotional slogans. I'm not trying to self-promote myself. Look up my book, False Caliphate. Get a copy. If anybody here is belonging to an MSA or university or whatever, contact me online. You need a bunch of books. I can send them through Amazon straight to you at cost. I don't get a single penny from it. And I've done this for other people before. And I'll send you as many copies. Just reimburse the cost that, that on me and that's it. And nothing else. And, and this is a, a promise I make, inshallah, for you. But read and understand. Don't argue with these brothers. I spent an hour. Sheikh Karim was giving a lecture. I wanted to listen to him. Some brothers took me to the back and they were asking me questions about them. Don't argue with these guys. Trust me. I began arguing with them. I'm sorry for taking a little long on this. I used to argue with them online and offline. I know some of them personally. London, Ontario. There's a brother there. Me and him were like two roosters fighting all the time, online and offline. I left arguing with them, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna write a master's thesis on you guys. And I did, with IOU. And then I said, I'm gonna convert it to a book. And I did. And I got Sheikh Bilal Phillips and Sheikh Abu Osama to write it forward. And I did, alhamdulillah. You guys got a problem with my book? Write a book against it. Bas, done. Zakallah khair. And just to be clear again, 
the issue of khilaf, uh, none of us are against the khilaf. We all want there to be one Amir. But the issues that they bring, like for example, no Jum'ah without a Khalifa, like, you know, even when the khilaf fell, none of the ulama said, stop praying Jum'ah. Like these names that they rattled out, uh, none of them said that, you know, we don't accept Ahad Hadith, right? So these are the issues where you have to say, okay, it's like the Khawarij, they had slogans, they said, Al Hukm Lillah. Ali Radiyan said, Qawl al Haq wal Murad bihi Batil. He said, The Hukm is for Allah. He said, This is a true statement, but what they're trying to insinuate from it is Batil. So I wanted to ask, like, what's your advice? Because they actually physically came and we were about to get in this couple. Uh, that was last year. Were you with us? No. So, get the, sheikhs, get the Sheikh's book and give it to them. Okay, inshallah. <laughs> you, Ali. <laughs> A master's thesis, come on. All right, so, inshallah, we have a question from the sisters I'll answer and then we'll get to the brothers and yeah. Sheikh Karim will pick. Uh, is it permissible for a niqab... It's addressed to me, that's, that's why I'm answering it. Is it permissible for a niqabi woman to post pictures of herself on social media just because and have her account public? And is it permissible for her to post videos of herself reciting Quran? Her account is public and men can see and listen to it. No, it's not. And I know, whatever, if people don't like me, you don't have to like me, it's okay. I like you, Sheikh. You like me? Yeah. Khalas. Yeah. Then I'm, I you like me too? He loves me too? Khalas, I'm good. No. Whoever doesn't like me, it's okay too. Yani? Look, for a Muslim woman, Allah honored her with haya. This is something beautiful, right? Even for a Muslim man, to uselessly, without any purpose, post pictures, you know, just everywhere and doing things to me is a fitna. Right, like, like some brothers, mashallah, they, they have pictures of themselves in the gym working out. And like, brother, if you got guns or whatever, leave it at home. Nobody needs to see them. You're good. You know, like, why would you do that? Right? And for Muslim women, it's even more. Look, in salah, in the greatest of the physical ibadat, if the man makes a mistake, the imam makes a mistake, what does a man do? Subhanallah. Come on, brothers, you guys are asleep. What? What does a man do? He says, Subhanallah. What does the woman do? Right? She doesn't even say subhanallah to correct the imam. Right? The, the, the sahabiyat, they would, when they would go out, they would go out in such a way that, that out of necessity that they couldn't be recognized. Right? So for a woman to be reciting Quran online, what's the point? I mean, we don't have Qurra, we don't have ulama that are teaching tajweed and makharij. Are you just trying to get yourself popular? Like, even for brothers, to be reciting in ways where they're just trying to make the maqamat and this is wrong. Right? If you're reciting to teach people Quran and to benefit people, no problem. Right? But if you are a woman and you're, you want to teach Quran, teach the women around you. But to post pictures, even in niqab, with no reason where men can see it, is not permissible. And this is not my opinion. Alhamdulillah, I sat with ulama. Ask them this question, this particular question, especially because there are some women that are now starting their own, you know, Quran recitation channels and things. Uh, alhamdulillah, I sat in Medina with Sheikh Abdul Muslim Al Qasim and I asked him this particular question and, we, and he gave me the same answer. So this is why we're conveying the knowledge from the scholars to you and Allah knows best and you will pick the. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, sister. I have a question from the woman's side. So the question is, if we say this world must have a creator, why should we believe in an uncreated creator without a question? I get it. Which is that if we say that this world, because it's a creation, it must have a creator, then why would we believe that the creator doesn't have a creator? That's the question? Sister? Question, yes. Okay. Have you ever seen a puppet? You ever seen a puppet or no? You've seen strings on the puppet? So when you see a puppet moving with strings, does that mean there's a puppeteer? Right. Do you ever go in the back and say, where are the strings for the puppeteer? Do you ever go in the back and say, where are the strings for the one doing the puppet? No, the creation and the creator are not governed by the same rules. We know there is a puppeteer because the puppet has strings. We know there is a khalik because we see makhluk. But the puppeteer, the one who's controlling the puppet, doesn't have strings. He's the one that controls. The khalik is not created, he is the creator. Allah has always been there and will always be there, always be there. He has no beginning and he has no end. That is the greatness of Allah. We are not such. We have a beginning and we will die. 
We were born, we will die. And that is why we know that there is a creator. But the creator has no creator. He is the creator. Okay. In a bigoted voice, so I gotta, I gotta read it in a particular type of voice. Uh, why does Islam allow sex slaves? This is the only question I don't have a response for. Islam does not allow sex slaves. Once again, that, that's we don't have this concept, right? What we have is at times of war. When people are out trying to kill you and fight you and you are victorious over them, you take them in and instead of massacring them and killing them off and putting them in, in, in Gitmo and having them bit by dogs and all this kind of nonsense that goes on, we don't torture, we don't do any of that. We take them as a part of the family. We take them in, we feed them, we protect them, we keep them and show them a good example so then they can emulate that example and become Muslim so they can be saved from the hellfire even if there were people trying to we don't even force that on them we don't force Islam on them but we do take them as captives of war because if you don't then they're just going to turn around and fight you again and when you have captives of war and you're spending on them and you're feeding them and you're keeping them you have rights on them this is Islam uh, let's pick uh, uh, you want to call the Adan first Okay, inshallah. Fadl. Fadl. question is uh, related to the uh, one of the answers that was given about uh, eating uh, halal food. Uh, I think that was my answer. Uh, is saying Bismillah enough when invited by a co-worker or a neighbor. Isn't that uh, being uh, too lenient? Um, uh, or less proud of our identity as Muslims isn't in the uh, Canadian uh, whatever uh, basically the, uh, the the rest of the question yani the, the questioner is saying uh, that those are not the people of the book in the Quran yani. uh, if the host is not practicing Christian 
then he would not uh, qualify to be uh, people of the book, so I cannot eat their meat. Uh, so basically, that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, refutation of the answer. Uh, I say that uh, this verse uh, regarding the uh, food of the people of the book uh, is lawful for you uh, was revealed in a chapter called the Maida. Al-Ma'idah, Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, the, the scholars have a consensus, scholars of tafsir, that every ruling in that chapter was not abrogated. Was not abrogated because it was revealed, one of the final chapters revealed in the Quran. Uh, now, in the same context of this chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that those who say the Messiah is Allah are disbelievers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually uh, uh, named uh, or described the uh, quality of the people of the book in this chapter that actually they attribute divinity to Jesus. They call him uh, God. They call him one of three. لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَةً those who uh, claim that Allah is uh, one of three, that's in Surah Al-Ma'idah. This is in chapter Al-Ma'idah, the same chapter where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that you uh, may eat their food. Uh, Insha'Allah, it's not lenient. I, I don't consider it lenient. It's just uh, a means to give da'wah uh, to those people. Uh, but quite frankly, I, mean, I want to be more practical here. If a non-Muslim uh, Christian or a Jew, uh, you have developed uh, a relationship with them uh, to the extent that they will invite you to their house to eat. I'm telling you, they, they will not offer you but halal meat. I know this for a fact, because if, if the relationship gone that far, they know. Uh, I mean, priests and, and uh, you know, and uh, guys in, in the Christian theology, when they invite us to uh, I'll make sure that you have uh, the biha, halal meat, you know. For, uh, inshallah, if, uh, uh, but what I'm trying to say is we're talking about the ruling. Uh, yourself, if you feel like this is too lenient, uh, don't apply that to yourself and just insist that you do not just tell them that they are vegetarian or something and don't eat meat. Jazakallah khair. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So the first question is for Shaykh Karim about his last talk, where he spoke about the sifat of Allah and how um, we can't differ on the sifat of Allah. So how do we respond to people who say that the sifat of Allah fall under the thuru of aqidah? Similar to the issue of whether the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah on the night of Israel Miraj, they say that the Sifat of Allah is also a branch of Aqidah. So, how do we respond to this? Who, uh, can I ask you a question back? Who said that the Sifat of Allah is a branch of Aqidah? Um, so, some people from the I3 Institute, they. From who? I3 Institute. <laughs> what, what's Institute? I3. Huh? They basically um, say that there are three valid schools of Akita, which is oh. the Athari Salafi Akita, there is the Ashari Akita, and the with, the with all due respect to them, they need to get a life. If, if, <laughs> if the names and the attributes of Allah, who Allah is, you know, is a branch of this religion, this is uh, absurd. Yeah, whatever they are, I don't care. I'm leaving tomorrow anyways, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are the other questions, inshallah? So, um, the next question is from the sister. Can you, can you use a friend or sister as your wedding when getting to know someone if your father or brothers are unavailable or they don't want to do it due to ignorance or the father is... No. <laughs> Seriously, no. That's a bad, that's going to be a terrible marriage, a failing marriage right here. That's a, that's a start for failure in, in, in your marriage. Wallah. Ya Ukhti Barakallahu Fiki respects 
respect the protocol in Islam. You know, it's not right to your father or your brother, the one that you claim that they are busy. Um, no, she shouldn't do that. Third question. The third question is, can non-mahram men hear a woman's Qur'an recitation? No. <laughs> or in a Qur'an competition? Yeah, in a Qur'an competition, if she, you know, if, if, if there is a, bro a sister who can, I mean, if there are women with that age, sisters with that age, we're not talking about little children here, we're not talking about under the age of puberty, but a sister who's above the age of puberty, if this organization who's organizing Quran competition, they should have sisters to hear sisters, not brothers to hear brothers, uh, to hear sisters. Yeah. Jazakallah khairan. Let's take a couple of questions from the floor because I feel bad for the brothers, the brother in the back there, all the way in the back with the kufi, with the hat, the Afghani hat. Is that Afghani hat? No. Uh, yes. Yeah. Bashtun. Bashtun? Oh. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum uh, assalam Very quickly in the context of dawah, what are some red lines in discussing with the uh, non-Muslims where when a discussion goes a certain direction, then it's time to stop the discussion, peace be on you, and etc. Uh, I mean, the thing with red lines, obviously, you have to evaluate situations, right? Sometimes, like today, we were at we were, at, we were outside, and we had a we had a, a guy that you saw. He was just, you know, he he didn't want to know the truth. Every time you would catch him, he would just try to shout over you and things, and it became useless. So I walked away. So I'm okay, halas. So sometimes when people get abusive, when people get, uh, they just want to ridicule, or they're just going in a loop, walk away. It's okay. Sometimes. You're doing it not for the person, but for the audience to clarify issues, and that happens. But that what takes experience, it takes some level of wisdom. I'm not saying that I have it, I'm, I'm struggling with it myself. But sometimes you have to evaluate. Sometimes the person is arguing, but they seem sincere. So maybe you want to continue that in a civil manner. Some people, you can tell they're not. Every time you catch them, they just jump, and every time they just want to shout over you, walk away. You know, if somebody becomes abusive to the Quran or to the Prophet Ali Salam or you know vulgar and things, walk away. I mean, this is or knock him out. One of them. Anyway, so uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, we actually decided to do this. Um, the uh, Toronto Islamic TIC right center will be hosting an aim da'wah. Today's da'wah symposium. Um, basically, we want to start setting up a team and come up with logistics and the necessary permits and uh, obtain the necessary da'wah materials uh, to use when we give da'wah outside. And this is the initiative of Fadil Sheikh Uthman. May Allah reward him, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, Brother Shafni and his team will be presenting to you, uh, but we need people to join him, please. We need people to join him, so the people who signed up in that QR here, uh, they can join uh, July 1st and 2nd, the weekend of July 1st. You guys don't have Independence Day here. Canada. You have Canadian Independence? So off? We're not independent. Uh, yeah. We're not independent. <laughs> oh, you're not? <laughs> No, the weekend is off, I mean. We're off, yeah. Yeah, so that weekend, July 1st and 2nd, please uh, go to uh, Brother Shafni, inshallah, will give more information because we need to set up a team for da'wah. This is the real product of this, of this, uh, this da'wah boot camp. If we, if we fail not to have an entity where people go out there, and, and that's why Sheikh Uthman went today outside to, to, to show you how it's done. That's why he came and he played that role model with you. I was watching this, I was enjoying the, you know, how he put everybody down, even from the Muslim brothers. I mean, you're tough, man, I tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I understand. So, inshallah, the, the real fruit of this get-together this weekend, that we go out there every uh, chance that we give to save people from the hellfire. If you really believe that, then you should do it, inshallah. So, Brother Shafni, are you going to have a, a flyer or a poster soon? Yeah, so, inshallah, 
mashallah. We'll have a flyer soon. If you join, already joined the group, we have almost 100 people in the group, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, some people did join from outside of Canada, but if there's a way to benefit, we'll try our best. Uh, but the first, so basically a month from now, Come on, come on, yeah. That's v very important, actually, yeah. Because this is the fruit of this work, yeah, Ikhwah. We're ready in one Allah 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 Okay, inshallah. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi brothers and sisters. Um, so, uh, the, the, I, so, alhamdulillah, we had so much brothers, so many brothers approaching us and asking about starting their own team. Many brothers from, for example, from Montreal, from uh, Waterloo, from all over Ontario um, have been asking about approaching, sorry, asking about starting their own teams. Of course, the main importance is, is Aqeedah and Creed, and that we all align on the same uh, methodology. After that, everyone can learn and things like that. But of course, this is the main thing. That being said though, so inshallah, with regards to uh, for example, steps to set up a team, logistics, how to get a permit from the city. Uh, we have planned, at least for the city of Toronto, we're trying to work with other cities. Muslim brothers that work in the city and they'll guide us how to get those permits, for example, right? Um, you know, we're trying to work on that. Da'wah material, where to order da'wah material, how much to order, like these logistical things or things like that, that if you want to set up a team, uh, inshallah, we'll be uh, walking through things like that and much more, inshallah. So um, this will be July 1st and July 2nd. I'll be in partnership with AIM, so uh, Sheikh Karim, Sheikh Uthman and the other Mashaykh of AIM will be advising us uh, with regards to things like that inshaAllah. Uh, so that's pretty much it, we'll be on July 1st and 2nd, as soon as the flyer is made we'll post it in the um, AIM Canada group inshaAllah. So, and follow us on our social media? Sorry, and it'll be also, um, also the brother was mentioning about volunteers. Um, inshallah, we need uh, social media volunteers and uh, the brother has set up, uh, we'll post the uh, QR codes, inshallah, feel free to sign up. We are lacking in sisters, we need a little bit of help for that, so inshallah, we can also uh, sign up. So. Uh, just to make it official for everybody, Brother Shafni is heading AIM initiative here in Canada, alright? Mm -hmm. So he is our rep here, inshallah, bi ta'ala. Right. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Regarding the issue, of, uh, the brother is asking about peop some people that are obsessed with takfir, muayyan, I mean making takfir on certain people, and they have a strong social media presence. Um, Alhamdulillah, our Sheikh, Sheikh Karim has a wonderful lecture that he did on the dawat bit, the, the clarifications of the shurut of takfir and so on. This is not something average people should be doing, right? This is a fatwa and it's the most dangerous because you're giving fatwa on somebody's Islam. This is the job of ulema. There are the, the other, the, the excuses that the ulema know and so on. And when people sitting in social media, sitting in the comfort of their basements are out there making takfir on kings and people in other countries without knowing the situation, the ahwal or any of those things, there's a very dangerous issue. Leave those people alone. Block, right click, not interested. Um, quickly, I'm going to mention some of these because they have come with my name. Excuse me. Yes. Sorry, please. Sorry for interrupting. Wa alaikum as-salam. Sister who wants to ask one more question. Go ahead, sister. Wa alaikum as-salam. Wa alaikum as-salam. Um, so the question I have is regarding um, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but the Islamic Republic of Iran is actually in the middle of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Out of wedlock, then. What is, can you shed light on what is the ruling um, in terms of inheritance? Because I was told that the child does not receive inheritance. And if that is so, then what do you do in the case of um, a family where the child didn't know that information? Do you oh. disclose that information? Like, how do you, how do yeah. that? you can overcome this with giving a gift or write wasiya. If you feel like you know, they can give them something, just give a wasiya, but not over the third. You, you got that? So you can give as a gift during your life to them, 
Uh, yes, they are not entitled to inheritance, but this is how scholars recommended that you should uh, fix that situation by uh, giving them a gift during your life uh, or writing uh, in your wasiya uh, something uh, of your inheritance to them, but it shouldn't exceed the third. Barakallah uh, We're going to have to stop the questions for Salah. Um, inshallah, uh, after Salah, do we continue a few minutes or we wrap uh, it up? I mean, if we it's stay. Monday. Yeah? It's Monday tomorrow, it's like people have work, school tomorrow. Ah, people have yeah. work. Halas, we're going to extend? So, can we just, with the permission of the community, in the last two nights, we always stick to. So, allow us 10 more minutes just to take a couple of more questions. Then we're done. So we're going to pray Isha, then we have a ceremonial, which is a bid'ah really, <laughs> that we take a group picture for everybody and we say Allahu Akbar. That's our aim bid'ah. We, we came up with that aim bid'ah. So after the salah, we want to do this insha'Allah. Uh, then we can disperse because I have a very early flight and uh, you, you must be having work also tomorrow insha'Allah. So let's uh, allow a couple of questions, but make them very short, inshallah. Brother? I apologize if this question... Yeah. Bismillah, I apologize if this question has already been answered. There's a modern-day phenomenon of, of Islamic organizations using hijabi models, hijabis in makeup, sometimes hijabis in inappropriate clothing, as marketing, in their marketing, so videos and their posters, in order to market Islamic courses. So they're actually marketing Islamic courses using these sisters and what? Like the picture of the sisters? Yeah, pictures, well, sisters well, and makeup. Why the sisters who allow this to happen is the one who is at fault. But, but, but there's sometimes probably non-Muslims, they're, they're hijabi models, they're, they're, they're stock images. And, and I've personally spoken to... Oh, I see. Icon. Icon of a woman, yeah. Yeah. I personally spoke and she, to... And she blonde and all of that. Yeah, I guess it's a two-part question. I wanted to know if there's any dalil, Sheikh, for this. And, and Thanian uh, is... Yeah, like I, sp I just wanted to mention a comment, because I spoke to one of these popular institutions, and, and it seems like it's a situation where the, where the marketing department is more powerful than the shayukh. And in another situation, alhamdulillah, the shaykh actually uh, is, is working on fixing the situation, alhamdulillah. So, may, Allah, so may Allah guide that shaykh, and may Allah guide that department, may Allah guide those people. Amen. It is not permissible to show pictures of women in trying to market, whether it's Islamic courses or others, it's wrong. Um, we're going to try to go through this quickly. So, Okay, the brother here. Let's do this quickly because we promised 10 minutes, 10 Egyptian minutes. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, will I be sinful if I, if my grandkids or great grandkids left Islam or they uh, become LGBT or whatever, uh, because of my decision to say may Allah protect them, because of my decision to move here and pledge allegiance to the Malika and uh, from a peaceful Muslim country. Okay. Will I be sinful? Like very Boris Johnson, quickly, you know. Very quickly, you done your part with your children. You raise them up to be Muslims, you did your best, that's your responsibility. But will I be sinful to move from a Muslim country here? Like, for example, Boris Johnson, his great-grandfather Ali Kamal, he moved to England and then his son, You want to feel guilty? <laughs> he became Islamophobe. So Do you want to feel guilty yourself? I'm, I'm telling you, if you've like done your part, you passed on the message of Islam to your children, and you advise them to pass it to the grandchildren, what else can you do? Huh? Do you want to say something? Okay, if you feel that you will not be able to protect your kids, move. All right, here you go. Allah, the, quick. Yeah, quickly, please. Let's take at least as many questions as possible. The sisters, alhamdulillah, they, 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 ask, they ask all their questions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa rahmatullah. Uh, what is the ruling on eating from Ahl al Kitab that have pictures or statues of uh, Jesus Christ and Maryam alayhi salam? So just to be clear, Ahlul Kitab in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were already mushrikeen. No. They already had statues, they were already making these things, they were already worshipping Isa ibn Maryam. They were mushrikeen, they were, they were not on Tawheed. If they were on Tawheed, why would we give them da'wah? But their dhabha was the way of the Muslimin. Okay. And that's why we were allowed to eat from them. So even if they have statues, they're still Ahlul Kitab. As long as it's in accordance to the rules of the meat of Ahlul Kitab, we can eat okay. from it. Exactly. The two brothers there. 
يلا the glasses and the one with the uh, mask yeah. mask yeah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh assalamu wa rahmatullahi as we know islam is spreading like fire i would say okay all over the world right so now uh, from that point at the moment in countries like india right uh, i mean we, we've seen messages were burned and closed and that now at the moment especially this week in a place like ethiopia if you heard i'm not sure like uh, alhamdulillah the muslims that were there for years and years they're going correct aqidah they're going to correct aqidah like leaving sufism and that the question the question okay so i'm um, question is coming so now uh, with this uh, there is so much dawah going on there so much so many non-muslims are accepting islam so what's happening now is because for a revenge of that so many messages in the name of planning the city they're destroying them like they're destroying them they just say you can't have this message here and all that that's what's happening right now so how can what our reaction how can it be can we use media to help them especially from here so i want to uh, one uh, three opinion of yours in this inshallah, matter we don't have time for three opinions we'll just give you one and inshallah it's an opinion of all of us that look uh, we understand the hardships muslims are going through in different countries and even if you don't do da'wah people are not going to leave you alone in bosnia they weren't doing anything the kuffar won't leave you alone the issue is do what you can if you can raise awareness on online go for it but don't just sit around watching the news upset get involved in the da'wah and as the muslims grow in their strength and unity upon the quran and the sunnah we'll be able to address this on a bigger level inshallah the brother in the glasses we're marathoning here Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahsan Allah ilayk. I just had a quick question. Is there any truth to this statement that every single person, like all the Muslims, like collectively they're all muqallidin? Barakallahu feek. That, that is no truth to that statement. Muqallid is the one who follows blindly. Obviously the ulama who make ishtihad or those who make ittiba' of adilla are not muqallidin. I don't know where that statement came from. Ittaba is to follow the evidences without blind following, but without ishtihad on itself. I have a video about the history of madhahib and ittaba and taqlid. You can watch for details. Um, inshallah, we're going to stop the questions because we have some and then we have to start make salah. Uh, they asked, a family friend has six months to live. Her and her family are Muslim, but they don't pray. How do I give da'wah to somebody like that? Remind them that they're going to be close to death. And the one who abandoned salah is kafir. Man tarku salah faqad kafir. So may Allah protect us all. Uh, this is a question for me. I don't know why it has a heart, but then um, it says, what is the best way to find a wife? Not by sending me hearts. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the best way to find a wife is to talk to your family and talk to your, uh, the elders in your family to try to find a good religious woman. If you don't have that ability, talk to your uh, imma. If you don't have that ability either, Sheikh Karim, may Allah reward him. And the AIM group has a free matrimonial service within the Sharia. We can give you the barcode. You can scan it, put your information. May Allah bless you with a good wife. <laughs> Um, this is a long question, I'm just going to summarize it and we're going to end, uh, which is about some ulama that say that it's okay to buy a house on riba. Okay, khalas, we'll take you inshallah. But, so uh, even if a mufti gives you a fatwa, haram doesn't become halal. It is not okay to buy a house on riba. We are not living in a situation where we're in mere distress or darul harb in the sense we, we have musahif here and so on. You have ways to rent, you have ways to buy in halal ways. And buying in riba is not a good thing. It destroys inshallah. Last question. Last question, the brother right here. <laughs> نعم. حزب التحرير؟ هي لم تسأل عن هذا يعني. لا 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 هي هي تسأل عن أقوام يدعون أن أسماء الله وصفاته ليست من أصول الدين أمور فرعية لا تهتم بها يعني كان هذا سؤالها 
بارك الله فيكم وأحسن الله إليكم وجزاكم الله خيرا Don't forget after the salah, inshallah, we're going to have that uh, group picture, inshallah. Is it really like washing your hands three times after doing the washing? Oh, it's full.
والعاديات ضبحا فالموريات قدحا فالمبيرات صبحا فأثرن به نطعا فوسطن به جمعا إن الإنسان لربه لكنود وإنه على ذلك لشهيد وإنه لحب الخير لشديد أفلا يعلم إذا بعثر ما في القبور وحصل ما في الصدور إن ربهم بهم يومئذ لخبير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حميدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
السلام عليكم البرودرز ان ذا كاميرا ذير اخي مصور طيب برودر كان اي اسك يو فيفر A lot of questions came today about the Aqidah issues and about the smell of Sifat and how it's not something that's foundational, it's the branch matter and so on. And a lot of these questions are revolving around the same thing. So, I wrote a book about Qasb al which addresses this very issue of Aqidah and other things as well. So I want to ask the brothers a favor, if you can put on the screen, go to amazon.ca and just type false caliphate so people can see the book if they're interested in getting a copy of it. This book, inshallah, will, will clarify many of the questions that were asked today. All right? So if you can do that right now, just so you can see it, inshallah, and support it, because I'm basically using whatever I'm getting from this book for, the, for my next book that's coming up, inshallah, in probably a couple of months or a few months about Riba Islam Banking. Inshallah. Uh, Amazon.ca, false caliphate. Okay? Barakallah. Okay, inshallah, we're gonna come here and uh, you know take that group picture, especially the brothers who attended this seminar, this boot camp. Inshallah. So please, and um, please, let's leave a seat for da'wah here in Toronto. Inshallah, on the right manhaj, on the right manhaj. Okay. MashaAllah. Brothers in the back, join us. Unless you have some cool here regarding pictures. We understand. Okay. Are we ready? Allahu Akbar. 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 Toronto Dawa according to the Quran and Sunnah based on the understanding of Salaf al Ummah without any compromises. Insha'Allah. Let's start the seat. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa